uh, with the emphasis on thrombosis. Um, as all of you know, sorry, my uh, slide kind of frozen. Okay. Uh, can you see now? Okay. Can you see the next slide? Okay, so uh, as all of you know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus caused COVID-19 ARDS, uh, which has devastated the world, and it has infected more than 125 million and caused the deaths of almost 3 million people worldwide. As of today, based on the Johns Hopkins COVID-19 map website, the majority of people experienced mild to moderate symptoms uh, and recovered without uh, needing hospitalization, but many with severe symptoms primarily suffered with acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, the dominant clinical manifestation of COVID-19. Nearly one fourth of those hospitalized with COVID-19 were diagnosed with cardiovascular complications, which have been shown to contribute to roughly 40% of all COVID-19 related deaths. Pre-existing conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, or blocked heart arteries resulting from coronary artery disease, uh, as well as uh, prothrombotic or hypercoagulable states weaken the body's ability to survive the stress of COVID-19. Unlike most otherwise healthy individuals, the patients with pre-existing conditions can find these conditions compounded by the effect of COVID-19 mediated fever, inflammation, blood clotting, uh, hypoxia uh, uh, caused by uh, low oxygen levels, unstable blood pressure leading to devastating complication and even death. Uh, heart injury result from COVID-19 infection is evident as measured by uh, the marker uh, troponin uh, enzymes, which is uh, if there is a damage to the uh, cardiomyocytes, that's been measured in the bloodstream, suggesting that there is a damage to the cardiomyocytes, uh, which is shown in one quarter of the patients hospitalized with severe COVID-19 illness. Uh, of these patients, about one third have pre-existing cardiovascular uh, disease comorbidities and two thirds have no previous history of cardiovascular disease. So the several ways uh, uh, the virus can uh, damage heart. And, uh, of course, virus can directly invade or inflame the heart muscle and due to ARDS, which can disrupt oxygen supply to the heart muscle and cytokine storm can damage multiple organs, including heart. And if there is thrombosis, because these patients are pro-thrombotic, uh, that can block the coronary artery and can, can occlude those vessels and prevent blood supply to the heart muscle. However, it is not clear whether uh, pre-existing clinical, uh, clinically silent disease or de novo COVID-19 uh, related changes is the cause of the resulting cardiovascular disease. So uh, in several COVID-19 patients, uh, dysfunction of lungs and other organs has been linked to systemic microvascular injury and thrombosis. Uh, with uh, the increase of uh, fibrinogen and D-dimer levels, there are several publications, few of them are listed here. Uh, in many cases, uh, prophylactic or therapeutic anticoagulants such as heparin uh, are ineffective in preventing COVID-19 related thrombosis. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the recent data from our group uh, showing that the superior effect of direct thrombin inhibitor as shown here with this arrow uh, where the, uh, the red lines are where the heparin was used uh, and then uh, the D-dimer kept rising. So, uh, the clinician decided to use direct thrombin inhibitor ergotrobin, and that resulted decrease in uh, circuit thrombosis as well as D-dimer levels in three out of five patients 
uh, in whom therapeutic dose of heparin in failed to prevent thrombosis. And this paper is published, but not in PubMed yet, but you can go to the website thrombosis update. So uh, thrombosis is also uh, a major complication in many cardiovascular diseases. And the risk of thrombosis can increase in COVID-19 patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease. So uh, the many cardiovascular diseases, as I just said, including aortic stenosis, which is uh, one thing we are working in the lab, and it can happen also if somebody has heart attack or stroke. So, and these conditions uh, immediately require hospitalization uh, and life-saving procedures such as cardiac catheterization or uh, open heart surgery. So given the considerable mor morbidity and mortality, patients with those complications are admitted to ICU for the management of thrombosis and bleeding. Uh, a recent study showed uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> prosthetic aortic graft thrombosis, uh, the patient died with COVID-19 uh, and that anticoagulant uh, and thrombectomy procedures were unsuccessful. So given these concerns, uh, we, um, I actually wrote a viewpoint uh, in which I described uh, the best options and risk in COVID-19 patients with uh, serious cardiovascular disease, such as severe aortic stenosis, a comorbid condition, uh, a comorbid cardiovascular disease condition that can be exacerbated by viral infections such as COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So now I will switch gear uh, a bit and show you some of our unpublished data suggesting a possible uh, mechanism of thrombosis in uh, COVID-19. But before I do that, I would like to mention uh, the following things. Uh, as all of you know that it is uh, almost impossible to test the mechanism of thrombosis or any mechanism in humans other than just the correlative studies. Uh, so that highlights uh, the need for animal studies uh, uh, actually to understand the mechanism. The new uh, SARS-CoV-2 animal models, there were a few now, uh, can be adapted uh, to study the comorbid disease conditions such as cardiovascular disease, aortic stenosis, thrombosis uh, to facilitate the identification of underlying mechanism. So for example, we have established uh, a robust mouse model for aortic stenosis uh, that simulates pretty much what happens in human uh, aortic stenosis. Uh, and we identified the platelet activation and it's a release product transforming growth factor, uh, which is a major driver for aortic stenosis progression. And this model can be in combination of the COVID-19 animal models can be um, uh, used to address the comorbid cardiovascular disease effects on thrombosis. So the future studies uh, uh, with these models will potentially inform about the mechanism of thrombosis in COVID-19 and the comorbid uh, comorbidities uh, or pre-existing conditions with the cardiovascular disease. Okay, since the mechanism of thrombosis uh, 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 in COVID-19 patient is not clear. We focused on uh, what might potential uh, cause for thrombosis in uh, COVID-19 patients. So we tested uh, uh, a hypothesis that SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, uh, can induce upregulation of tissue factor, a prime initiator of extringing coagulation cascade, which might be responsible for thrombo uh, thrombosis in COVID-19 patients. So the tissue factor is 43 uh, kilodalton glycoprotein, uh, uh, normally expressed in extravascular cells. It is not expressed in endothelial cells. It's not exposed to the blood circulation, uh, but uh, it can be induced by inflammatory cytokines, trauma, or many pathogens, including virus. Once TF is exposed to the blood circulation, it binds to factor seven, activates factor seven, and then factor 10, that results in thrombin generation, which is the last stage of the coagulation cascade. So once thrombin is generated, thrombin can then activate platelets and convert fibrinogen to fibrin, and that leads to uh, 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 clot formation. 
uh, to examine the association between SARS-CoV-2 uh, and tissue factor expression uh, uh, that uh, uh, whether that can cause pathologic thrombi in COVID-19. We examined uh, autopsy lung specimens from 11 patients with critical COVID-19 from two different centers. 10 of those patients here shown uh, the COVID different numbers uh, that came from uh, Wild Cornell Medical uh, College at New York. Um, and then one uh, COVID patient uh, we, we got from Oklahoma. Uh, and as a control, uh, uh, we took uh, lung samples. Uh, the patients died uh, with ARDS caused by other, uh, mainly bacterial septicemia. And then six uh, 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 normal control lungs uh, from uh, a cancer donor. Uh, uh, those are not listed here because we did not have their uh, demographic information. Uh, as you can see here, uh, pretty much all of these patients have some kind of cardiovascular disease comorbidities. Uh, and then the la last column shows whether they were intubated and how long they have been uh, intubated uh, at for. Uh, so the dual RNA in-situ hybridization by RNA scope with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and TF RNA uh, fluorescent probe in COVID-19 sample shows uh, viral uh, RNA as shown in the uh, green uh, dots, uh, and then red dots, uh, 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 tissue factor RNA uh, expression. Uh, uh, as uh, lower panel shows high magnification of viral and TF co-localization, as you can see here, the green, uh, the viral RNA, and then the neighboring or the same cells expressing TF RNA as well. Uh, as measured by in-situ hybridization using RNA scope imaging. The tissue factor uh, RNA expression is twofold higher in COVID-19 than non-COVID-19 ARDS lungs. Um, and then uh, the TF expression, TF RNA expression correlated with uh, uh, sars 2 RNA COVID-19 lung as measured by in-situ hybridization method. Uh, multicolor immunofluorescence uh, Staining demonstrated uh, uh, that uh, TF protein expression, which is shown in white color, uh, and uh, uh, the lung specimen in areas filled with the large thrombi, as you can see here, uh, large, uh, vessels thrombi, uh, which are positive for uh, uh, a red color is uh, uh, platelet factor four, which is activated platelet. Uh, marker and then the green is uh, uh, fibrin. Um, so both uh, fibrin and uh, platelet factor were uh, prominent in COVID-19 compared to non-COVID non, um, uh, non -COVID ARDS and also normal controls. Uh, TF expression, uh, the, we, the quantification shows that uh, immunofluorescent intensity of TF protein is is higher, uh, significantly higher than the non-COVID uh, ARDS control as well as non-ARDS, which is normal controls. Uh, and then uh, it's not shown here, but uh, EF4 and fibrin expression also higher in COVID-19. And there is a strong correlation with tissue factor expression uh, with both uh, fibrin and, and platelet factor. Uh, uh, platelet factor for uh, positive uh, platelet thrombi. So uh, to summarize the whole thing, uh, significantly higher TF expression in COVID-19 versus non-COVID-19 ARDS lung was confirmed by two methods, a very sensitive in-situ hybridization, RNA scope and uh, multicolor immunofluorescent TF protein uh, with fibrin and platelet factor for specific antibodies. The higher TF expression and its co-localization with short scope to suggest that possibility uh, of de novo gene transcription as well as protein synthesis of TF induced by short scope too. Um, we conclude that higher TF expression may play a key role in the acute lung failure in COVID-19 by triggering extremely coagulation cascade induced thrombosis. 
And finally, we suggest that COVID-19 may pose an additional risk for patients with the existing cardiovascular disease undergoing life-saving procedures such as cardiac catheterization, implantation of pacemaker, and left ventricular assist device implantation in heart failure patients or thrombus removal in stroke patients. Thus, events of thrombosis and the effect of anticoagulants must be carefully considered and monitored. Finally, I would like to thank uh, the people in my laboratory who are currently working, as well as uh, two collaborators uh, where uh, they uh, have given us the, um, the autopsy samples from Cornell and Oklahoma, and of course, funding uh, from the NIH. And um, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Chasim Ahmed. It's an excellent talk. I just uh, wish that, that uh, at such a night, you are still awake and let other people I, also I follow. Am, I am actually sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> we should follow you. It is an example for all of us. And I just hand over the mic to chairpersons. Good morning, Professor Aslam, our Honorable President of SAP. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kusum Das. Uh, Dr. Jaseem Ahmed, my question is regarding AstraZeneca because in, in, in the last couple of weeks, uh, there, was, there were two papers that AstraZeneca causes blood clotting or thrombosis, and it was stopped for a while. Was it a commercial, in your opinion, was it a commercial move or does it have any scientific basis? Uh, well, uh, uh, you... Uh, you can imagine that that vaccine uh, has been given to millions of people, right? Only one or two cases. Uh, uh, as far as I know, one patient died and that patient might have some pre-existing uh, hypercoagulable state. So I'm not sure whether that vaccine, the vaccines, all of those are very safe. Uh, uh, and it's been taken by everybody, including the president. So I would not... Uh, uh, draw any conclusion based on one or two studies. Uh, vaccines are very safe and uh, I would suggest everybody to take it. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, can I ask one so, question? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, please, sir. Please, Jai no, Das. No, Dr. Das, Dr. Das, please carry on. Yeah. Just uh, thank you very much. I just ask, want to ask one question that to uh, do you, Professor Jashim, do you think that uh, using a low dose of aspirin, is it really good? Is it recommended? Uh, well, there is no study for COVID 19. <laughs> But uh, uh, as you know, aspirin is very good for preventing cardiovascular disease. It's been many trials and it's been recommended uh, in the United States uh, uh, to have baby aspirin starts when you are 55. So when I become 55, I will start the baby aspirin myself. <laughs> the question is whether it, uh, uh, it has any benefit with the COVID-19. That's too early to say. I guess there will be some studies uh, will come soon, but uh, if you just think okay. about aspirin, uh, can uh, inhibit platelet aggregations, and there are some conflicting uh, data uh, whether the platelets. Uh, please, uh, please, please, please mute your mic, all of you, except speakers and peers. I request. Uh, so um, I think the uh, uh, I I I don't know the answer. So that's something you have to wait for a study to show. Uh, but uh, I think the aspirin is good that it keeps your platelets calm. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jahid Asraf. Professor Jahid Asraf, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning and wonderful talk, uh, Dr. Jasim. Good evening Thank to you, and then. Thanks for taking all the pain in the night to present. Oh, no, it's but not pain. Only some more specific questions. So, see. Sorry, go ahead. I'm in you, you are not audible, Always. Professor Jasheen? Yes. I think some yeah. signal problem. Yeah, please go on. It's so, okay. 
are you able to hear me yeah 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 dr yeah. jessi please please go ahead yeah, yeah. so i have a more uh, <laughs> coagulation specific question so now the point remains whether we are able to understand hypercoagulation with could be one of the things or hypofibrinolysis what is the main you know switching prothrombotic tendency in the covid infection so do you have any the other studies also they have suggested the role of uh, activated platelets and tissue factor in your work absolutely solidify that but in general i just want to understand from the coagulation perspective and since you are from the thrombosis background yeah i think that's a good question uh, it's uh, very little is known in fact for tissue factor uh, there was a brazilian study and there is another study from netherland uh they are showing that uh, monocytes uh like leukocytes platelet aggregations and also uh, they found neutrophils uh so uh, uh whether tissue factor is uh, driving the the thrombosis it's uh, our study is not going to say that other than just we found higher levels of tissue factor so we can just extrapolate that tissue factor if you have high tissue factor you likely to have higher thrombosis right but we do right. see tissue factor. Yeah, yeah but the uh, uh, you you raised an interesting question of the uh, is the fibrinolytic cycle right because of the d dimer is really right. skyrocketing high uh, in the patient so so there is definitely uh, that thing is 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 going on uh, and um, the study the clinical study we showed we collaborated with cornell actually i wrote that protocol for them uh, uh, because at that time covid-19 was hot in new york city and my collaborator he uh, he is a hematologist uh, clinician and he called me hey what's going on these uh, none of the anti uh, the, the prophylactic uh, anticoagulant a high dose of heparin doesn't work right. the patient starts to bleed but still the, they are having circuit thrombosis so i said well do you have the direct thrombin inhibitor it uh, used that and that was kind of miracle for a few patients to save their life um, so uh, you know uh, the thrombin uh, once it is generated as you know it can uh, cause thrombosis but at the same times it can also activate a lot of anti uh, Uh, thrombotic pathways such as staphy and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, the taphy um, and uh, anti thrombin uh, those pathways thrombin can uh, also uh, contribute so right and that, yeah. these are these are very little known in fact that's why this uh, the patients dying most of the patients dying at late stage they have massive thrombosis that's for sure thank you thank you is anybody else has any question i just request them to before finally allowing professor das to thank let me check the chat box if they have any no 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 scientific question so now with the yes. dr das permission i let yes so they seem to sleep <laughs> yeah. 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 To <laughs> with, prof- with, with profuse thanks thanks to professor jashi mohammed for a very yeah. lovely talk and anyway i think that now i think we have to shift to the next session so i request to organize organizing committee to take over the mic for the inviting next speaker all right thank you so much bye 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 the permission of thank you sir for the brilliant talk with the permission of the chair i would like to invite our next speaker for this session professor sunil dongel dr sunil dongel is a professor of neuroscience at medical university of the america navis west indies dr dongel is the founder president of the neuroscience society of nepal and council member of international brain research organization His current research work is focused on a better understanding of the role of steroid hormone and oxytocin in neurodegenerative disease. I welcome you sir to pres- to deliver the plenary lecture. Uh thank you so much for kind introduction and uh, me also 
you know, here it's uh, midnight, it's uh, 11.30 p.m. Uh, can you, can you, can you hear me? Yes, it's, you are audible right. and visible, both. Thank you. Right. Okay. So let me see uh, some, uh, the, right. Uh, <clears throat> right. So, <clears throat> all right. So, yeah, the, uh, my talk is about the crosstalk between the COVID and chemosensation. Uh, you know, the, uh, as the, my previous, the speakers, he talked so many things about the, uh, the COVID and cardiovascular abnormality. But my job, I just, you know, I want to focus a little bit more on the uh, other system. As now we all know that the COVID-19 is not only restricted to the CVS respiratory but the other small systems, organs are also included. So the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, they are not the exception. So if you look carefully about the COVID patients, the, we got some sort of the neurological manifestations in the hospitalized COVID patients, basically, of which if we look, these are the few important, you know, the mechanisms that actually induce the neurological manifestation. It could be due to the viral induced hyperinflammatory state or hypercoagulable state, or it could be direct and others, you know, the post-infectious immune mediated process. So further, if we look the what specifically we have the neurological manifestation features in the COVID patients, the in the available data, what we found is the, the patients, they are having the encephalopathy, encephalitis, meningitis, and others, you know, the CNS-related disorders. And at the same time, if you look about the PNS-related one in the COVID patients, the number of significant number of patients, they are now showing, you know, the problems in the smell and taste. There is a alteration in the cloudiness of the sensorium there is an alteration of the alertness and the others, the specific neurological demyelination disorders like the gulen bridge syndromes, you know, or the myalgia headache. And so, so many others, these CNS or the PNS related manifestation symptoms seen in the COVID patients. So of which, you know, if we look carefully, you know, the PNS related, the more than 40 patients. Randomly, if you see the more than 40 percent COVID patients, now they saw some sort of loss of taste and smell. So the taste and smell, you know, the as we know, it's a kind of the chemo sensation. The it is the detection and interpretation of the chemical stimuli. That is the olfaction, gustation, or the related sensation through the, uh, the receptors. If we look the carefully, the very brief, the physiology behind the olfaction, you know, there are two, the signal transduction mechanism involved, the by the adenocyclase pathway that increase the camp, or the another is the phospholipase C pathway, which activate the IV3. So these two pathways eventually lead to the signal transduction. That is the cilia get depolarized and then there is a signals. So in this picture here, you can see the, how they, you know, the order ends when the binds, you know, there is a receptor's potential develop and then eventually there is a sensation and then we have the perception. In the further, if we look the, you know, the pathway of the olfaction, we know there is olfactory bulb and that is composed by the different glomeruli, which are the specific for the spe specific olfaction. But the one important thing that we know that the olfactory pathway, it almost it bypasses the thalamus, right? The, through the olfact, the olfactory receptors, that the phosphorus neurons, and then through the bulb, it goes to the piriform cortex, that for the perception 
amygdala for the emotions or the others like in the the hippocampus for the the memory related olfaction and so on but the some sort of the there's a cross talk between the uh, the piriform cortex and thalamus is also there whereas uh, the yeah and for the olfaction you know the uh, the study uh, as we know that the olfactory epithelium that is the you know the sites where the first events takes place and for the research purpose we can use you know to study whether the olfactory epithelium you know it involved for the olfactory detection for that FITC level so I mean agglutinin uh, the stain that is used for visualization of the olfactory epithelium lesions Roran Morel and it has been found that the olfactory epithelial cell the that is the bipolar cell as you can see here that can be regenerate almost 30 to 60 days in human in animals it is about the week in rodents most of the rodents what is the another the chemo sensation that we know the crustaceans there are five types of which three are the g -pro protein receptor signal transduction the two itself is a uh, ions thereby they directly opens and then there is a sensation and eventually perception of the gustations. There is a one more things, you know, the, I mean, in relation to the COVID, the essence, you know, the test disorders or the, the olfaction disorders, you know, the, it is not considered as a, you know, the primary disorders. And if we look, the others, the test disorders, the 80 percent of the test disorders are truly the space smell related one. For that, we know there is some cross talk between the uh, the regular smell pathway, and then there is a retronasal smell pathway somewhere in the just base of the frontal orbital lobe. There is a centers that actually involve for giving the flavors of the things. <clears throat> that the retronasal olfaction. So, so why there is a compromise of these two chemo sensation in the COVID patient? That is the my interest now. So, as we know that the virus about the virus uh, till date we have the two known mechanism how it interact or invade the host cells. For that, there are two. You know the I mean they have the specific receptors AC two. And there is a TMP RSS2 genes that, I mean, the, the enzymes that is facilitates the invasion of that, the virus into the host cell. And this is showed you the structure different, you know, these, these components are there in this Western block. So why there is a cost study or the test dysfunction in the COVID? Now, you know, we know that the transmission through the different, you know, the contacts actually that, you know, the through these two or mainly by the AC2 receptors, you know, they are found in the basal cells, supporting cell in the test bar. And then thereby there is a dyscosia, you know, that is caused. But the point is that, you know, the, we don't know the detail of the, you know, the exact mechanism is that the this uh, the COVID virus is that actually affect the the cranial of seven, nine, ten that actually involve for the construction of the signals from the test. It's not very clear. Similarly, if we look in the olfaction, you know, in the olfaction also there is a anosmia. Most of the patients they develop. The mechanism would be almost it is same that is the there is AC2 receptors in the olfactory epithelium cell and then there is a invasion and there is a anosmia eventually but it's still at this point we don't know the exact how exactly you know the it triggers the uh, the different altered sensation decrease in olfaction you know anosmia or there is some report of the cacosmia that is the you know, the disgusting smell, 
metallic smell, several others, you know, the, uh, the dysfunction, the olfactory dysfunctions are reported in the COVID patient. The till date, we, we know a few things only, you know, the, uh, the in, for example, in the, if you look in this picture, the A, B, C, D, and E up to here, that is the how this, you know, the SARS-CoV virus, you know, it actually lead to the, the chemosensor dysfunction, I mean, the, the olfaction. It can directly, you know, the infect the, the supportive cell that is the sustentable cells that is found in the olfactory epithelium. And then there is a, this olfactory sensory neuron get died. And then there is a no sensation. Similarly, the others, the, my previous the speaker, he also told us so many things about the, uh, the cytokine storm. That could be the another way that destroy the OSN, that is the olfactory sensory neurons. Or there is a direct, you know, the infection or by the other inflammation roads. Similarly, if you look carefully in the gustations, you know, in the same, the, this SARS-CoV-2 virus, you know, there is a direct infection to the test bar, and then we have the dysfunction of the test sensation. Similarly, the another, you know, the flavors. For the flavors also, the, as I already told, there are two, you know, the retronasal pathway also, but we don't know whether these ACE2 receptors are, you know, the found in the orbital cortex, that is the side for the crosstalk between the olfaction and the test. We don't know these things, but we can hypothesize that, you know, there is a, both the olfactory epithelium or the, the taste pod get affected, and then that lead to the loss of the flavor as well. <clears throat> so the, if we compare the, this loss of chemo sensation, uh, specifically triggered by this COVID, and then compared to the other, you know, the flu virus, the, there is a differences, you know, but this is the just random prevalence only. But it, again, it shows that there is a more than 30%, you know, the dysfunction of this taste, smell, and other associated chemosensory information compared to the flu virus one. So the further, if you look at the patient, you know, the, the compromise of these two, the modality of senses, you know, the, it appears within with with, you know, five days, first few days, and then it just, you know, after the 15 to 20 days, now we again get regain all the two, these two, you know, the modality of sensation. There is a smell again, there is a test again, usually. The, the current, you know, the epidemiology uh, shows that the, there is a difference in the prevalence of the anosmia in certain populations, like in the Caucasians, there is a, they have the high prevalence of the anosmia. Or if we compare the Asian COVID patients, they have the low prevalence of the anosmia. And the few, you know, the, it could be due to the different strain of this COVID virus. It has been found that the, this strain that, you know, could lead to the high prevalence of the dysfunction of the olfaction in the Caucasian compared to the another strain in the Asian population. Further, if you look about the, the, uh, the olfaction and then the test prevalence in the different, you know, the geography, the almost all in the North America, Europe, Middle East, or in the East Asia, the prevalence of this dysfunction is more than 30 percent. But more we can see the few data, the preliminary data, they showed that the almost 60 percent in the Middle East olfactory dysfunctions, you know, the in the East Asia, it is less. It's, it's just only the 25 or something like that. Or in Europe or North America, it's not significantly different regarding this, the olfactory or the gustatory dysfunction. So despite, you know, the almost 50% of the COVID patients, you know, they 
have some sort of this, uh, the penis related, the neurological features, the loss of taste, loss of smell, you know, the, it is still, you know, under the less common symptoms according to the WHO. But the 50%, you know, the patients, they have this sort of the taste or the smell, these functions beside the other, you know, the specific neurological insert. So in summary, the regarding the olfaction or the taste, you know, the, the sensory neurons for the olfaction, the bipolar neurons, you know, the, it has the capability to regenerate. Therefore, there is no, you know, the olfactory dysfunction forever. They can regenerate the same things in case of the test. But it's still, you know, at this level, we don't know the, what exactly the reason, causation of this anosmia, dyscusia, or the others, you know, the chemostasis problems, you know, in, 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 in the patients. And the, the few patients, they showed some sort of the permanent loss of the, your, the olfaction or the test. That could be only we could hypothesize, you know, there is just some sort of the inherent vulnerability to knob damage, you know, there is a cranial, it, it could be due to the cranial neuropathy. The, some patient, the exhibits the permanent loss of the olfaction or the, uh, the test sensation. But despite this high prevalence of this olfactory dysfunction among the COVID patients, and its strong correlation to the shortness of breathing and the loss of test sensation, the, this chemosensory dysfunction, you know, it could be the common clinical features of the COVID. And the same chemosensory dysfunction, it could be a beneficial for the early diagnosis. It could be, you know, the regain of this could be the marker for the, in the treatment, or it could be used to heighten the vigilance for the viral transmission, and that can be used, you know, at the quarantine purpose as well. So the if we look the further, you know, these there are some more alarming, you know, the news are coming, like the the some of the virus, as we know, that can lead to the uh, the different the uh, the neurological disorders. For example, there is a report of the the multiple sclerosis that is usually seen in the uh, especially in the rodent and other animals but in humans there are few there is a narcolepsy or the this virus the others this virus it can lead to the you know lateral it can lead to the parkinson disease and so on the few reports are there that shows that there is a demyelination directly through the you know, the inflammatory inflammation triggered by this COVID. So it's a really alarming one because after a few years, there is a chance of having the MS, narcolepsy, or it could link to the Parkinson's disease as well. Right, so this is uh, all about my presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shunil Dungel. It was a very interesting and very timely talk. I think that this, your lecture will definitely enlighten all of us about the pandemic by which we are going on. I just over to chairpersons. Over to chairpersons of the session. Anybody yes. here? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Professor, this is Professor yeah, Raid. Sir, sir. Yeah, sir, wonderful sir. Uh, talk, uh, Professor Duman. I just wanted to know there's one or two things, you know, just general out of curiosity. Uh, yes, sir. One thing is that was there any correlation with the severity of the disease versus the loss of uh, smell sensation? Uh, sir, this is, yes, yeah, so it's, it's really very, you know, the very tough questions for at this level. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, you know, there is no any correlation between the severity and these things, sir. 
but the few only few just the a couple of week ago uh, i found one report from the germany uh, they said that there is a just only one you know only in the case only not in the systemic uh, the research they just showed in one or two cases only sir but at this point uh, i frankly listen sir other question would be almost like a part two of that question was there any recovery versus you know those who had they recovered faster or any kind of data since you looked at specifically from the chemo sensation angle right sir actually that's true yes sir there are a lot of you know the 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 papers there is a lot of findings they said that those you know the those who regain this chemo sensations if we you know the, it could be the that is why you know the now you know there is a lot of emphasis going on to consider the chemo sensation mm-hmm. it could be the predictor for the recovery also there are so many reports are coming also but it's still the problem is the loss of this chemo sensation or the taste senses it is not considered as a you know the primary disease you know the same things right. in in physiology also you know most of the time when it is the taste and these things we just combine this taste and olfaction in most of the curriculum they just combine and there is a less you know the the focus giving on this the part of the nervous system so there are reports sir thank you dr dongal i have just i'm reading a one question from uh, the chat also people are do you yes, think sir, please, that sir. i'm just reading a question from the chat box do you think that people with uh necrolepsy yes, and Park- parkinsonism are most sensitive to catch covid uh no sir i don't have any the data regarding this issue sir i can't say about this thing sir please can you ask okay. a question please yeah prof yes, yes, yes sure sure uh, this is yes, aslam from pakistan hi Now, sir please, how are you sir i'm very very oh. fine dr sunil wonderful talk but can you Thank suggest you, can you suggest any animal model to provide evidence for mechanism of development of anosmia and dysgeusia yes Because this sir. is all theoretical can you suggest any animal model to provide evidence right sir to yeah, understand actually, the mechanism right sir actually for uh, myself also i did some the work on this model the there is some techniques like for example we can do these things in the rat model at others road and also especially in the rat you know there are like the if we could inject the certain zinc sulfate it's a very simple the techniques procedures are there so if we just put some zinc sul- uh, sulfate and then that can destroy it, specifically to the olfactory epithelium so that could be the you know the model to understand the further about the mechanism of the alpha axon mm-hmm. or the you know the another thing is that the especially in the rodent in addition to the olfactory epithelium they have the vomero nasal organ you know mm-hmm. that we don't have we have but that is in the intrauterine lab only so mm-hmm. there is some limitations you know the, not mm-hmm. exactly we cannot mimic the things but at least in some extent the making the lesions to the olfactory epithelium or the olfactory tract especially the anterior olfactory nuclei or the area just below the uh, the frontal cortex that can be done in the animal model in the rat model sir right thank you very much thank you dr sunil right sir my praise sir i think it is yeah hello yeah please anybody could asking question if there is no question i will request uh, organizer to go for the next S- question Thank sir, you very much for Sir I wanted to ask one question. Yeah please. Yes please. Sir thank you for the wonderful presentation. My uh, uh, query is that uh, in covid-19 patient uh, abnormality in sleep pattern is also observed. Do you have any idea why this uh, abnormal sleep patterns are observed in these patients? Is it uh, in, in uh, release of neurotransmitters as because the sleep and wakefulness is controlled by the neurons in uh, hypothalamus and brain sheep as as your interest is in uh, nervous system central and peripheral nervous system right sir. right ma'am yeah i think yeah but the the, the you know the, the we have uh, 
such a less, you know, the data, systemic data. So it's too early to say exactly the mechanism behind why there's a narcolepsy or the other sort of the, you know, the sleep disorders in these things. But we can just correlate. Like, for example, if you just look the other flu virus or other influenza virus, the thing that, you know, that is due to the, you know, the uh, cytokine is strong. That is the yeah. the same mechanism we could, you know, the correlate here as well. But to be very frank, I don't find any data as the link between this to the narcolepsy and other things, ma'am. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank it's you very pleasure. much, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, over to over to organizer for the inviting next speaker. Over to organizing committee. I am audible. Yeah, you are audible, Professor Chandra. You are audible. Achha. 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 I, I, have, I have one question to the, uh, Professor Dangal. Dangal, yeah. Right. That where that the variation of taste and smell depends on age and sex or it depends on uh, the age group. So that it, it is uniform to all or it varies from individual to individual, sex, age, etc. This is my question. Professor Dungel. Professor Dungel, you are, you are, you are, are you there? Your mic is mute. Can you unmute? Are you available? I think it is very late night there. I think he could maybe. Yeah, yes, yes. Late night. I'm sorry, sir. Sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah. sir. It's up. You know, it's up. Yeah, yeah, yes, come back. Sorry, yeah, sir. Sorry. Yeah, yes, come <laughs> yeah, back. I'm here. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> Professor Dunkel, one question. Yes, can Professor Amarshan? Yes, sir, please. Mr. Amarshan, you can ask one question. Please, please repeat sir. Please repeat the question. Professor Amar K. Chandra, sir, please repeat the question. Oh, now he is, he is not available. I'm here, sir. You are here, but... Uh, Professor Amar K. Chandra uh, is not there who asked the question. Yeah, he is unmuting. Looks like he has. No, mute. Please mute. Please, please, please unmute. Please, please unmute, unmute, sir. Professor Chandra, please unmute. Yes, he has unmuted. No, it is again problem. No, not yet. Okay. I think that, uh, I think that uh, we can go to, I think we can go to the next, uh, next speaker. Dr. Samina Malik is also raising the hand, ma'am. Please go ahead if you have any question. I was jo just showing Professor Amar Chandra to hand me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But Dr. Shamina, sir, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to answer the Dr. Amar Chandra question if you just send me in the chat box. Yes, I'm available yes. and I'll answer. No I problem. Think, I, think, I think so. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's the way to go. Right, right sir. Yeah. 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 Organizing committee, organizing committee members, please go ahead with the next, next speaker. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce our next speaker for this session, Professor R. V. Kulkarni. He is Professor and Vice Principal at BLD EAS College of Pharmacy, Vijapur. His area of research comprises of novel drug delivery systems, including hydrogel-based oral and transdermal drug delivery systems. He has received several honors and awards. In 2019, he has received national award at 107th Indian Science Congress. He is an editorial board member of various journals, including Bentham Science Journal, Drug Delivery Letters, and BLD University Journal of Health Sciences. I welcome you, sir, to present the plenary lecture. Yes, Over Professor, Professor R. V. Kulkarni. Yeah. Professor Kulkarni. Thank, thank you, madam. Thank you for the introduction. And at the outset, I thank Professor Kushal Das and uh, Professor Iqbal Alam for giving me an opportunity to attack at this wonderful conference. Uh, my area is uh, drug delivery systems. Uh, I hope I am not Kavapka uh, Hadi uh, in this uh, physiology conference because this is the core physiology conference what I am observing last two days. Uh, anyhow, uh, I, uh, uh, for 20 minutes, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I'll just present my area, that is uh, drug delivery systems, how the concept of drug delivery systems have been evolved from traditional to 
novel drug delivery systems. Sir, is my screen is visible? Yes, yes, it is visible. You have to please go in slideshow mode. Yes. Yes, full screen, full screen. But that's all. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, chemotherapeutic responsive drug delivery systems. So bring you my content of the talk. Please, there we'll is echo. There is an echo there. Dr. Kulkarni, there is an echo. Once. Once. There's an echo. Yeah, it has not gone. It has gone now. It's okay, sir, now? But echo is still there, lower, but echo is there. Okay. Yeah. You carry on. So, can we see if you see both devices are uh, connected at the same time? My talk will be covering the drug delivery concept, drug delivery. I think that do you have the two two device you are using? One second, just time. No, sir, it's only one device. But there is some noise and the echo. Yeah, please go ahead again. Again, you try, you speak. Go ahead, sir. Yes, you please speak now. Is it okay, sir, now? Yes, fine. Yeah, it is fine. No. Yeah. So my talk covers drug delivery concept, conventional drug delivery systems, controlled drug delivery systems, Responsive drug delivery systems, polymer based hydrogels, responsive hydrogels, in that pH responsive hydrogel and electro responsive hydrogels, then functional modification of polymers, stimuli responsive polymers, the challenges ahead, and the conclusion. So, we know the drugs are very much important for the treatment of diseases. As we know how the cars are useless without roads. Drugs are also useless without a proper effective deli drug delivery system. Drug is only a weapon against the disease, but the delivery system is like a warrior. We should have a proper warrior for the battle. Similarly, we should have a proper drug delivery system for treating the diseases using the drugs. The aim of drug delivery is always getting the right drug at the right place and at the right concentration at the right time into the body for the treatment of diseases. So always, all the drug molecules are not great medicines. A drug molecule is a chemical entity. So great molecule should be a great medicine when there is a proper drug delivery approach. So we can classify the drug delivery systems in three ways. The conventional drug delivery systems, what we are seeing nowadays in the market, the novel drug delivery systems, and the future will be the responsive drug delivery systems. So nowadays, most of 50 to 60% of the market is with conventional drug delivery only. Slowly, the novel drug delivery systems are uh, getting into the market, but responsive drug delivery systems are future technologies. So to brief, uh, this is the route of drug administration. So we have various routes of drug administration based on which we are designing the drug delivery systems. So maybe Aquila drug delivery systems, nasal drug delivery systems, oral drug delivery is the most common route of drug administration today through which we are administering capsules, uh, liquid orals, tablets, etc. The another approach is transdermal drug delivery through which we are administering the drugs from the patches applying onto the skin through which the drug releases into the system circulation through the skin. And then subcutaneous implants is the another approach, vaginal drug delivery systems, rectum route for drug administration, then colonic drug delivery, drug targeting to the small intestine, drug targeting to the stomachs. These are the various approaches for the drug delivery system. So these are conventional drug delivery systems and novel drug delivery systems which are into the market today. 
So conventional drug delivery systems comprises parenterals, like injections, tablets, capsules, liquid orals, emulsions, suspension, creams, paste, and ointments. Whereas novel drug delivery systems comprises controlled release tablets, transdermal delivery systems, buccal drug delivery systems, colon targeted systems, implants, and particulate drug delivery systems like microspheres, nanoparticles, liposomes, and neosomes. So this is the concept of drug delivery. So conventional versus controlled or novel drug delivery systems. So today, most of, as I said, most of 50 to 60% of the market is with conventional drug delivery systems, what we are using. There are several limitations with the conventional drug delivery systems, like frequency of drug administration is more, like we are consuming a drug three times a day, four times a day. So this is this increases the frequency of drug administration. With this, there will be patient non-compliance and non-comfortness. Then there will be much fluctuations in the plasma concentration with this frequency of drug administration. Then there are chances of those missing and those dumping also. The drug toxicity increases with this frequency of administration. Whereas the novel drug delivery systems, there will be decrease in frequency of the drug administration because once the novel drug delivery or controlled drug delivery system is administered into the body with a single dose, the drug will be releasing for a longer period of time. Then this improves the patient compliance and comfort the plasma drug fluctuation is reduced with the novel drug delivery systems. The total load is reduced and dose dumping decreases. The uh, toxicity effects will also be decreased. So this is how the conventional drug delivery systems works. With the one single dose, the drug concentration in the plasma increases and after some time, the drug concentration decreases. We divide the therapeutic uh, effect of the drugs in three. One is therapeutic range, toxic range, and subtherapeutic range. So always the drug we administer should be in the therapeutic range for elicitation of pharmacological actions. If the drug reaches the toxic range above this therapeutic range, then there will be toxic effects on the body. And if the drug is below this minimum therapeutic concentration, then it won't show any pharmacological action. Simply, it can show adverse effects or it can eliminate them. So this is the second dose and this is the th third dose with a conventional drug delivery system. So how we are taking the uh, tablet morning, afternoon and evening. So with this, we can see there is a fluctuation of plasma drug concentration. So this will give a adverse side effects. Whereas with a controlled drug delivery system, with administered one tablet, the drug will be releasing for a longer period of time, made up to 12 hours or 20, 24 hours. So with this, we can avoid the plasma drug fluctuations. The limitations of conventional drug delivery systems can be conquered by either drug development or by control release systems. New drug development is in a costly effect. So the total cost for the development of a new drug and bringing it to the market, it may cost about approximately nearly 2.6 billion. And the time consumption is very high. If from the inception to the ingestion, it may take 10 to 12 hours for getting uh, synthesis, getting FDA approval and uh, getting into the market. So the another option is the development of controlled drug delivery systems using the drug delivery technology. Hence, this is the first one is not feasible, but with the second one for the existing drug, we can go for the development of novel drug delivery systems to conquer the limitations of conventional drug delivery systems. But the present uh, scenario is that the chronotherapy Chronotherapy, always we can see that constant drug, uh, drug delivery will be an alternate option for the tra traditional drug delivery systems. But many clinical studies have shown that the always constant drug delivery is also not effective from the pharmacological point of view. And there are many drugs like CVS drugs, anti-cancer drugs, anti uh, drugs, and psychotropic drugs, which show the daily variations in their effect. So for such drugs, there should be a coordination between the biological rhythms and the drug release, which is need of the hour today. So this new therapy, chronotherapy, it doesn't involve any new drugs. Only the old drugs can be used in a different approach that is using the novel approach for development of the drug delivery systems. So since many disorders will follow the circadian patterns in symptom appearance. So these are the few examples 
where uh, the disease follows circadian rhythms. So allergenic rhinitis, where the symptoms are more in the early morning. We can see bronchial asthma, symptoms are worst during the sleep period. And rheumatoid arthritis, symptoms are worst upon awakening. Then osteoarthritis, symptoms are more in the middle of the day. Then angina pectoris, myocardial infraction and all. We can see the symptoms are more in the early morning, similarly for peptic ulcers and stroke. So for such diseases, if the drug delivery is synchronized with the symptom appearance, then it would be a wonderful technology. So the stimuli responsive release is the another uh, uh, second option uh, for the controlled release. So ideal drug delivery system which can respond to changes in physiological conditions and accordingly modify the drug release pattern is required, which is need of the hour. So for such uh, drug delivery systems, stimuli response to drug delivery systems can be prepared. Such drug delivery systems can be prepared using the hydrogels, which can show the dramatic changes in their swelling behavior and mechanical strength in response to different internal and external stimuli. So such drug delivery systems are called as responsive drug delivery systems. So this is how. So we, we have seen the conventional drug delivery systems. We have seen the controlled release with single dose. The drug release will be there for a longer period of time in order to uh, get the uh, uh, plasma concentration, uniform plasma concentration. But again, it has proved in the clinical studies that all the uh, drugs will not uh, show the proper effect. So we, for this reason, the another option is stimuli response units. Whenever there is a symptoms, at that time only drug will be released and rest of the time, the drug release will be either at the basal level or no drug release. Such drug delivery systems are required and those are the future drug delivery systems. And Next, uh, this is the polymer uh, responsive drug delivery systems can be prepared using the polymeric hydrogels. So these hydrogels are the hydrophilic polymers. They are three-dimensional hydrophilic polymers, generally cross-linked. So either these hydrogels are chemically cross-linked and physically cross-linked. So the structure of hydrogel looks like this. So these are the cross-linked structures, a simple even hydrophilic polymers can also be used for the formation of hydrogels. So hydrogels have wide n number of applications. They can be used in drug delivery systems. They are being used in topical drug, uh, systems. Then they are scaffold for tissue engineering, wound dressings, artificial kidney membranes, artificial tendon and cartilages. And, and most of the uh, contact lenses what we are today using are made up of hydrogels. Synthesis uh, part of hydrogen is a very simple, but purification is a tedious process. Uh, this is a linear polymer in a solution, either by chemical or physical cross-linking, the hydrogel is formed. Then after purification, you can get the solar hydrogel, which can be used for drug delivery applications. So this is how uh, loaded, drug loaded or protein loaded hydrogel it looks like. So this is the hydrogel in a solar state, and this is the hydrogel in a desolar state. This hydrogel depending upon external stimuli or internal stimuli, either it will swell or it will de-swell. So this is how swelling, de-swelling mechanism. Once there is an external stimuli, since these hydrogels are responsive hydrogels, once there is an external stimuli, an application of stimuli, either hydrogel will collapse or it will swell. Based on this, the drug will be released from the entrapped hydrogels. So these are the uh, types of hydrogel uh, responsive hydrogels. Among them, graft polymer and IPN hydrogels are most widely used. So these are different types of uh, responsive hydrogels. So my area is uh, pH responsive hydrogel and electrically responsive hydrogel. So this is how pH responsive hydrogel works. Say for example, uh, our uh, GIT, entire GIT is, uh, there is a pH variation among the entire GIT. So the stomach which is having a very low pH. When we, we move down to the gut, there will be increased pH. So this can be exploited. This nature can be exploited for the development of drug delivery systems. So where at lower pH, there is no ionization of hydrogel. So it is an intact state, no drug release. Once it reaches the intestine, uh, large intestine or small intestine, there will be ionization of hydrogel so that the entrapped drug will be liberated based on the pH. So this is how it works. So high, uh, swelling of 
hydrogen are shrinking. In both the cases, the liberated drug will be released. The second one is electrically responsive hydrogen. These are also uh, responsive hydrogens, which are mainly polyelectrolytes in nature. They also undergo ionization depending upon the electric stimulus. So such hydrogens can be used uh, for the transdermal drug delivery systems or they can also be implanted under the skin and uh, with a minor surgery. Then depending upon the requirement, the external stimulus can be applied on the skin. At that time only the drug will be released and remaining time the hydrogen remains intact. There won't be any drug release. So this is a mechanism. And in future, such drug delivery systems containing electrically responsive hydrogels could be in the form of small portable units like a wristwatch. Whenever the drug release is required, we can turn it off and on. Our patient could turn it on when the drug release is required. We can program it. Functional modification. We are working on functional modification of polymers. So these are the natural gums we are using. So spray dried microspheres. Uh, we have prepared using the gel and gum, and we have characterized it by uh, proton enema, neutralization equivalent, FTIR spectroscopy, element analysis, etc. And then we have developed the microspheres loaded with the capacitor by anti cancer drug and evaluated for all these parameters, which shows this is the syn synthesis of uh, PA sensitive polymer and FTIR, NMR spectroscopy, TZA. All these have confirmed the grafting reactions. So these are the evaluative parameters. The microspheres were spherical in uh, shape with the rough space and uh, intactness of the drug has been uh, confirmed with the chemical stability using the FTI. DSA and XRD studies have confirmed the amorphous nature of the drug. And so pH sensitivity has been studied. You can see here when the pH has been raised, the swelling was more, drug release was more. When the pH was decreased, there was a decreased swelling as well as drug release. So this is the drug release pattern. And we have studied in vivo rongenography also in the rabbits. These were the particles which were intact and images taken at four, six and eight hours indicate there is a movement of particles among the gut transverse. And then at the end of 10th or 12th hour, these particles have been uh, disintegrated and liberated the entire loaded drug into the colonic region. The second uh, uh, one is uh, uh, electrically responsive hydrogel drug delivery systems we have uh, synthesized and we have used a pululon as a natural polymer and we have developed the transdermal drug delivery systems which are responsive to electricity. So this is uh, characterization part and SEM and you can see here the electrical sensitivity of the hydrogen, when there is a applied electric stimulus, the drug release was faster and in the absence of electric stimulus, drug release was at the base level are almost nil. This is the histopathology of normal skin and skin treated with electric stimulus. We have uh, studied, uh, there was a reversible change in the uh, skin after application of electric stimulus, which was uh, slowly recovered after 24 hours. There are challenges. Uh, for the uh, for in the development of such formulations, uh, those are slow response of the hydrogels, biocompatibility, low mechanical strength, more number of smart hydrogels still to be searched, and improved treatment diseases with a cost-effective treatment because it, uh, the cost uh, these such uh, drug delivery systems are not cost-effective. However, uh, still work has to be done on this. Just uh, I, I'll just uh, two minutes video. Uh, I'll show you how this. Uh, drug delivery, smart drug delivery will work.
Is there any problem, Dr. Kulkarni? Is there any problem on video? So it's not playing? No, it is not playing. No, it's not playing. <clears throat> no, sir? No. no. So, you, sir, you have to go and share the video. It will not play inside PowerPoint. If you want to. One minute. One minute. Yeah, it is. It, it may be starting now. Is it visible, sir? Now? Yes. Sorry, sir, we are not hearing any sound. Is this silent, sir? There is no background. Okay. But we have, we have seen. Yep. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Kurkani. Yeah. yeah. Please, is it is it over or? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. To conclude, uh, that should be combined. Is it visible, sir? No. Yes, yes. Uh, to conclude, uh, the combined efforts by the pharmaceutical scientists, medical doctors, and polymer scientists through an interdisciplinary approach is need of the hour. Uh, to develop such drug delivery systems for the effective treatment of various diseases. And I, I thank, uh, I acknowledge my, uh, all the collaborators and Physiological Society of India, South Asian Association of Physiologists for giving me an opportunity. And at the same time, I thank my collaborators and all my research scholars. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kulkarni. Uh, it's an excellent talk. And Professor Kulkarni, though he is a pharma, pharmaceutical scientist, but he is a life member of the Physiological Society of India. So this is for the information. And he has awarded the Physiological Society of India as one of the most prestigious awards. And uh, he is my collaborator also in the Government Research Fund together. And now I just uh, I welcome Dr. Iqbal. I think Dr. Iqbal, you have to take care till I arrive. And mm -hmm. in spite of your tight schedule, 
and thank you very much to chairpersons. Please you continue and just I have an important work, so I'll be going for some time. Again, I'll be joining. I'll be missing you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kulkarni and uh, chairperson. Over to chairperson. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Kusura. Thank you. Bye. So the next speaker. So I request no IT team to introduce the next speaker, please. I am audible. Yes. Yes, Dr. Iqbal, you are audible. I am saying oh. that IT support should introduce the next speaker. Wonderful to see you. Dr. Good morning. Good morning. Dr. Amna, please yes, introduce sir. the ne next speaker. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for the interesting talk. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Deepti De Silva. She is professor in the Department of Physiology. Faculty of Medicine, University of Kelania, Sri Lanka. Her clinical and research interests include genetics of craniofacial malformations, congenital heart diseases, and deafness. She has been a president of the Physiological Society of Sri Lanka from 2013 to 2014 and a vice president of SAP from 2014 to 2016. I welcome you, ma'am, to present your plenary lecture. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I would also like to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to pre present this talk. I'm deeply humbled to be in the company of these wonderful speakers who have spoken so far today and yesterday as well. So I would like to talk today on the role of connections in cochlear functions. In my talk today, what I will do is to talk a little bit about the structure and function of the organ of Corti. And then we want to talk about connections, connexons, and gap junctions. I will then talk about the role of the gap junctions and the connexin hemichannels in three particular areas, with potassium recycling in the cochlea, with purinergic signaling, and lastly, the embryonic development of cochlear structure and function. So as you all know, the sound waves that are uh, detected are transmitted through the external and middle ear and then uh, are involved in the causing of movement of the, uh, the, the stapes, the foot pit of the stapes that pushes through the window into the cochlea. The cochlea is made up of a fluid filled chambers, the, the scala vestibuli, the media, and the tympani. And they are separated by two membranes, the Reissner and the bacilla membrane. So if you look at the uh, organ of Corti in more detail, it lies on the bacilla membrane. And it is in the middle of it, it contains this, the rods of Corti. And on one side of the rods of corti are the inner hair cells, and the other side, three outer hair cells. And this structure is present from the base to the apex of the cochlea. Surrounding the cochlear hair cells. There is some the, network. Okay, no, you back here. Surrounding the cochlear hair cells are the supportive cells. Around the inner hair cells are the inner phalangeal cells, and these cells are the sulcus, the in, in, inner sulcus. Surrounding the outer hair cells are these cells, which are called the Dieter cells, Hansen cells, Claudius cells, which lead to the connective tissue of the spiral ligament, and then on to this structure, the stria vascularis. And the stria is important because it is the structure that secretes potassium into the fluid of the scala media, which is called the endolymph. The scalar vestibula and the tympani has perilymph that is low, uh, low in potassium, but high in sodium. And this difference is significant because the hair cells themselves at their tips are exposed to the high potassium containing endolymph, but their bases are immersed in the perilymph. 
And this generates what's called the intracochlear pretension the, that causes the important depolarization of the hairs, which I'll come to in a second. So sound waves, as they're transmitted into the scalar vestibuli, cause a, a pressure wave that is transmitted through the Reissner membrane and causes movement of the basilar membrane. Basilar membrane movement causes shearing of the hair cell tips. And this in turn causes the opening of potassium channels, entry of potassium, and depolarization of the hair cell, which results in the influx of calcium and the release of glutamate that in turn causes action potentials in the afferent nerve. So now let, I, let me move on to the connexins. The connexin are, and they're coded for by genes called the gap junction genes. The gap junction genes share quite a lot of sequence similarity with regard to their DNA sequence. And they are categorized into five separate entities uh, named A to E. And within each category are subcategories which are given a number. So gap junction B2, for example, it's in a similar family, connexin 26 and connexin 30, respectively. And I'll come back to this in a little while. These two genes, the gap junction B2 and the gap junction B6, are particularly relevant in clinical practice because mutations in these two genes have been identified as being responsible for at least 50% of the clinical non-syndromic sensory neural deafness. So these are babies who are born or identified as having deafness very early in life. It's pre-lingual. So these children will never develop speech. So now let me move on to the connexin protein. So the protein is given a number. So I told you that DGB2 are called for connexin 26. So connexin 26 is named that because 26 is the molecular mass in kilodal, quite confusing when you read the, read the literature about the names of the genes and the proteins. But all the connexins have a similar structure. So basically they have these four transmembrane domains, two extracellular domains, uh, which are the loops and one intracellular loop. In terms of its function of, the N-terminal and the first transmembrane domain are involved in um, forming the core of the gap junction, and it is involved. The extracellular, uh, the second extracellular domain, the the loop, is involved in interactions with other connexins and other and formation of gap junctions. And lastly, the C-terminal is involved in protein interactions, particularly with phosphorylation, as well as involvement with other membrane proteins and the cytoskeletal protein. So these connexins are formed into connexons, and the connexons are made up of six connexin proteins. These are assembled in the transgolgi and transported to the cell membrane. So a single connexon is called a hemichannel, and it can act by itself by causing a movement of uh, ions or of small molecules in a, across the cell membrane of a single cell. The hemichannel can also dock with another hemichannel on, an, on the neighboring cell and form the gap junction. So these gap junction pores are large enough to allow not only ions, but also small molecules to go through them. And the connexins can be combined. Either they can form the connexons uh, uh, with or a single connexin, or they can form a mixture. And, and how they are formed into connexons and gap junctions depends 
on the local needs of the environment that they are located in. So the next question that I'm going to answer is where these connections are expressed in the cochlea. So in the cochlea, just orientate you through this slide, this microscopic slide of here are the rod cells, uh, the rods of the cochlea, and on the outside, the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells. So when they are fluorescently labeled with the immunohistochemistry for connexin 26 and 30, you can see that the outer and the inner hair cells do not have any expression of connexin protein. It is the supportive cells of the organ of corti. So these are the, the inner hair cell, the in, inner phalangeal cells, and the sarcal cells that are expressing connexins. If I move now to the stria vascularis, the structure that is involved in secretion of potassium into the scalar media and the lymph, stria also expresses connexins, but at its basal layer. So where the spiral ligament lies, there's connexin expression and also the border and the intermediate cell, but not these medial cells that are involved that are in the secretion of potassium itself. So it's the basal layers of the stria that are involved in secretion, uh, uh, in expressing connexins. So now that we know that connexin 26 is a very important player, it's an important cause, of congenital deafness, the question that has been asked is why? Why does it, or what's the mechanism of causing deafness with these mutations? So the conventional uh, assumption is that the mutation confers an abnormal permeability to potassium in the cochlea. And the potassium recycling is affected leading to the accumulation, the abnormal accumulation of potassium in the hair cells which lead to their de degeneration and then the loss of hair cells. So if I look, if I explain again the recycling of potassium. So potassium in the endolymph can only enter towards the perilymph through the hair cells. It's through their depolarization that potassium can enter the hair cells. And once they're the, in the potential, the potassium has to leave. And it leaves into this uh, extracellular space of the cochlea. And from there, the potassium has to be recycled. There are two pathways for it. It can enter the perilymph. And through that, through the spiral ligament, go back towards the stria or it can go through the supportive cells of the Dieter cells, the Henson cells, and the Claudius cells, and then go through to the stria. Same with the inner hair cells. They can also do that through their supportive cells and directly secrete into the endolymph as well. And this uh, is a very important uh, function of the gap junctions because it is very important to recycle the uh, potassium to maintain normal function. But in many patients and the animal models with connexin 26 knockout animals or the 30 knockout animals, what is clear is that the permeability to potassium is not always affected. So that has led to the question of what else might be involved in the causation of deafness with connexin 26 and connexin 30 mutations. So let me just talk you through this. Before I explain ATP and purinergic signaling. So, this and the extracellular space around it, and these are the supportive cells of the hair cell. So, potassium enters the hair cell when it's depolarized, and the potassium has to leave the hair cell. The question. The question is how this potassium can now enter the supportive cells of the hair cell. 
So this is where the connections come in. Connections, as I said, are not expressed in the hair cells, but they are expressed in the connector in the supportive cells. So here in the supportive cells, facing the scalar media and the endolymph are hemichannels of connections, not the connexon hemichannels. And these are exposed to the endolymph. And the endolymph, apart from having a high potassium, of course, has a low sodium, but also a low calcium level. And this low calcium stimulates the opening of the hemichannels. And when these hemichannels are open, they allow the movement of ATP, give cell to the extracellular compartment. And there, they act as a, as a signaling molecule. And there they bind a particular uh, receptor called the P2X receptor. And when the P2X is stimulated by ATP binding, it causes the opening of a potassium channel. So now we have a mechanism for the potassium that leaves the hair cell to enter the extracellular space. And from the extracellular, it enters the supportive cells. And in supportive cells, they are now able to move the potassium ions through using the gap junctions towards the stria vascularis for the recycling to take place. Now, in addition to their role in potassium recycling, the ATP also acts on metabolic receptors, which are called the P2Y receptors, and there are many of these. And one of the functions of these P2Y receptors is to cause intracellular signaling, which eventually causes an increase in IP3. And the increase in IP3 signals the release of calcium within the cell, and the calcium is now able to pass using the gap junctions to adjacent cells. Now, this calcium flux is also reported in normal uh, cochlea, and it is absent in cochleas of animals with 26, connection 26 and 30 knockout animals. So it seems to be have an important function, but exactly what it does is not very clear. Another postulated role for this P2 y uh, receptor mediated uh, function is to reduce the outer hair cell movement in response to loud noise. And by dampening those movements, it may protect the cochlea from sound-induced damage. Next, I want to talk about the role of connexins in cochlear development. Now, the cochlea is a relatively avascular area, and therefore its delivery of nutrients and other signaling molecules is performed through the gap junctions. So nutrients are obviously essential for these developing and uh, multiplying cells. And the signaling molecules are essential because not only is there proliferation, there's differentiation of these cells in the developing cochlea. And this absence may be very important in the abnormal functions or the or abnormal structure and the functions of the cochlea in later life. So what is known is that the development of the endolymphatic or the endocochlear potential is altered in the knockout animals. So it's particularly the connexin 30, but connexin 26 expression is also essential for this development of the endolymphatic potential. And in the absence, it's not there and deafness will ensue. The other function that appears to be involved in these knockout animals is that the tunnel of corti is opened up to allow the normal development of structures through it. But in these knockout animals, this uh, tunnel of corti remains closed. And again, is a cause of structural abnormality associated with the deafness. After the, the basic structures of the cochlea are developed, and before hearing is developed, there appears to be some signaling in the neurons. And the spinal ganglion can be identified as showing some action potentials in it. And this appears to be related to the release of glutamate from the hair cells. And it has been postulated that this ATP 
uh, that is released is probably also involved in this beginning of new uh, uh, signaling within this developing cochlea. And this signaling is essential for further development of the cochlea in survival of the neurons there, in wiring, and also in probably developing the tonality of the cochlea for specific tones. Having said that, ATP may be not the only mechanism and other mechanisms may also be involved in this uh, development of this beginning of sound detection. So what happens? So this is a diagram of the primitive cochlea with the inner hair cells and their supporting cells. And here, the supporting cell spontaneously releases ATP. And this ATP acts on these purinergic receptors to release potassium. And the potassium then acts on the inner hair cell. And that's what causes the release, causes the depolarization, and therefore the subsequent release of the neurometer to cause action potentials in the afferent nerve. Further investigations have shown that the ATP works in fact on a uh, receptor called the P2RY1 receptor. And here, what happens is that the stimulation of this causes the release of potassium. Potassium released causes depolarization of the uh, hair cell and the uh, detect uh, the, the passing of an action potential in the afferent nerve. And these depolarizations are occurring every now and then, sporadically, in the normal developing cochlea. And they are associated with a surge in potassium. But what also happens is as after potassium is released, chloride and water follow. And this causes a shrinking or crenation of these supportive cells, and also it causes a reduction in the potassium available for the hair cell. And as a result, the firing of the hair cell reduces. This normal pattern of episodic uh, action potentials is not present in cells where this receptor is blocked. When this receptor is blocked, there is in fact a continuous, a paradoxical, but continuous um, stimulation of the cell and the continuous action potentials at low frequency. And this predicts a deafness uh, in the future. The last function that I'm going to discuss today of the gap junctions is the transport of microRNA. MicroRNA has many functions in the cell, but in the developing cochlea, microRNA 96 is particularly important as, a, as a, one of the mechanisms for opening the cochlear channel. And the absence of connexins may probably contribute uh, to the reduction in the microRNA transport and therefore the mechanism be also a mechanism for deafness in these children, uh, in, the uh, in, the, in these animals, and not presumably in the human model of connexin 26 deficiency. So in this talk today, in this brief talk today, I have discussed the role of the cochlea in and the uh, connexin and the gap junctions of the cochlea in potassium recycling, in the purinergic uh, responsive uh, um, mechanisms in the hair cell and the signaling that occurs, and finally, in the development of the cochlea uh, as a structure, as well as its early development functionally. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such a wonderful... Yeah, thank you, ma'am, again, for such a wonderful presentation. And I think we all are enlightened by your, uh, you know, uh, in-depth um, uh, analysis and in-depth presentation of data in various forms and connection and we just were initially thinking it's a gap junction protein but now after listening to your talk i think everybody will appreciate that you have covered such a wide array of its function especially at the end to the transport of micro rna so i will first uh, request if anybody any audience has a question then followed by i may ask you 
Sir, please, if anyone has a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. You can put in chat box, type in chat box also. Deepi, very nice talk and it was very enlightening to see the role of connections in uh, hearing dysfunction. Do we, is there any way to quantify this connection deficiencies or defects in a genetic uh, way yeah. or? Yes, we, we are in fact involved this by interest in this because we are trying to uh, do some of the determination of the, we, we can certainly very easily and it's a clinically diag it's a clinical diagnostic test to, uh, to look for the mutations in connexin. Uh, but as a research, there's a lot of interest in identifying why it is that these connexin mutations uh, cause so many different phenotypes. So you can have a children with the same mutation who have different degrees of severity of the deafness, for example. So yes, we can do the mutation, but in humans, it's more difficult, of course, to know what's happening inside the cochlea. In fact, in the literature, there's only one case report uh, of uh, a person, and it's a Chinese patient who died in her 40s, known to have connexin mutations. And she shows the same kind of appearance uh, of the uh, inner ear structures as the knockout mouse. But on the other hand, when you look at the knockout mouse models, they don't entirely predict what is happening in the human because you can have mutations that cause a different phenotype in the knockout, whereas the human phenotype is different. So it is complicated and it's, uh, the answer to it is it's not easy to do it. And at the moment, what is available is the DNA mutation testing only. And knowing the mutation, we can predict what the protein is going to do and what kind of uh, effect it will have on the protein function. But that is all we can do at the moment. Yeah. Now, clinically, these patients will have neural deafness, is it? Yes, they have uh, usually congenital uh, sensory neural deafness and it's prelingual. Uh, but what is interesting is that it's non progressive. So these, these are the particular group of children who have congenital. Pre prelingual deafness and it is non-progressive but this is where the problem comes in there are recessive forms of it and then the same uh, gene has dominant mutations as well so you have a heterozygous mutation that can also give rise to deafness sometimes later on and sometimes with the um, variable with the progressive deafness as well thank you Deepthi. very nice uh can I ask a question from Deepti? Yes. Sure, sure. Uh, Deepti, it's a very interesting talk. Now, what is the connection between PX2, P2X receptor and tinnitus? I, I, yes, there is a connection. Um, yeah. I need to, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I was reading around it, but I didn't have yeah. time to finish my reading because it's not an yeah, area sure. that I'm involved in. But I'll send you the reference, Rajira. Um, right, it, yeah. I found that reference. It there should have a, a similar connection. similar connection, I suppose, no? Yes, this. yes. There yeah. is a discussion about tinnitus uh, with this. Thank you, Deepthi. Very interesting. If any other if not, we will again appreciate and acknowledge Dr. Deepthi's wonderful presentation and the way she highlighted or the way she presented right from physiology, pathology to molecular biology, genetics, every aspect has been covered for the So, I mean, we can't give her a big hand from here, <laughs> but just really thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful presentation and we look forward to, I would say, the more uh, offline interaction if and we'll definitely love to welcome you in India. Thank you okay. very much. I think good yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for the interesting talk. With the permission of the chair, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. G. K. Pal. He is professor of physiology at Jipmer Pondicherry, India. He has rich experience of 25 years with specialty in physiology, neurophysiology hypertension and obesity research and yoga. Dr. G.K. Pal has been awarded the best teacher award for the year 2017 and his outstanding contribution to academics, research and medical education in physiology, APPI. I welcome you, sir, to present your plenary lecture. Over to Dr. G.K. Pal.
very good morning all of you good morning sir uh, am i audible yeah, clearly yeah, fine, yeah. perfectly audible yeah good morning and welcome yeah please go ahead perfectly all slides uh, are fine yeah so uh, today's talk of mine is the dysfunction of microbiota gut brain axis in clinical disorders the role of sympathological imbalance at the outset i would like to thank the organizer especially professor mohammad iqbal for inviting me for uh, participating in sir you are not audible somo extra हेलो प्रोफेसर पाल आई गेस योर इंटरनेट कनेक्शन गोट फ्रोजन सर वी आर नॉट हियरिंग एनीथिंग देयर इज सम प्रॉब्लम या देयर सम इशू इज विद द इंटरनेट लेट मी रीकनेक्ट अस I think there is some technical issues from Dr. G K Pal's side. I think we can wait for a while uh, to let him connect with us. If there is a problem, shall we do the next lecture? This will then technically end this session, or what? No, no, wait. no. we can wait for one or two yeah. minutes. There's a last talk of this session, right, Doctor Akbar? Yes. yes. We can wait for talk. one or two minutes, and yes, uh, yes. if still he is not connected, then we can proceed to the next session. Yeah, correct. Maybe, uh, Doctor Akbar, you can uh, communicate over phone to Doctor Pal. You can confirm. Yes. डॉक्टर भावना इज देयर डॉक्टर भावना डॉक्टर भावना यस यस कैन यू कॉल इन श्योर सर As we are unable to connect with Dr. G K Pal, I think we should uh, we should commence with our next session. For the session F, I would like to invite our eminent chairpersons, and before that, I would like to in, uh, thank the chairperson for session E, Professor Charu Hans, ma'am. from jamia hamdard uh, department of microbiology and professor mavish aruch from pakistan and professor zahid ashraf 
from Jamia Millia Islamia. Thank you, sir and ma'am, for chairing the session. Thank you. Ma'am, you would like to speak something? The Yes, ma'am. Our uh, chairperson for the last session, Professor Charu Hans, ma'am, want to speak something. Thank you all the speakers for wonderful and informative talks. We really enjoyed and which has enhanced our knowledge, especially I'm personally connected to the cochlear implant. So the, this lecture was really very knowledgeable and uh, it increased our knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, um, sir, Zahid Ashraf, sir, for chairing this session. Now we would like to proceed you, to, our, to our next session. And I would like to invite the chairpersons for this session, Professor V.P. Vashne, sir. Dr. V.P. Vashne is the director, professor and head department of physiology at Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. He was awarded the R. Srinivasan prize for the best paper presentation. His area of interest is autonomic function test, exercise physiology and neurophysiology. He has edited and authored many books. He has several publications in National and International Journal of Repute. Our next chairperson for this session is Professor Sunita Mondal, ma'am. She is Director, Professor and Head, Department of Physiology, LHMC Delhi. She has been serving continuously in the Department of Physiology at Lady Harding Medical College for past 29 years. She has been keenly involved in research pertaining to the role of yoga and lifestyle intervention. Dr. Mondal was awarded Dr. Gauri Bazaar's Malik Research Grant at Lady Harding Medical College for conducting research in allergy and immunology. Our next chairperson person for this session is Professor Sandeep Kumar. He is Professor Orthopedics at Himsar Institute, New Delhi. He was awarded with RULA Best Researcher Award for the year 2019 for the paper on epidemiology of knee osteoarthritis in Indian population. Accredited by the World Research Council, Organizing Secretary of Delhi Orthopedic Association, MID Term Conference, organized by Department of Orthopedics, Himsar Jamia Hamdar. Our next chairperson for this uh, session is Dr. Himani Aluwalia. She is Director, Professor and Head, Department of Physiology, Vardhman Mahavir Medical College, New Delhi. She has several publications in National and International Journal of Repute. I welcome all the chairperson to, um, in this uh, conference. And uh, with the per permission of the chair, I would like to invite the speaker of the session, Professor Umar Ali Khan. He is Professor of Physiology and Pro Vice Chancellor, Isra University, Islamabad, and Principal Al Nafis Medical College and Hospital. Islamabad. Professor Khan is winner of Professor Sayyid Alamdar Hussain Shield for Best Paper Presentator at 5th Biennial International Physiology Conference at Ayub Medical College, Pakistan. He was also faculty supervisor of Dr. Atik Memorial Best Undergraduate Paper Presenter Award at 8th Biennial International Physiology Conference at Nishtar Medical College, Multan, Pakistan. I welcome you, sir, to deliver your plenary lecture. Over to Professor Omar Ali Khan. Professor Umar Ali Khan. Dr. Samina? Dr. Samina? Aslam, sir. Aslam alaikum. Professor Umar Ali Khan is not present in the participants. I have checked that. I can call okay. him on phone. Okay, please.
Sorry, his number is powered off right now. Uh, Professor G.K. Paul is there. Dr. Paul? Okay, then uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Dr. Khan. G.K. Khan? Uh, sir, uh, but we could not see him on the list. Professor Gosal Azam Khan, sir. So maybe you can have me now and wait for them. Yes, yes ma'am. If you permit, yeah, we can sure, start sure. with your lecture. And, and please allow me to be Dr. the host. Join. To be the host or co-host. Ah, sure, ma'am. Uh, wait, uh, Dr. Samina. He is joining. Dr. Khan is joining now. Okay, right now. We'll, okay. Wait. we'll wait. Ah, time. Dr. Gosul Khan is joining. Hello. Hello, uh, Gosul, uh, please. Yes. I am sharing. Yeah. Uh, I think Professor Gosul Azam Khan sir has joined with us. So, uh, with the permission of the chair, I would like to uh, invite and introduce Professor Gosul Azam Khan, who is Professor of Physiology at Fiji School of Medicine, Fiji National University. He was recipient of several international awards, such as developing World Scientist Award from ISTH. He is currently working on role of sterile inflammation in cardiovascular disease and insulin resistance under stress. I invite you, sir, and welcome you to present your plenary lecture. Good morning. It is indeed a pleasure to participate in the SAF Physiology Conference, I would like to thank Professor Iqbal Alam, as well as all the dignitaries in this field. So today I am going to talk about some of my research. The title is Stress-Induced Sterile Inflammation and Insulin Resistance and Novel Role of von Willebrand Factor. So, here we showed that BW act as a the regulator of nitric synthase. As we know that diabetes is a one of the global burden and affected 11 in one individual overall, 422 million people affected and most of them from the LMIC. According to who it is the, it will be the third universal, uh, you know, one third of the universal population would be the diabetic in 2015. And about 4 million people have been died 
each year. So what is the cause? The cause is a lot like socioeconomic as well as cultural globalization stress is the one of the important factor which induces diabetes. So we had uh, working a long time about the inflammation and cardiovascular disease. So here I would like to a little bit uh, introduce about the inflammation. So if you look at here, this uh, small cartoon, so, you know, the um, several disease leading to inflammation as well as inflammation leading to, di you know, diabetes as well as cardiovascular diseases. But if you look at this uh, mm, diagram, already been uh, several scientists said they showed that a lot of damage, you know, death cell or nephrotic cells also releases a lot of uh, molecules like double standard DNA, HMG1, S100B proteins, and interleukins. These are actually the sterile inflammatory markers. So these activate the toll-like receptors. These are one of the innate immune system. And down, it will activate the mead as well as the transcription regulation leading to pro-inflammation and release of cytokines and chemokines. And overall, the cardiovascular disease and insulin resistance. And here, if you see, these are the, you know, damage associated molecular pattern and their receptors. So the question is, is there any relationship between the stress or hypoxic stress in the insulin resistance? Yes, there is some paper already been published and they showed there is a relation of the hypoxic stress and the insulin resistance. And there is also some evidence that, that you know, several hypoxic condition also leading to heart attack, peripheral hospital disease, cancer, and several other diseases. So is there any relationship? So the any defect in nitric acid production or endothelial dysfunction, there is any relationship with nitric acid production and the cardiovascular disease, yes. There is a several article already been published and they showed that insulin resistance and nitric oxide, there is a relationship. So endothelial dysfunction is a one of the predetermined state due to the stress. So endothelial dysfunction leading to hypertension and vasospasm, heart failure, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, immune reaction, and atherosclerosis. Therefore, if the balance is disturbed, the endothelial dysfunction is leading to, you know, pro-coagulation state or the dysfunction of the endothelium. So endothelium releases so many molecules, which is help in the, which is prevent the thrombosis, as well as the you know hypertension. So there is a few articles they relate all these things. So next with uh, this one article published in 2018 by the Frankel. It is a big um, study, it's a Farmingham Ospin study. This study gave us a clue, and the first time showed there is a relationship between the diabetes mellitus and cardiovascular disease with the vulnerability one factor. So when there is an endothelial dysfunction, so one factor is released from the endothelium. So actually the endothelium, um, they are dysfunction. So VWF is the hallmark for the endothelial dysfunction. So what are the, uh, there are several studies already been showed that volunteer factor and cardiovascular disease. So VWF, not only the carrier molecular factor eight, it will also induce the diabetes, thrombosis, inflammation, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and platelet addition and thrombosis. So it already been some clinical scenario, a lot of scientists been shown. So what is the new here? So there is a you know, lot of questions which is not unanswered. So what is the relationship between 
the endothelial leakage function, VWF, and the nitric oxide and the insulin resistance. So we hypothesize that might be VWF inhibit insulin action by binding to nitric oxide synthase and impair the nitric oxide production, leading to insulin resistance. So the first of all, we'd like to to prove this hypothesis. We did the you know the time dependent and um, dose dependent study whether the hypoxia leading to uh, you know stress leading to endothelial you know uh, uh, glucose homeostasis and endothelial dysfunction. Here we uh, we measure the GTT ITT and as an endothelial dysfunction marker it is the VWF multimeric form of the VWF by ELISA and the gel acid. If you look at here, hypoxia induces time dependent GTT, ITT, as well as the home IR, and also simultaneously the VWF release and multimeric form of the VWF in the plasma. So next the question, whether hypoxia induced or uh, insulin resistance zone so IG oxide. So to prove this, we've, we've done a series of experiments. Here, if you look at, first, we use the recombinant VWF and we use a hypoxic plasma. So if you, in the reaction mixture, when you were adding the hypoxic plasma, so the nitric oxide is inhibited. And the same situation when you're adding the recombinant VWF, nitric oxide production, here inhibited significantly. But if you immunodepleted the same plasma and put in the reaction mixture, it's completely inhibited. So it's a restore. And this suggests that VWF having a role in production of nitric oxide. Or sorry, uh, inhibition of the nitric oxide. Now we we would like to prove the same thing, use the different uh, concentrations of VWF and measure the nitric uh, inhibition. If you look at here, the higher concentration of nitric, you know, VWF inhibits the nitric oxide, and the maximum inhibition started in 125 picomole. So next question, so whether the uh, this VWF having any role in the Glucose homeostasis. So here we use the anti vdf antibody. Okay. So we inject the animal with the anti vdf uh, antibody and put in the hypoxia and we measure the GTT. So if you look at the hypoxia induces the GTT, but once we treated it with the VWF antibody, then we put in the hypoxia is significantly decreased. And similar situation in the IR and also in the glucose uptake, the stiffat in glucose uptake. Here we added the two things, the LM and fluoridine. This is the nitric oxide inhibitor. To correlate, there is any relationship in the nitric oxide production and the glucose uptake. Here, when we are adding the LM, the uh, LM and fluoridine, both, you know, the nitric oxide product, you know, um, the the stiffat in glucose uptake is was abbreviated. And the uh, same thing happened in the recombinant VWF. Now we try to again establish is there um, the role um, in the um, further reconfirm this thing. We use another approach. We use the you know transdermal uh, nitroglycerin patch. So once we apply the nitroglycerin patch, it produces the nitric oxide, and it will restore the, you know, the blood, you know, GTT and the ITT, as well as the home IR. So we another approach we use it and we try to prove whether this uh, inhibition is uh, uh, competitive or non-competitive. So here, if you look at this uh, experiment, we use the higher dose of insulin, keeping the VWF is constant. If you look at the higher dose of insulin, reverse the effect. 
which means that BWA binds with the insulin receptor and where the insulin it binds and it is a completely manner. So from the all the above experiment is showed that BWA binds the insulin receptor. So to prove the binding, we conducted a series of experiments. The binding study, first we did the farostin blood, then coenal recipient, and followed by surface plasma resonance spectroscopy. The farostin blood showed that the binding of VW with nitric oxide, and similarly, coenal precipitation also that you know the binding of VW with UNS. And also, the SPR study shows that the BWF binds to nitric oxide synthase and the KD is 1.79 18 to power 8. So it is really high, but it's a little bit less than the insulin is, you know, 10 to power minus 9. So the overall is the insulin binds to the um, insulin binds to its receptor, but the higher concentration of BWF is competitively bind with the nitric synthase. So we did the kinetic analysis. This is the Michaelis maintenance um, kinetics. It showed it is the inhibition, it's a competitive inhibition. The linear bar plot also showed because the KM is changing. So it is also the competitive inhibition. We also determined the IC50 and also the KI. KI is here, if you look at the KI is 250 picomole, exactly the dose we use for the initial studies. And these two data completely agree with our uh, previous data and this data. This suggests that VWA binds to the insulin receptor and inhibit the insulin in competitively. So this is the proposed model. So normal situation. So that is the uh, monomeric form. It never binds to insulin uh, in a nitric acid synthase. So there is a nitric acid production, glucose uptake. But in case of stress, there is a you know multimeric form of VWA which binds to the insulin um, in the nitric acid synthase and inhibit the nitric acid production and leading to glucose uptake. So the next question: What is the molecular regulation? How this VWA transcription regulate? To we hypothesize that might be there is a small molecule or steroid inflammatory marker like HMGB1 or eDNA, eRNA or S100B which could be transcriptionally regulated the VWA through the TLR2 mid-88 SP1 pathway. So we first look at the, the expression of the TLR2, TLR3, TLR4 and VWA. This is the artificial and this is the Western blood studies. So it is a, uh, in the both uh, cases is a, you know, time dependent increase of the uh, expression of the TLR2, TLR3, and TLR4 is not uh, there, but we did also. And so now the next question, so whether VWF regulate the, uh, um, that is TLR2, regulate the VWF uh, through the uh, VWF regulation is through the TLR2. So in this case, we use two different approach. One is the pharmacological, another is the genetic approach. In pharmacological approach, we use the LTA, is the TLR2 uh, activator, and the poly IC is the TLR3. So if you look at this data, so here TLR2 activated induced the VWF expression, but TLR3 uh, poly IC is failed to do it. And we use our um, uh, you know, monoclonal antibody, TLR2. So we pre inject the animal and expose in hypoxia. So here also, so this suggests that, so involvement of TLR2, not the TLR3. So same thing, we knock out the TLR2 with uh, SIRNA, and we the data showed the here, see the TLR2 knockout mice, not expressing any BWF in the hypoxia. So now the question is, BWA mainly expressed in platelet, endothelium, as well as bone marrow. So this confocal studies here in the bottom panel showed that the when you were you know 
when you are uh, exposing the animal and the VW in the endothelium is increased as well as in the megakaryocytes. This is the margin. And when you use an LTA, the same thing, but, and other way around, if you are using, when we are um, knocking out the TLR2, silence the TLR2, and we expose the animal, if you look here, it's completely abrogated. And the hypoxia induced VW expression as well as VW, you know, uh, here in the bone marrow and the lung uh, endothelium, lung endothelium both been decreased. So this suggests that TLR2 having involvement in the DWF release in the endothelium and megakaryocytes. So we further delineated the pathway. So what is there is the involvement of mid 88 This is a downstream to the TLR2. And the transcription factor, this is called the SP1. There is a several transcription factor three. So mainly bind the uh, promoter side of the DWF. So we try the first one, the SP1. So if you look at the uh, time dependent F induction of the mid 81, SP1 and SP1 phosphorylation. And if you are, when we pre-inject the animal, you know, the, TLR2 molecular antibody is completely decreased. So this suggests that this BWF you know, ex, uh, expression is mediated to mid TLR, uh, TLR2 mid SP on pathway. So we, uh, um, same thing we, we reproved by our another model, this is called TLR2 knockout knockout mice model. Now the next question, to reprove whether SP1 is directly involved or not. Here we use the MTH, this is the inhibitor SP1. So we treated animal and we can look at here, once it's uh, the animal put in hypoxia is completely abrogated. So all together, that is the another confocal studies we showed here, so, and the both the case of hypoxia induces VWF, SP1, and pretreatment of the TLR2 molecular antibody, as well as the silencing of the TLR2, completely abrogated. And to further prove whether this transcription, you know, SP1 is bind to the transcription uh, side or the promoter side of the VWF, we did the cheap assay. So the cheap assay also proved, see here, is completely abrogated animal, the positive, and here, hypoxia is a, and is a, here, it's not seen here, here is the, you know, that TLRT silencing significantly decrease the binding. There is a RT-PCR. So it suggests that, it suggests that this, BWF upregulation is mediated to TLR2, mid-88, SP1 pathway. Now, the next question, how the TLR2 will become activated? So I mentioned earlier, sterile inflammation is a inflammation which is not induced by, you know, bacterial virus. It is non-viral, non-bacterial, inflammation. So though there is a several molecules of sterile inflammatory marker and one of them is the HMG1 and luckily HMG1 is the TLR2 ligand. It's already been known. So we take this opportunity, we try to look at the time dependent effect of the hypoxia in the HMG1. If you look at here, HMG1 also time dependent increase and also here the VWF also in time dependent um, increase I already shown, but when we, here we use the two different uh, things. One is the you know recombinant HMGV1 and also the glargic acid. It is the inhibitor of the HMGV1. So when we are using the uh, GA in the hypoxia experiment, 
the VW expression significantly abbreviated. The same thing in the that is the uh, RTPCR and that is the you know ELISA. And on the same strategy we used, and we look at the SP1, mid 81, and SP1 fast production is completely limited. And this is the also the confocal. We look at the localization and all the expression in the, in the mega uh, endothelium, lung endothelium. See, see, the GA is completely significantly abbreviated. So all together it suggests that hy hypoxia or hypoxic stress induce the HMG1, which activate the TLR2, then the downstream signaling started. Now, these two here, we try to prove the whether this, uh, you know, glucose um, uh, homeostasis has uh, been regulated through the HPO, HMG1 pathway, TLR to SP1 pathway. We use two approach, one pharmacological approach and genetic approach. In pharmacological approach, we use CLTA, TLR2 agonist, then the MTH, is sp1 antagonist you know antagonist and recombinant hmgv1 and glyergic acid and if you look at here the significantly when we are using the ga is significantly limited and this is uh, you know in the all cases the significantly in it but if you look at the genetic genetic approach we knock out the TLR2 and we did the experiment here, GTT. The, in case of the TLR2, silencing is completely inhibited and whom I are also been inhibited. So this suggests that it is mediated through the TLR2, MEAT, 88 and SP1 pathway. So to finally, we want to conclude in a clinical relevance. So for this, to prove the clinical relevance, we used you know, the uh, normal as well as diabetic human sample. And we measure all this, uh, all this uh, parameter HMGV1, SP1, TLR2, and we did also the home IR and the VW. If you see, if you, you know, our data showed that in compared to diabetic and non-diabetic significantly increase in all the parameters. This has a strong clinical uh, significance in human. So the, finally, we propose that that is the whole model. So in the normal case, so there is no stress, no HMG1 release. So TLR is not activating. So there is a, pro a normal production of uh, monomeric form of the VWF, which is not binding in the nitric acid synthase, no nitric acid inhibition glucose uptake. But in case of stress or any kind of uh, hypoxia or hypoxic stress, see the HMG1 release that binds to the TLR2, the both is the endothelium, that is the megakaryocytes, and therefore this activate the pathway and the VWF. More, you know, ultra large VWF or multi-maric VWF, which actually having the uh, you know binding efficacy with the nitric acid synthase, and it's bind with nitric synthase where insulin combines it. Therefore, that nitric acid production is inhibited, and overall the glucose uptake is inhibited. So the take-home message is this study delineate the mechanism of inhibition of nitric oxide production in insulin resistance by the VWF during hypoxia. And it's explained the molecular mechanism of VWF upregulation in different stress conditions. So VWF could be potential target for developing therapeutics in the management of stress-induced insulin resistance. And we are working on it. And uh, hopefully we will develop a vaccine in the near future. And I would like to thank all the people, this, uh, all of my PhD students and my collaborator. 
So thank you very much. And I would like to, I am happy to take any question if you have. Can I make the Can I say something here? Hello, good morning, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Uh, good morning uh, to all the uh, esteemed uh, faculty members who are uh, and subject experts who are uh, present. Uh, in this uh, very interesting session, which has been uh, a very interesting talk and very insightful and detailed uh, insightful lecture, which has been uh, given by Dr. Gossel. His presentation was, I mean, it is so amazing to see such uh, beautiful research was being done and being presented in such a simple and nice manner. So I congratulate Dr. Gossel for your presentation. Uh, I have a simple question uh, to ask. Uh, sir, uh, we here in your study, what uh, uh, I could gather was that we are uh, relating the, uh, or we are associating insulin along with hypoxia, insulin and von Willebrand factor, and hypoxia induces overproduction of von Willebrand factor. Am I right, sir? Yes. Uh, so, and but we also know that von Willebrand factor is a physiological uh, chemical or a, a molecule present in the body. So, sir, what is, uh, how much is, how many times, uh, or what are the levels of the von Willebrand factor, which are induced by hypoxia beyond the physiological limits, which may lead to this kind of uh, imbalance uh, in the production of endosynthesis, or at around what levels, approximately, uh, of the physiological levels, how many times the physiological levels, uh, the endosynthesis gets affected by the W factor. Okay, well, that's a, um, the first of all, see, VW remain in the normal situation in a monomeric form. And only if the overproduction is there, then it will be a multimeric form. And multimeric form, only the active form. Only the? So then, multi. Mul <laughs> uh, you know, one. Molecule of VWF, they form a stuck, these kind of points like structure. So then they it will be active form. Then it will bind with nitric oxide synthesis. Otherwise, never binds it. And second question is the VWF remains uh, in the human, it is a, a carrier molecular factor eight. And we first time showed it is also the uh, inhibitor of insulin. Okay. Now the question is, if you look at my uh, binding study, the affinity of insulin is 10 to the power minus nine. And the affinity of VWF is 10 to the power minus eight. Even though in physiological situation, there is a VWF, it's never going to compete with the insulin because higher affinity. Only if it is a really, really high, then it will be multi -mark, it will compete with the receptor. Because you understand that binding is uh, 2.45 into 2 minus 9 molar for the insulin. And here, if you look at here, in my study, it is 10 to 1 minus 8 is a 1,000 times. So, so even though the VWF is present in the normal situation, it's never going to bind due to the higher affinity of insulin. Right. Only if it is a really higher concentration, then it will going to bind. And in multimeric form only. Okay. Thank you. Because Thank you, this binding we already proved by the. Uh, Dr. Him uh, Hello. Himani, uh, can we move on for the next speaker? Because we, uh, we are running out of time. Yes. Hello. Yeah, I just want to commend him for such a wonderful job, Dr. Khan. Yes. And then Thank we look much. forward for more exciting. This is Professor Zaid from Jamia. Mm -hmm. It's really wonderful to see you and your work. And I wish much more good research would come out of your lab. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I have some questions, but due to time constraint, we'll talk sometime later. Okay, okay once again, congratulations. Great to see you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll also avoid the next session. Okay. Hello. Thank you, sir. Dr. Samina. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible. Hello. Professor Khan. Yes. Huh. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. you are audible. Uh, Dr. Vaishnav from Nanajat Medical College. First of all, I must okay. congratulate you on such a wonderful talk. I'm total new concept regarding this uh, one belief brand uh, factor. So I have really enjoyed uh, your stimulating speech. Just a thought came to my mind regarding this association between this factor and the cardiovascular disease. I just want to know whether there's a direct uh, relationship between cardiovascular disease uh, and this von Willebrand's factor, or this is through the induction of diabetes mellitus and uh, insulin resistance. No, that is a, there is a lot of uh, paper already, a lot of uh, scientists already showed the VWF having the role in the, um, the cardiovascular disease. Because if you look at you know VWF also, uh, help the platelet, uh, um, uh, platelet, ro you know, rolling, mm -hmm. you know, the platelet roll in the endothelium, if it is uh, upregulated, it will activate the platelet and leading to thrombosis. There's a lot of study been already been published, but the new thing is here only what we uh, showed only the, uh, you know, VW has another role that is called the, as work as an insulin antagonist. Thank you. Thank you very much for enlightening us with the, so many aspects of uh, this factor. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the brilliant lecture. With the permission of chair, I would like to invite our next speaker for this session, Professor Samina Malik. I would like to introduce her. She is professor and head Department of Physiology, University College of Medicine, University of Lahore, Pakistan. She has 25 publications in various national and international publications. Professor Samina Malik is Pakistani representative of Education Committee, Federation of Asian and Oceanian Physiological Sciences, comprising of 40 countries from Asia Pacific region. I welcome you, ma'am, to deliver your plenary lecture. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and blessings from Pakistan to the global friends of physiology. This particular paper that I'm going to present today has been accepted by American Physiological Society for the Experimental Biology 2021 meeting, but it's my privilege to present it to my SAP friends here. So you know that breast cancer is one of the leading causes of cancer-related deaths, especially in Pakistani women. And the incidence has risen to one is to nine. That is every nine women, if they are sitting anywhere, one of them is likely to develop breast cancer. So it is grave. Uh, basically, this paper is a part of a huge study. That was uh, my PhD project. Uh, and it was based on some 27 known genes uh, for breast and ovarian cancer. And there were several 20, 25 oxidative stress markers involved. But the focus of this study is only on one of those results. And that was amazing result. That is uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 out of 29 patients, uh, they had a particular mutation common in them. That was a P10 mutation. And not only that it was common in them, but it was also novel to the Pakistani population, rather novel to the world. So uh, this study presents it as a predictive novel variant for the diagnostic importance of it in the females with breast cancer, and also rules out what are the epidemiological presentations and clinical presentations in presence of this particular variable. So I will cut short the methods because there are uh, senior microbiologists sitting here and they all know that how it could have been come forward uh, through ethical information, approval, informed consent, DNA extraction, next generation sequencing, and finally confirmation on the gold standard that is Sanger. So uh, this was the result that is a uh, homo homozygous frame shift substitution came forward in 69% of the patients at uh, position, amino acid position 65 
cysteine was replaced by serine. And this we are talking about P10, so chromosome 10 on exon two at this position. So there was this frame shift uh, substitution and this Sanger confirmation shows it over here. That is G is replaced by C. So it is basically a whole frame has been shifted. So it's a frame shift. And uh, what about the uh, uh, history or epidemiological parameters and other clinical parameters? So the, these patients with P10 variant, uh, most of them were premenopausal. And uh, you know that in the East, premenopausal incidence uh, is more, uh, pre prevalence of breast cancer is more in the premenopausal population rather than the postmenopausal, which is common in the West. The mean age of these patients was quite early, that is around age 35, with a range 27 to 46. And uh, their mean age at menarche was around 35 years. So they had early menarche. And uh, the cancer pathways uh, that were found to be involved with this variant were uh, related to cell signaling. So we also found that uh, in these patients, there was a lot of triple negativity involved, that is in HER2 and uh, PR and ER status. And this was also associated with adverse outcome as it is seen in literature. Then other findings were that most of them were married and they were all homemakers. They, 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 there was an inclination towards uh, overweight status and uh, most of them were un, uh, under grade 10, that is less educated. And uh, mostly they used tap water or filtered water. And uh, the family history was not very common, but the important finding was that most of them, they were the outcome of consanguineous marriages, that is intrafamilial marriages. And you know that this uh, uh, subcontinent has practiced consanguinity for last 300 years. Now, uh, breastfeeding, which is normally considered as a risk factor, that is lack of breastfeeding, it was not the case in this study. Rather, uh, and uh, even there was no difficulty in breastfeeding in most of the patients. Uh, smoking and alcoholism was not found to be a risk factor. Again, uh, the clinical findings, uh, most of the patients had this breast cancer in their, on their right side, that is unilateral right side, was associated with breast cancer and uh, mostly felt it first as a lump uh, on self-breast examination. And uh, uh, then uh, this carcinoma on histopathology, you know, we diagnosed breast cancer on histopathology. So most of these were invasive ductal in nature and around 55% of them presented at grade three, which is the severe grade. So um, almost uh, all the patients, they underwent chemotherapy and uh, the mastectomy was performed in only 30% and radiotherapy in only 10%, which can be connected to the fact that most of them present late at an adverse grade. And uh, uh, the worst thing was, that 65% of them died, unfortunately, within one year of their diagnosis. So it's a bad mutation. So what were the positive findings? This was an, uh, a very prominent result, that is 100% of the death within one year was reported with those patients who had no uh, 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 child or they were nulli paris. Whereas 33%, they had parity of those who died. Uh, second important finding was that uh, uh, most of the students, 90% of most of the patients, 90% of the patients, they were undereducated, that is below grade 10. And for that reason, they maybe de uh, delayed their reporting to the doctor. So uh, their tumor progressed quickly. And then uh, those who died within one year, they were mostly associated with obesity. And so obesity has an adverse outcome. It's a controllable factor. Then again, uh, clean water was associated with most of them um, uh, who had clean water. It was a protective effect for them uh, statistically. Whereas those who uh, did not uh, have uh, clean water access, 
uh, or preference, they had an adverse effect, adverse outcome. Uh, similarly, uh, early monarchy was associated with death within one year. And likewise, uh, those uh, subjects, uh, patients rather, in whom the parents were related, that is, they were the outcome of uh, consanguineous marriages, they had death, they faced death within first year of their diagnosis. And uh, in most of the patients, uh, triple negativity of breast cancer, that is all the three uh, hormone receptors were negative and it was associated with adverse grade or grade three. So we conclude that uh, this uh, novel variant can be used by researchers and clinicians uh, to predict similar uh, results in the carriers or you can say the unaffected sisters and unaffected daughters of these patients and in this population. And it can be used as a screening tool even uh, as early as age 13 because uh, these patients have early menarche. And at this stage, even the breast is not completely developed. So mammography will not be of much use, but at this time, a pre-diagnosis may be established. And uh, then, uh, Similar clinical manifestations can be expected uh, as they were expected in these patients in the carriers of uh, the same mutation, and they can be confirmed um, uh, on Sanger, which is a more cheap technique as compared to uh, the next generation sequencing. And uh, uh, further, uh, early diagnosis will uh, be able to improve uh, the outcome. Uh, but it is important to educate these patients to approach the doctor early. Weight reduction can be advised in counseling. Likewise, early menarche may be prevented by preventing steroid intake directly or indirectly, like it is commonly administered in the chicken. So we can avoid the broiler chicken and uh, the like, even in the medicine, if it is preventable. Then health education, as I said earlier, may have protective effect. Clean water should be administered and counseled. Uh, consanguinity should be avoided. So marrying outside the family will be important, especially in the subcontinent. The, it's a wrong practice of marrying within the family. This should be stopped and educated. And uh, further, once a person is married, uh, then it's important to complete the family. Early marriage would be favorable. So I, I acknowledge uh, this team uh, of my supervisors and co-supervisors and research partners uh, who are now uh, creating a huge uh, database at University of Lahore, um, uh, which is going to be a future database center for breast cancer uh, with the help of Professor Stephen Nerud, uh, who um, uh, designed the study. And uh, he is the breast cancer chair at Women Cancer Research Institute at University of Toronto. So I have certain negative results, but uh, if the time allows me, then I can go ahead. So do you suggest yes or no? Okay, so if we have time, so then no association was found between, okay, thanks. No, okay, no association was found between the family history positivity status and early death. No association was found between delay in reporting with early death. Likewise, no association between HER2 positivity and great severity. Likewise, no association between socioeconomic status and early death status. Similarly, no association between great adversity with early death and no association with smoking and early death no association with triple negativity and early death, no association between HER2 positivity and early death, and no association between breastfeeding and early death. Likewise, no association between inheritance from uh, parents and early death, and no association between family history and severity of the grade, no association between HER2 positivity with the adversity of the grade. So that is all. Any questions, please? 
Hello, can I ask a question? I'm Deepthi De Silva from Sri Lanka. Yes, um, Dr. Thank you. That is really interesting findings that you are reporting. Uh, can I ask, there are a couple of questions. The first thing is, um, were there any other tumors that were reported in these families? In particular, whether there was any thyroid or endometrial tumors or any other cancers? And whether the heterozygotes presented with cancer at all? So in other words, the um, maybe the parents had a, you said there was no family history. Um, so I presume that is the case, that the parents who are heterozygous did not have cancer. But in your general population in Pakistan, were there any heterozygous individuals who were affected with the cancer? Yeah. Uh, just uh, Can I just make one little comment? Um, I, I, I'm a clinical geneticist, and I think the internationally, we would probably not recommend uh, testing a girl of 13 for the presence of a mutation that would confer an increased risk of cancer when she's an adult. So what I, I don't know, my, my own feeling is that we should wait till they are 18 and adults to do that test. At 13, they are probably too young and it's of little relevance for them. So I just wondered what your feeling is because as, as you probably know, the recommendations are at the moment with clinical geneticists anyway, is that we should not be testing children for adult onset diseases. Right. So there are uh, so many <laughs> questions in this question, and they are all well placed. Um, uh, firstly, uh, most all the other mutations that we identified were actually heterozygous. This was the only P10 that was homozygous. Uh, secondly, um, yes, uh, we have a huge data of 530 patients and 530 controls. And in them, uh, we have also uh, checked uh, the thyroid profile because you know that uh, it's just like uh, that uh, who was born first, the egg or the hen. So this story is still um, a cause of concern for the um, uh, clinicians um, uh, and uh, those involved into genetics. That is uh, uh, this uh, thyroid uh, uh, profile uh, does it, uh, abnormal thyroid profile, does it lead to breast cancer or does bre breast cancer lead to abnormal thyroid profile? So in addition to these parameters, we have certain hidden parameters like hidden curriculum. And uh, on that, we are also working and those results are under anal analysis. So once they are analyzed, we will publish a paper on that too. Uh, these, uh, in all these patients, ovarian cancer was also looked for but none of them has ovarian cancer. And why we looked into ovarian cancer? Because you know well, uh, and I would like to uh, uh, move uh, in future with you uh, into discussion uh, regarding this study because you are the relevant person. Uh, and uh, that is because you know these particular genes, those 27 genes that we worked on, uh, they are all um, in involved in breast cancer as well as ovarian cancer. But in none of these patients, there was a history or family history of ovarian cancer. So only there was breast cancer. And uh, none of them had thyroid symptoms. But we are still uh, having their serum in store. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, results of uh, most of them are uh, uh, under analysis. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, we will be further analyzing the results of uh, 30 more patients uh, regarding the thyroid analysis just for a separate paper and a separate interest. So I appreciate your questions. Can you ask a question, please? Please, sir. Uh, Dr. Samina Malik, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, my question would be that is novel P10 marker or variant prevalent to Pakistani population only or the other countries, especially South Asian countries must try in their patients of breast cancer too? Uh, sir, actually it is novel to the world. It is not already known in the world. Right. So other countries may also try to yeah, get a composite data. Yes, sir. And likewise, uh, there are some 29 or 30 novel results in my entire uh, study, which I am publishing gradually. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, madam. Uh, very nice talk uh, and very very good research output, Samina. Congratulations on it. 
Thank you, uh, Professor Savi. Uh, a quick comment. Is there any preventive measure of routine breast examination and mammography promoted in Pakistan subsequent to our findings? Because I mean, breast cancer can be easily diagnosed now. And if that should be a mandatory requirement for the women of the country, then I mean, this disaster can be prevented. And I think prevention is always better. Um, okay. Very, I think that should be yeah. a recommendation from this conference. Yeah, very well said, Professor Savi. And for that, uh, in the center that we are establishing, we are also establishing a counseling cell. And in that counseling cell, I'm the person sitting and uh, advising to the patients and their relatives to come forward and get these mutations screened in them. And uh, um, uh, the stage of screening as is wide, advised by Dr. Uh, Deepati, I would like to buy her advice. Uh, that is, we can maybe postpone it till age 18 according to the international criteria. Uh, although there are uh, uh, patients coming with their uh, nine, old, nine year old, eight year old daughters and they are requesting for their blood testing because the uh, blood can be tested because we are basically formulating a mechanism. Uh, that is which uh, um, 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 hormonal uh, parameters and other oxidative stress markers may predispose to a mutation in which set of genes under uh, which pathway uh, that may lead to breast cancer. So basically the um, entire purpose of this study is to develop a pathophysiological pathway. So if they fall in that pathway, then the risk will be increased. And it, for any... Uh, uh, reason um, whether it, it is an outcome of the study or not, if the incidence is one is to nine, then as Professor Savi has advised, this counseling uh, uh, is a very, very important concern. And 24-7, uh, I am receiving the calls from my patients and their attendants. And uh, I, I feel very happy to respond to their questions and even giving them dietary advice and other from the research papers. Because, you know, this a uh, particular study is very close to my heart because my mother died of breast cancer. So this is my tribute to my mother. Thank you. Uh, May I uh, make some you. comments, Samina, with this chair? Yeah. Professor, Dr. Ulamin, Professor Dr. Ulamin will speak on the occasion. Yes, Professor Ulamin. Professor yes, Ulamin, very standing. wonderful presentation of Samina Malik, no doubt. Uh, may I ask a simple question? 100% death within a year. What do you mean by that? Uh, that was 100% about... 100% death within yeah, a year. Yeah, that was about nulli parity status. That is all the patients with this mutation who had no child born by them, they died within one year. So you know that this relates to the hormonal status. And you know that breast tissue has uh, estrogen receptor in it. So it, it is all the chain of that events and universally as well, nulli parity status is associated with breast cancer. So nulli parity should be, or if it is, it can be avoided, it can be avoided. I think... Um, okay, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Uh, thank you all. And Dr. Samina, uh, uh, again, happiest congratulations on a very relevant and pertinent talk and insight into the arena of uh, carcinoma of breast. And if uh, all the other chairpersons, uh, they permit, can we move on to the next session now? Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful and informative uh, talk. So this brings the end to this session, session F. And I would like to thank all the chairpersons, Professor VP Vashne, sir, Professor Sunita Mondal, ma'am, Professor Sandeep, sir, and Professor Himani Aluwalia, ma'am, for chairing this session. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Bhavna to proceed with session G. Thank you. Before I sign out, uh, a hearty thanks to all the organizers uh, of this conference for giving us an opportunity to uh, come across so much of uh, resource material. And we have really been, uh, up, our knowledge has been uh, updated. Uh, thank you so much. 
and wonderful effort and wonderful uh, uh, even i mean it, this this conference is really uh, it, it's a beautiful experience for all of us thank you so much thank you ma'am moving forwards towards our next session i'm honored to introduce our distinguished chairpersons uh, uh, our chairperson for uh, this session is a dynamic faculty member currently working as the dean of school of medicine and uh, Medi uh, medical sciences and research uh, noida please welcome professor manisha jindal with more than 20 years of teaching actively uh, teaching activity involved both uh, faculty development programs research and administration welcome ma'am we also have uh, with us professor zaid hasan from bangladesh university of health sciences he is an avid researcher with special interest in molecular biology and endocrine physiology welcome sir and last but not the least we have our very own dr musharraf hussain professor at department of surgery hamdard institute of medical sciences and research he is also the coordinator for the medical education unit and has over 15 years of surgical experience with special interest in medical education we welcome you sir Oh, uh, we uh, now uh, Professor Paul is uh, ready with his presentation, so we'll uh, have him first. Uh, Professor Paul uh, will—he's uh, as well known. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce him. He's the professor of physiology at Jipma Pondicherry and has a rich experience of 25 years with specialty in physiology, neurophysiology, hypertension, and obesity research, as well as yoga. He has been awarded the Best Teacher Award for the year 2017, and for outstand for his outstanding contribution towards academics, research, and medical education by APPI. You are welcome, sir. Please take over. Thank you. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Your yeah, slide. Yeah. Oh, is thank you. Okay, uh, the the title of my presentation is, you know, this uh, dysfunction of microbiome in clinical disorders, the role of sympathetic imbalance. This topic is a very much, you know, uh, physiological, microbiological, pathological interest. This topic has resulted in the total change in pathophysiology of the disease processes. The concept came little recently, but now this is widely known to everybody in the field of medicine. I am speaking on the role of sympathetic imbalance because of my interest in this topic, the sympathetic imbalance. I have worked so much. I have a lot of our publications are linked to this autonomic functions, dysfunctions, vagal function, dysfunctions, and sympathetic functions and dysfunctions. Then I came to know that the sympathetic imbalance is also linked to this, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, dysfunctions of the uh, gut microbiota. So in my presentation, I will sp I will be speaking on the uh, the gut brain axis and just give a very brief introduction. Then I'll say actually the human being as a super organism. Gut microbiota. I'll speak again. Give a very you know, less uh, uh, note of it. Then I'll go to the gut microbiota, the neural mechanism. Switch up on. And then the vagus nerve, how the vagus nerve is linked to this uh, gut brain axis, and then how this vagal function and dysfunction can be, you know, the, be the target of this management of gut brain axis disorder. Uh, it, you can see this uh, cartoon where actually you can see, you know, uh, there is one person on the left side who is saying hello, on the right side, he is saying, How are you? And the left side is the brain, right side is the intestine, and in between them there are some you know, minute little uh, uh, men who are actually saying hi. So they, they they actually they are trying to connect between the two big persons. So this is the concept of gut brain axis, where the gut brain axis is the bidirectional communication between the central and the enteric nervous system. The central nervous system on one side, the enteric nervous system on the other side, and gut microbiota is the link between them. And therefore, this link is more precisely called as gut brain microbiota axis or microbiota gut brain axis, which is more commonly known. 
So this is just a picture of you know, to give an impression of how the microorganisms in the intestine they are you know, residing there and they participate in different functions of the intestine. This is a schematic picture of a bidirectional concept of the gut and the brain. One side the microbiome connecting to brain, other side the microbiome connecting intestine to the brain, then brain to the gut. In clinical practice, this interaction actually comes from the association of the you know, dysbiosis of the CNS, the central nervous system. Okay, I just want to tell you that dysbiosis actually the disorder of the biosis. I think you understand what is biosis. Biosis means actually, you know, this gut. Dysbiosis means actually the disorder of the biosis. So this disease has been extensively studied in some of the disorders, and these are called uh, you now dysbiosis disorder. And, uh, especially, it has been seen the dysbiosis is uh, extensively associated with autism, anxiety, and depressive behavioral disorder. So the functional disorder that is called irritable bowel syndrome, which is also very much closely associated with dysbiosis and the neural dysfunctions. And from the dysbiosis of the irritable bowel syndrome, all these information have been collected about the pathophysiology of dysbiosis linking to the clinical disorders. Uh, the dysbiosis can result in not only irritable bowel syndrome, but you can see here, actually there are many diseases starting from the left side, the obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, Parkinson disease, the central nervous system disease, Alzheimer's disease, and all these anxiety disorders, then the endocrinal diseases, hypothyroidism, uh, then also you know, the orthopedic musculoskeletal problems, the rheumatoid arthritis, cachexia, and inflammatory bowel disease, of course, you know, that is what I was speaking of. This human being is a super organism. This is a very beautiful concept. We say that, no, I say that I, I am so and so, but I don't realize that I am not only a single individual. In me, there are many individuals residing, and these individuals are micro-individuals. Human being, they, they are actually the microorganisms. Human beings contain more than one kg of these organisms. If you weigh them, it comes to more than one kilogram. And they are actually the gut microbiota. The gut microbiome project of 2012 you know, uh, estimated this uh, about 300 to 3,000 different species of the microbiome residing in intestine, which is that is actually you know, 10 billions, more than the 10 times of the human cells. And therefore, nature has advocate, advocated calling human being we rather than I, that is what I was telling, because more than 90% of the total cells and genes of the human being are microorganisms. This gut microbiota is involved in the growth and development of the human being um, you know, in all aspects, starting from the embryonic development to uh, development that happens in the adult life. And the gut microbiota is involved in many, you know, the functions of the uh, body. Uh, to be listed, metabolism and digestive absorption of the nutrients, digestion of resistant carbohydrates, decomposition of endogenous, exogenous proteins, degradation of bile, acid, vitamin synthesis, then colonization of these all you know, uh, microbiota, they are indispensable for the maturation of the immunity system, maturation of the neuroendocrine system, and maturation and functions of the brain and the gut. The, when there is a disturbance, perturbance in this system, what happens and how that happens? All these have happened because of our problem, the problem of the human civilization. Very interesting that now the, the first problem actually happens because of we have changed our diet system. The diet itself, the diet itself is you know, altered so much in the civilized human being from the human being of a you know, few uh, weeks before, you know, maybe 100 years before. Change in diet pattern. We have mobilized from the high fiber diet to you no know, more processed food. That has disrupted the gut microbiota in the intestine. Then we have changed actually from 
no the hygiene. Now we have too much of details of our health and hygiene. Earlier it was not there. This corona pandemic, infection, all these things. You no, know, there is too much of change. And then we are too much of conscious of the hygienic values of life. Everywhere in the office, at home, as you enter, first you sanitize your hand, then you enter. With this actually, you no, know, we are actually the skin on the skin surface, there are a lot of organisms. So disinfection, sterilization, uh, then you know, too much of sanitization. All these are, I'm not speaking of this corona. I don't say that, you no, know, I'm not discouraging the sanitization or the you know, the guidelines that we have now adopted for the corona. But I'm telling as such, the all these, you know, the too much of hygienic you know, consciousness of the human being, personal hygiene, hygiene at the you know, office, all these have led to decreased in microbiota, which was on our body surface. Then from that, they enter into the intestine and from intestine, they go to the brain. You know, and through their chemicals, they connect. So because of that change in diet, change in lifestyle, and one more, Recently, now, I mean, not recently, for last many decades, we are so much adopted to medical treatment. And especially, I'll tell you the antibiotics. Antibiotics. Antibiotics also kill the microorganisms in the intestine. So change in lifestyle, change in diet, change in health, especially the healthcare use of medicines. The microbial flora of the gut, the gut brain. The gut brain actually is a you know uh, concept which was prevailing before, but now this concept is more, you know, uh, is made more uh, academic because it has been seen actually that the enteric nervous system, as we teach the undergraduate students, you know, uh, is completely an independent system because in the enteric nervous system, there are two things. Number one, this is the enteric nervous system. Uh, just I'll go back. Yeah, this enteric nervous system, which is actually thing, but the neuroepithelium of the gut, neuroepithelium of the gut, that is the enteric nervous system. And that is what actually neuroepithelium of the gut is called gut brain. This is the neuroepithelium where actually we have the mucosal, submucosal layer, the myenteric and the mesonerve plexus. And then connected to that, all the, you know, the epithelial cells, that is the neuroepithelium of the gut, which is connected to the brain. This neuroepithelial system which is called gut brain because this is actually gut brain. It is not the brain in the, you know, the brain has a gut. It is the brain of the gut, the gut brain, because this works independently, number one, and it works without any instruction from the brain. And it works also in a persistent vegetative state. And number two, the gut brain not only plays its local functions, but also it regulates many functions of the human being including human behavior and cognition. Therefore, it is now said that there is a brain in the gut that is what is called the gut brain. So this functions of this gut brain, it is involved in many sensory perception, especially perception of pain. It is, an, it is involved in cognition, cognitive functions, especially you now it is involved in learning, memory, which is closely, closely related to the gut microbiota. <coughs> It is linked to mood and emotion, and therefore, this biasis results in stress. You know, this biasis results in all anxiety disorders. So this is a picture of how this, you know, the gut neuroepithelium is connected to learning, connected to all these cognitive function. Through what you can note here on the left side, on the green, which is presented in a thick, uh, you know, arrow, the vagus nerve, the vagus nerve. This is the one, the vagus nerve, which I'm speaking of, the vagus nerve, because this is the topic of my interest, how the gut is connected to brain by means of the vagus nerve, by means of the vagus nerve. And then it is, a, it is actually, it controls the temperament of the individual, the mood of the individual, it controls stress management, the individual's capacity to cope with stress. It has been seen if you have a healthy microbiota in your intestine, you are well equipped to face stress, to adapt to stress and even to you know, solve the problems of the stress, the stress management. That is what is called, it is said now that microbiota helps in the individual to cope with stress. Then gut microbiota affect the direct behavior. Depending on the microbiome in the intestine, a person is vegetarian, non-vegetarian, preference for vegetables, preference for different kinds of non-veg. It has also been seen that gut microbiome is, you know, is involved in 
the social interaction and reproductive behavior of the individual. And because of this, because the gut microbiome is involved in so much of human function, gut is involved in so much of human diseases, which I have already shown earlier. This is the list, uh, some of the list which has been already proved in IDDM, in uh, chronic kidney disease, depression, autism, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, psoriasis, acne, celiac disease, all these. All these are the you know, different diseases of dysbiosis. This gut microbiome, the question is now how it is connected to brain and what is the major linking mechanism. There are three major linking mechanisms, the neural pathway, the neuroendocrine pathway, and the immune pathway. The pathway, which is mainly through the vagus nerve, primary afferents from the GI tract, from the GI epithelium, connect to the spinal cord, then from spinal cord to the brain, and without spinal cord also, directly via the vagus nerve, which are, you know, the, the, the afferent fibers from the vagus nerve, also they connect to the, to the brain. So the primary afferents and primary afferents, and then, you know, uh, going to the, you know, the, the uh, different parts of the brain and they, record, they, they actually provide signals from the neuroepithelium to the brain. Then the second one, which is, which is actually observed, you know, in, in the animal studies, then it has been proved you know, in the human studies that angiogenic depressive effects of the signals from the and opposite that is angiolytic and antidepressant effects of the you know, individual depends on the intact vagus nerve. This has been all, you know, all has been proved in the animal experiments, and it, it has it has also been seen that in vagotomized animals, that means when the vagus nerve is cut, all these depressive, antidepressive, angiogenic, angiolytic effects of the medicines and of the organisms and the you know, different kinds of in dysbiosis, how the things happen. They are not observed if there is no vagus nerve. So in vagotomy, all these, you know, the symptoms related to uh, neurocognition, anxiety, all are abolished. So if this actually speaks the importance of vagus nerve in you know, the, the regulation of brain uh, functions, especially the psychology, the cognition, mental functions. So this is a schematic diagram to say actually how the vagus nerve and gut microbiome they're involved. Here actually on the right side of this, on the right side, you can see here this is the box which speaks of probiotic administration in animal studies showed that anti-anxiety effects of, you know, whatever the anti-anxiety effects are, you know, the available of the probiotics are mainly mediated by the vagus nerve. So that is, this is the, uh, you know, the message from this uh, uh, schematic diagram. Then the endocrine communication is mainly by the hypothalamus pituitary axis, how the brain is getting connected to the intestine. So this, I'll not, I'll just show you the picture, which will speak you know, itself. Now you can see here the brain through hypothalamus pituitary axis, it connects to adrenal medulla from where the cortisol is secreted and then the cortisol acts on the intestinal functions. So this is mainly through hypothalamus pituitary axis, but in, uh, no, I mean, uh, in addition to that, also you can see on the left side, the, the there is one more error, the one more error on the left side, which actually speaks up the direct vagal communication, the vagal efferent from the brain to the intestine. So through hypothalamus, which it is, is neuroendocrine, then through vagal efferent, that is neural, the brain connects to the this gut brain, that is the neuroendothelial and neuroepithelial structure of the intestine. This is actually, you know, different organisms in the gut. The, on the left side are the organisms, the lactobacilli, uh, different kinds of lactobacilli, different kinds of organisms. They actually, what they do, now, the first one, it secretes oxytocin. The second one, that secretes GABA. Then the BDNF. All of them, through vagus nerve, they control different functions of the human being. The, the, they regulate neuronal plasticity, behavior. Then they, 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 they are involved in stress responsiveness, anxiety responsiveness, and all these functions. Anxiety disorders, depressive behavior, all these functions of the gut organism connected to the brain via vagus nerve. 
So this actually, this picture speaks of how this gut brain axis, which I have already described, the neuroendocrine axis is you now very essential, especially for stress management, for stress management. To say that if you have the, on the left side, if you have the healthy gut, healthy gut function, then you have the healthy CNS function. On the right side, if you have the abnormal gut, then you have the abnormal CS, you know, CNS function which results in stress, depression, all these disorders. So the, the past theory was that if there is chronic stress, the, so the, there, is, there may be susceptibility to gene, and then the treatment is by psychotherapy and medicine. The present concept is that when you have chronic stress, you are taking some sort of antibiotic, you have poor diet, you have unhealthy lifestyle. This is resulting in all your problems of the gut microbiota, gut brain axis dysfunction. The modality of treatment, therefore, should be the healthy diet, psychobiotics, prebiotics, and FMT. FMT is actually fecal microbial transplantation. So I'm just now coming to my last part of the presentation. There are uh, another two slides. The, this is the picture which speaks of how this you now the antibiotics the food diet, they are totally causing the dysfunction of the gut brain uh, axis, resulting in the dysfunction of the brain, decreasing the neuroplasticity, causing neuroinflammation, decreasing neurogenesis. And in this, you can see at the center is the vagus nerve. At the center is the vagus nerve, which is mediating you know, both the gut to the brain and brain to the gut. And vagus nerve is the, at the center of the problem, at the center of function and also Therefore, the center of dysfunction. That means vagus nerve is also involved in you know, manifesting the dysfunctions you know, uh, of the uh, this dysbiosis. Yeah, the vagus nerve. To, to, to conclude this, actually, the vagus nerve, which is at the center of the immune system, the endocrine system, and the nervous system, which is connecting the gut-brain axis, gut to the brain and brain to the gut, and vagus nerve is at the core of it. Therefore, the bidirectional communication of the gut with brain, the vagus nerve constitutes both the afferent and the efferent. And vagus nerve links the gut to the brain and brain to the gut. Sympathovagal homeostasis, which will be the key to the improvement of the functions of the gut brain axis, in future will be the real target of the treatment of gut dysbiosis. And therefore, the treatment of all these clinical disorders you know, which happened you know, the the i listed you know, the uh, the diseases the clinical disorders that happen in dysbiosis therefore we hypothesize that improvement of the functions in this microbiota brain brain gut axis by strengthening vagal tone will be the key to the success in the gut brain physiology research and we also you know, strongly advocate the role of yoga that promotes vagal tone will be the promising in this field of research because especially pranayama, the breathing exercises, they are vagal tonic vagal function. They will have a better link of the gut to brain and brain to gut, and they will prevent dysbiosis and they will prevent you know, the diseases and they will uh, uh, of great use in the clinical medicine. All these, you know, what I presented, I just, you know, uh, I have published a, a recent article the integration of microbiota gut brain axis, the significance of autonomic neural influence. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer a few questions. Can he, Dr. Paul, can he ask a question? To, to ah, yes, chair? sir, please. Yes, uh, Professor Aslam. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, it's, it's, was a, it's a wonderful talk on the gut brain axis. Uh, and this has led to uh, th the, the introduction of a new specialty that is neurogastroenterology. Now, it's a subspecialty of gastroenterology. My question would be, uh, after having this overview of the gut-brain axis, will anticholinergic drugs will mitigate the symptoms of uh, the gut migraine or celiac disease or Crohn disease symptoms by inhibiting the gut-brain axis? Because bilateral vicotomy abolishes uh, uh, the symptoms, 
but whether anticholinergic drugs will also have influence in mitigating the symptoms of gut migraine and Crohn's disease or celiac disease? Uh, uh, yes, Professor Aslam. Actually, the, this also has been recently you know, uh, published. I have seen one article. Mm. They have worked on this atropine. They speak atropine being the anticholinergic. Will mm. also, this will be like you know, a functional vagotomy. That mm. means you have disconnected, yes. And they said that atropine will have a severe you know, impact. And if a person is receiving atropine or atropine is being prescribed for some treatment, then it is like a you know a case of functional vagotomy and the gut brain uh, connectivity will be you know impaired and would likely to develop the uh, you know problems uh, I, I really appreciate your you know clinical implication uh, you know, of this concept uh, thank you professor aslam no oh, thank you very much thank you so i have a question uh, can yeah, i have... ah, yes sure sure yes sure Dr. Pal, it is always a pleasure to listen to you. It is a wonderful presentation that you have just given us and on a very interesting topic also. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, sir, uh, that uh, uh, has the role of probiotics been studied in uh, depressive patients in psychiatry? And if yes, what kind of depression can be cured? Because it is a very valuable suggestion if it, it, if, if it can be implemented. Depression is ever, an ever-increasing uh, uh, increasing problem in today's world. So has it been studied, the role of probiotics in depressive patients? Yes, 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 yes. I can, you can just send me your email ID, no, email ID to me. I'll send, I'll send one recently published article of use of probiotic in uh, not only depression, anxiety disorders also. And they speak of this gut brain axis, microbiota axis. Uh, it has been published and people are working extensively on this field. They, they see actually the probiotic is the uh, no um, uh, target for anxiety disorders. It has been extensively. I mean, uh, I mean, people are studying extensively, and uh, people have also published. Few papers have been published. I have one article with me. Uh, I can send to you. Uh, no, if you give me your email ID, you know my email ID, Dr. Jikepal at gmail dot com. Yes, it's sir. Send definitely. I'll send okay. the PDF copy of that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the interesting talk. With the permission of the chair, uh, may we proceed to the next speaker? Yes, yes, please. Oh. Hello, I am audible. I, our next speaker is Professor Akhtarun Nissa, Professor and Vice Principal, Main Main Medical College, Bangladesh, with special interests in reproductive and endocrine physiology. Over to you. Thank you. Professor Akhtarun Nisam, can you hear us? Are you with us? I can see you. You've joined. Okay, she's here. Hello? Yeah, hello. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you, you're audible, ma'am. Uh, Professor Dr. Akhtarun Nessa. Dear Speaker, would you please... Uh, Department of Physiology. Would you please uh, take up the uh, mask, please? Mamishing Medical College, Mamishing. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next ticket, it a thank you. I get the one. At first, I like to thank organizing committee and department of physiology, Hamdad Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Jamia Hamdad, New Delhi, for arranging such a interesting virtual biennial SEP 7 and PSI conference 
2021 in this type of pandemic COVID situation. Title of my presentation is Evaluation of the Changes of BMI and Serum CDFT Protein in Postmenopausal Women. The period during which the menstrual cycle ceases and the female sex hormones diminish to almost none is called menopause. Menopause is considered when a woman has not had her period for an entire year. The main age of menopause is reported to vary from 45 to 52.8 years. Menopause is characterized by ovarian atrophy with a lack of estrogen, progesterone, and ovarian androgens. The loss of estrogen leads to vascular disorders, sleep disorders, mood disorders, depression, atrophy of urinary tract and vagina, and increased in the risk of osteoporosis, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, and loss of cognitive function. Menopause is a physiological process. However, the consequences of ovarian failure can diminish a woman's quality of life. Menopause occupying one third of women life and women face various physiological, psychological, and biochemical changes during this period. Menopausal transition being associated with significant weight gain of two to 2.5 kg over three years on average. Menopause associated with estrogen depletion has deleterious influence on inflammatory markers and adipokines leading to increased visceral adiposity. Estrogen influences the central control of appetite and deletion of hypothalamic estrogen receptor has shown to cause hyperphasia, visceral obesity. CDAT protein is an acute phase protein used as a clinical marker of inflammation. Stork S. et al. stated that there is significantly increases CDAT protein level in postmenopausal women when compared to reproductive aged women. Estrogen inhibits the auto induction of CRP, reduces CRP induced pro inflammatory cytokine response and CRP-induced adhesion molecule upregulation. As a consequence, the removal of the regulatory effect of estrogen upon CRP leads to an increase of CRP level in postmenopausal women. Therefore, this study has been designed to evaluate the withdrawal effect of female sex hormones on BMI and serum C-reactive protein. Aims and objective, to study the status of BMI and serum CRP in postmenopausal women and healthy reproductive-based women to compare it between them. Hypothesis in postmenopausal women, BMI and serum C reactive protein may alter. The present cross-sectional stu analytical study was carried out in Department of Physiology, Miamishing Medical College, Miamishing, Bangladesh, from July 2018 to June 2019. And protocol of this study was approved by Institutional Ethical Review Committee of Miamishing Medical College, Miamishing, Bangladesh. Total number of 200 subjects were participated in this study. Subjects were selected from my Mission Medical College Hospital and my Mission Locality, Bangladesh. Sampling technique was purposive. Subjects were grouped as group one, consists of 100 reproductive based women, age range 20 to 45 years as control group. Group two, consists of 100 postmenopausal women, age ranges above 45 years to 65 years. Subjects were selected on the basis of inclusion and exclusion criteria. After taking informed written consent with proper counseling, height was measured in meter using measuring tap without shoes, body weight was measured in kg using a portable weighing machine with minimal clothing and no shoes. Therefore, body mass index calculated as 
weight in kilogram divided by the height in meter square. Under proper strict aseptic precaution, about 5 ml of venous blood was collected from anticubital vein by disposable syringe with a gentle pull from each individual for biochemical test of serum C reactive protein by CRP latex test, slide agglutination procedure in the Department of Microbiology, Mymishin Medical College, Mymishin, Bangladesh. Data were expressed as mean plus minus standard deviation and statistical significance of difference among the group was calculated by unpaired students' t-test. Statistical analysis was done by using the statistical package for social science. P-value is 0.05 was considered as significant. Results of the body mass index. Table one and figure one show the result of BMI. The mean value of Group one plus minus standard deviation of BMI is 22.98 plus minus 2.57. And in group two, mean plus minus standard deviation in group two of BMI in group two is 28.74 plus minus 2.69. Mean difference minus 5.77, p value 0 0.003. G value minus 15.49. Result is statistically significant. But diagram showing the mean value of body mass index in both group one and two. Results of serum C reactive protein level. Table two and figure two show the result, statistical result of serum C reactive protein. In this table, mean value of serum C reactive protein plus minus standard deviation, 4.96, plus minus 0 0.06 in group one, and 9.84 plus minus 5.75 in case of group two. Mean difference minus 4.882, p-value 0 0.001, t-value minus 8.468, level of significance is highly significant. Mark diagram showing the mean value of serum C reactive protein in both group one and group two. At the end, we found that BMI and serum C reactive protein are significantly increased in postmenopausal women, that is group two, in comparison to reproductive age domain, that is group one. Discussion of this study. This present work was carried out to evaluate the changes of body mass index and serum C reactive protein level and its effect on postmenopausal women. In this study, BMI is significantly increased in postmenopausal women compared with reproductive aged women. A study of 298 menopausal women done by Kolapani V. et al. 2014 showed that 68.4% of them were overweight with an average BMI of 28.3 kg per meter square. This is also consistent with the present study. This result is consistent with a cross-sectional study done by Goncaps JTT et al. 2016. They found the frequency of overweight and obesity among the postmenopausal women were 66% with an average BMI of 28.1 kg per meter square. It may be due to diminished activity of estrogen receptor alpha is shown to be linked to obesity in women and lacking estrogen receptor alpha develops central obesity and insulin resistance. Estradiol appears to selectively promote anti-lipolytic activity in subcutaneous adipocytes and increases muscle fat oxidation. Estradiol increases lipoprotein lipase, which utilizes triglycerides in muscle and is crucial in lipid metabolism and transport. Lipoprotein lipase activity declines at menopause, contributing to visceral adiposity and alteration of plasma lipid concentration. Furthermore, low estrogen at menopause 
via increased cortisol promotes accumulation of abdominal fat. Tarki Shomen were studied by Tan Emen et al. 2014. In their study, 305 women between age 45 to 60 were recruited. They found, though very contrary result by reporting BMI was not associated with menopausal status. This study is not consistent with the present study. In this study, serum C-reactive protein level is significantly higher in the postmenopausal women compared to reproductive aged women. The result of the present study is agreed with published result of Sobona S. Mary PJ 2013, which found a significant differences in the levels of studied CRP regarding postmenopausal women with approximately threefold increases of CRP in the serum of postmenopausal healthy women when compared to healthy women. Prospective studies have demonstrated that the rise in CRP after menopause is the product of several concurring events. First, aging by itself was a strong determinant of increases in CRP. Secondly, sex hormones such as estrogen was also strongly positively associated with CRP levels. During menopause, there is reduction of ovarian function and changes in the concentration of female sex hormones influence levels of inflammatory mediators such as CRP. Estrogen has vasoprotective effect and can modulate inflammatory responses. This effect lost after menopause when the concentration of 17 estradiol is reduced drastically and increased CRP level. Estrogen is a regulator of inflammation. A tenfold increase in estradiol was associated with a 24.3% decrease in CRP levels. Estrogen is released in the blood and exerts a number of known anti-inflammatory effects, such as generating nitric oxide, regulating leukocyte recruitment, scavenging free radicals, and promoting cell survival. The relationship between the CRP concentration and adiposity is based on numerous studies in adults that have shown obese and overweight individuals acquire a pro-inflammatory status. Thus, a state of chronic inflammation, high CRP concentration, along with low adiponectin concentration and the greater prevalence of metabolic risk factors could favor the development of atherosclerosis in overweight and obese menopausal women. Para limitations of the study, parameters were measured only once and thus change over time could not be evaluated. The cross-sectional design of the study represents a limitation, implicating that cause and effect relationship cannot be discerned. Longitudinal studies are needed to better characterize this relationship. We measured only a single inflammatory marker, the association with other downstream cytokines, such as human necrosis factor alpha and interleukin C and hormonal assay, such as estrogen, progesterone, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, remains a subject for future studies. Conclusions. At the conclusion, in conclusion, results of a study provide information that cardiovascular risk factor like BMI and CRP are elevated in postmenopausal women compared to reproductive aged women. So these women are at an increased risk of developing cardiovascular diseases. Therefore, it is important to consider each and every postmenopausal women to undergo screening for this parameter. With the increase in life expectancy, resulting in women living one half to one third of their lives after menopause, the high incidence of overweight and obesity in women have become important public health concerns. Specific health education strategies and arise awareness among postmenopausal women are needed in order to prevent the emerging cardiovascular, metabolic, and renal diseases. Thanks to all for patience hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Akhtar Nessa. It was a very neatly depicted presentation. Thank you so much. Mm, I would thanks. just like to ask you, ma'am, one thing. Uh, what was the exclusion criteria for the postmenopausal women? Yes, ma'am. 
uh, what was the exclusion criteria for the postmenopausal group? Yeah. Well, in case of postmenopausal women, exclusion criteria is postmenopausal area. Mm -hmm. Postmenopausal women. Exclusion criteria is age less than 20 years and more than 65 years in case of reproductive age women. In case of postmenopausal women, age range above 45 years to 65 years, ma'am. And were the diabetics ruled out is what I want to know because yes. C-reactive proteins... Of diabetes, yes, ma'am. Patients of diabetes mellitus, chronic renal failure, parathyroid disease, metabolic bone disease, hypertension, coronary vascular disease, hepatic thyroid and gallbladder disease, arthritis, or any other inflammatory disease has excluded. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Good question, dear uh, chairperson. I am Professor Gasarul Amin from Bangladesh. Assalamualaikum. Please, Please go ahead, sir. For, his, for her valuable presentation, may I ask a small question in regarding health education strategies? What's its importance regarding health education strategies? Your presentation, how much importance? Please explain. Dr. Yes, sir. I am Rul Amin from Bangladesh. Yes, sir. But as women, living one half to one third of their lives after menopause. Mm. So this type of a study has important impact on postmenopausal women's health. Yeah. Gee, uh, yes. Yeah. Hello? Professor Zahid, chairperson yeah. of the session. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thanks sir. To you and the presentation. presentation. Yes. Thank you, sir. I hope you have uh, you have had your answer uh, from this. <laughs> it's still, uh, possibly you wanted to know about the uh, take home message of the presentation. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Yes. Very okay. good. Uh, any, anyway, so she had started the work, and I hope uh, she will go on with with this work to have a conclusive yeah. conclusive remark in future and yeah. to actually delineate the basic mm. mechanism, physiological mechanism right. that actually related to that to her to her work. Uh, definitely, sir. Thank you, Chairman Sir, and thanks to presenter. Really happy. Uh, I think it will be a good uh, uh, beneficial future generation. Okay, uh, the sir, uh, the participant uh, of chairperson. I am Professor Rokeh Begum from Bangladesh. Hey, madam, yes, madam. Ask a question to Professor Akhtar. Madam, yes, madam. At first, uh, I tell you, uh, this is your excellent, uh, interesting, and uh, the valuable, um, uh, brilliant presentations uh, in this yes, regard. Uh, and uh, my question was, uh, uh, the, uh, you have already shown the mechanism of the increase the BMI and CRP. Yes. The discussion yes. section. Hmm. Yes, sir. Have you yes. already possible did? mechanism? Huh. I want to know that you are in the uh, department and uh, you're, uh, you have a postgraduate student. Sir. And uh, you yes, have uh, noticed uh, that. Uh, uh, you, uh, the hormonal status that is the uh, estrogen progesterone mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> related uh, study this year uh, and uh, for the further study have you uh, doing this uh, study for uh, for your student yes madam the relationship i can advise them mm -hmm. uh, for these uh, parameters hormonal assays such as estrogen progesterone fsh lh ah. They pass on this and parameter in also, future studies. You have also uh, suggested that the uh, lipid profile for the parameter. Yes, yes, madam. Lipid profile. Yes, madam. Thank you, madam, for your suggestion. Lipid profile is an important parameter. Uh, 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 it was a wonderful, one, yes. wonderful talk by uh, Professor Akhtar Misa. I think we will discuss later on. We will move on for the, to the next speaker who is waiting, Professor Subro Chatterjee. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Amna, please uh, ask him to uh, uh, come uh, and join online. Dr. Subro Chatterjee? Dr. Subro? Yes, sir. I'll... 
थैंक यू फॉर दिन इंटरेस्टिंग टॉक आर नेक्स्ट स्पीकर प्रोफेसर सुब्रो चैटर्जी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो टेक्नोलॉजी अन्ना यूनिवर्सिटी He's been selected for Fulbright Nehru's Fellowship for Academic and Professional Excellence in Bioengineering for the year 2018, and he was the first recipient of the UGC FRP Professorship Professorship in Life Sciences. With this, I would like request him to please take over and present his uh, talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for introducing me, and I'd like to thank Professor Alam for inviting me to this so exciting task. And I try to share my screen. Uh, just a second, one second. Is it visible? Am I audible? And screen is visible? Yes, you are. Uh, audible. Yes, you are audible. Thank you. And screen. Share. It's visible now. Yeah, is it visible? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, visible. It's... Now, uh... slide show, please put it yeah, on slide show. You have to go to go on to slide show. Yes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's it. Oh. Thanks again. <clears throat> Good afternoon. And uh, so I'll be discussing uh, a very fundamental issue of uh, light as well as, of course, physiology. So that's the flow. so flow is very fundamental part to our life and starting from very beginning of our life and at the very beginning means very beginning that is the first heart beat the moment you get the first heart beat so you are going to get the flow so flow before that means before the heart beat starts the in embryo and when the first heart beat comes after after the heart beat when you see the two world they are extremely means completely different and it's like a revolution with the moment it is flow because we studied specifically this this particular issue what i am talking now the before the first heart beat and after the heart beat so in a specific model we screened more than 30000 genes before heart beat and after heart beat and you won't believe the moment the flow started then 1500 genes upregulation within one hour within minutes to hour and it is going to be a rampart away because it is developmental phase very uh, dynamic dynamic phases of life so it goes on goes on goes on so based on the time after few seconds of the flow after minutes of the flow after hours of the flow after days of the flow it is going to give you different pattern checkered pattern of gene expression and gene uh, gene expression of uh, down regulation and up regulation and you are going to get the complete different world so what i mean to say here that flow is very very fundamental for our making us the way we look the way we shape the way we grow and possibly the way our bio biological clock set so flow is very very fundamental to it and cardiovascular system is maintaining the flow and when it flow is coming so then there is it of course it has it has it needs the pathway and that pathway is the blood vessels lymphatic vessels so there should be a proper dynamic flow in higher system like human and higher animals and the blood vessels is made also unique way particularly in higher animals again there are different layers of uh, la different layers of uh, cells and tissues which is making the fine blood vessels and the inner part most most inner part which people used to believe is very idiotic part very inert part endothelium even exactly 50 years back So it is just a cause some kind of uh, layers on the inner layer. It is going to protect the tissue and the cells from the friction, but it is not. Last 50 years we know what important, how important is endothelium, and you know very recent this endothelitis, which is the inflammation of endothelium, which is causing the havoc in particularly in the case of COVID-19. So endothelium is very important. Not only the mentioning the blood vessels, there are hundreds of. important signaling processes going on through endothelium it's the crosstalk between the flow blood and the our system so it's a extremely important layer of course it physiology morphological and geographically it's very thin and very it appeared insignificant but is not insignificant so understanding endothelium is very important these days people are working for the endothelium endothelitis 
endothelial inflammation, in, 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 in uh, vasculopathy, everything starts with the endothelium and, and particularly few talks are in the morning that VWF and MOSFET and there are several talks which talked about endothelium and the circulation, MOSFET. So these are all linked to endothelium, nitric oxide. So in this process, flow is very ultimatum and ultimate, ultimate uh, determinant of our life process. And when flow is going on the endothelium, so blood flow, there is a flow, it's laminar flow. In a very simplistic way, we think of very laminar flow. It's a layer of cells, endothelial cells, and on that it flows is going on. And if there is any problem, then all these pathways, all these components of the endothelium, those are very important physiological and signaling components like ion channels, G protein coupled receptor, cytoskeleton, they are all going to be perturbed. The moment flow is not uh, laminar. So perturbation of flow is going to cause lots of signaling and those signals is going to finally define your health and physiology. So here is a, you can, if for example, you can see that flow is particular way. Then there is a particular way, nitric oxide, nitric oxide, very important signaling molecule and it's a determinant of the cardiovascular system. And another side, ROS, when flow is different, healthy endothelium, there is a delicate balance. So this is just for one aspect of life. I'm not telling this nitric oxide and ROS doing everything for the life. This is just for example, gas transmitters and the free radicals, they're important in, in case of inflammation, endothelitis, and other kind of cardiovascular conditions. So nitric oxide and ROS in school has to be in particular, uh, particular dynamics it should follow and receive. So the moment flow is different, the moment flow is blocked, just for example, then there is an imbalance. And that imbalance is going to give you different kind of pathological signaling process start initiating. And it, uh, you know that one example I put here, atherosclerosis, thrombosis, one of few few conditions from among many, I'm just represented, uh, represented here, that atherosclerosis and thrombosis. That means from physiology, it's coming some kind of disturbance. I won't say it is even pathophysiology, but some disturbance in physiology. And gradually, it's seeping into the pathophysiology and final, acute, finally acute situation like thrombosis and complete block. And you see that here is the process of this thing. So flow is uh, in a particular fashion. Then flow is got disturbed. Flow is slowed down. As flow is slowed down, then nutrition is less. Ischemic condition is getting develop, de developing along with time. So it's the temporal process. It is not a one second process. It's a temporal. It can even take in the year to have this cartoon to get into that yellow ball on the right side. So, and you know that there are different components and different stakeholders. It's like that lipid profile, your WBCs, those are important in immune system, immune molecule, in local inflammation, INOS, induced nitric oxide, synthesis, activation, and pathologic NO production. And finally, it is going for a higher structure like foam cells with all kinds of oxidative, means oxidized lipids. Cholesterol, they are coming, depositing of, and the modified protein, and finally it's a block. And that block is going to the clear. So that means you see that starting is with flow. And let us go a bit fast. Okay. So now you see the different kind of conditions you are getting into, and these are all basic. If you go to basic, then physical part of it. There will be a biochemical background, but physical part of it is flow. So that means that in all these pathological conditions, the origin of problem is the pattern of flow, dynamics of flow. Somewhere flow is getting into different kinds of dynamics. So those dynamics, we know that renal number, there is a renal number, specific renal number for a particular fluid. There is a density based on that you are going to get the different kinds of turbulence. But of course, turbulence is not right word in case of physiology because turbulence, you need a huge kind of different kind of physical flow. But it's a, we would say disturbed flow. But many people, many loosely people use, even in physiology, turbulence inside the blood vessel, but which is not strictly correct. So it is a disturbed flow. Turbulence we cannot reach. Turbulence we reach only one point uh, here. In this cartoon, if you see that naturally our cardiovascular system is basically one single system, heart and the vasculature is a single one intact system. There is no leakage and it doesn't like leakage, it doesn't like stop. It has a flow. But when you go for the secondary structure of vessel, of course, finally, end of the day, it's a single structure. One pump, that is the cardiac uh, heart, and the along with the vasculature, that is the single intact system. 
but if you go for the secondary structure then of course there will be uh, arteria artery arteriole and finally you are ending up the capillary end capillary end is only 1.5 micron thickness 1.5 and aorta is in centimeter so you see but still it is one system so that that means that when it is going from aorta to capillary naturally there will be lots of branching and this lots of branching means lots of pattern and lots of pattern is giving lots of y junction y junction is the branching of blood vessels and it naturally it has to happen because you have to increase the surface area for distribution of enough oxygen enough food enough gas and depending on the peculiarity of your organ that branching also will be different so in the, in the unique cases in case of pathology when you study last 50 years later you see that most vulnerable points are these these red spots at the y junction is the vulnerable point so why they are vulnerable point at this point at this point for a very few second and millisecond yes turbulence can be possible in case of aneurysm that means the blast complete blast of the blood vessel sudden blast and the vulnerable and but the other atherosclerotic block block and gradual conditions vascular conditions they are all coming from this particular area they are prone to have this kind of block these y junctions so these y junctions have the tendency to have the block okay what kind of block what kind of what kind of biochemistry of it that we are not going into that but for this physical parameter that's the junction which is bit vulnerable structurally but why there is one condition is coming that is the, again flow the moment one river bed is going into two rivulets then there will be you notice that there is a disturb of the laminar flow of the river is coming into that corner and that time that corner also very dangerous and most of the accidents drowning in the water is happens in those corners and the river that's because of the disturbed flow of the water pattern is different and turbulence so in the very similar way in our system also these are the system. so it's very interesting to understand and you see, you see that here this thing uh, vessels near branches and bifurcation is more prone to blast hemodynamic stress at this location are more shear stress and predominant hemodynamic stress are more but the thing is you see this cartoon and uh, this this these cartoons and these explanations from the last 50 years uh, database is very interesting. And uh, there are lots of clinical data, lots of clinical information from the from Doppler, from other other advanced studies and real time flow dynamics. We can test, test from the I mean, in a least invasive way we can do now. But at the moment it's coming for the our our experimental part. I'm talking the experimental physiology, experimental cell physiology, experimental anatomy. When it is coming experimental part, there are too many things we cannot go for clinic. It's not possible. There are ethical issues, there are technological issues, other issues are there. So after the observation, clinical observation, we come back to laboratory for the experimental model. And in this experimental model, the biggest drawback even today in the field of vascular biology even people are in vascular biology working day and night every day all over the world their first perception is that it is the endothelial cells growing endothelial cells growing epithelial cells those are vascular cells particularly uh, uh, those are creating the inner layer of the blood vessels they are now very important there are lots of lots of targets lots of drug uh, drug targets molecular targets are there so they start working in with endothelial cells but most of them, practically all of them, miss the flow. We never, very few, few examples, very few exceptions are there. We never keep the flow in our laboratory when we culture the endothelium. So basically, endothelium practically doesn't like what is static. Endothelium always under flow. So how we are going to keep the flow in the laboratory? How we are going to test the endothelial functions under flow? How we are going to take the how we are going to target the drug and drug development under flow, which is very important because endothelium born to have the flow, non-stop, continuous way. There will be there will be an ups and down in finding the flow for endothelium for depending on the different kind of physiological and pathological concerns. But it must ceased flow flow is continuous unless otherwise there's acute stroke condition 
ischemic condition, flow is almost zero in that specific area, even for few seconds. Beyond that, you cannot even survive. So flow is very fundamental to endothelium and the vascular system. So in laboratory, how we are going to address this? Usually, we don't do it. So in this situation, you see that in this part, we are showing one red ring inside the vessel, and it's a very schematic data. So now, if we like to be inside the ring, inside the ring, and you see that there is a flow, and this endothelium, you can see that around this vessel there is endothelium, and there is a blood. Is let us keep it very simple. That is laminar flow. That is the straight line. Uh, am I audible? Can you hear me? Hello. You are audible. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, sure. Thank you. So in this situation, in this situation, this exerting pressure on the wall has the to go in and this blockless. And you know the example I was giving happy here. So this is very interesting in when it is cartoon and skim. But the thing and okay, so let us adjust it here because it's related to blood formation and effect of flow. Okay, let us go. So now the thing is how we are going to address it in laboratory, keeping the flow, keeping the system all expands under the flow. So we need a system and this studying the flow and its effect on the endothelium or any other kind of cells, whatever you want. So there we need a system. So my explanation, next few slides, I'll be explaining how we can do laboratory and experiment. This is, you see that this is a very old, 10 years before we did this work. So you see that is the layer of endothelial cells. You can see the nucleus. You can see the subcellular actin, polymerized actin, which there is a specific probe for actin, phalloidin. And this phalloidin is going to be, you can see that thin, thin, uh, very thin uh, structures within cells, subcellular. So these are polymerized actin. This is very important to have the shape, structure, migration, inflammation, and uh, leakiness of the cell membrane and leakiness of the blood vessels. These are very important. So this is laminar flow. And now when we are going for Basically, this is the sorry, this is laminar flow, but this is before the flow condition. We didn't start the flow. And this is the snapshot of all these uh, fluorescence image of this uh, cell, cell layer. You can see around 10 cells here. The same field when you are doing after 30 minutes of flow, then you can see there is a redistribution of the cells and shape and structure, and there is some gap is coming at the center. So the flow is creating some kind of changes in the properties of the endothelial cells, specifically properties in the sense of migratory structure, migration of the cells, cell cells, crosstalk, cell cell communication, and it is, it is interfering with the normal layers of endothelium, which is now getting, because of this flow, it is now getting into different shape and different pattern. Okay, so now let us go for the real experiment. So, okay. So here you see now we like to get the how we are going to address this means how we are going to get this flow to be ready inside laboratory. So there are a couple of approaches people do. You can see that uh, some real blood vessel in some specific model, like uh, uh, intravital system, intravital microscope. You say under microscope you can go for a specific uh, specific blood vessel. And that blood vessels you can ligate in a specific way. And because of that ligation, you can have that other end of the ligation, you have different kind of uh, flow, you can follow it. And then the microfluidic system, they are coming up in the microfluidic system, it is like 200, 100 micron channel, and it has the Y junction, you can do. It. And uh, there you can follow under microscope, the process is going on, and uh, you can modify the conditions and you can check the endothelial cells in those channels specifically, but this is very defined system. I mean, the flexibility is extremely low because you have to buy that mic microfluidic chamber along with the imprinted blood vessels, which is in micron. And one experiment is done, one condition, and you have to throw it away. So that means it's very expensive, sophisticated, and time consuming and also this thing uh, you know expensive 
So otherwise, it's a very, uh, very, very high resolution system for single experiment or two systems. Another, another way people do that's a cone and plate system. So there is a cone-like structure, solid structure. It is very tightly placed in a particular cylinder, and that cone rotates on its axis in one direction. And because of that gap between the cylinder and the cone, there will be some flow, and that flow is finally going to give you some kind of shear. And the cells will be on the inner side of the cylinder. So these cells will feel the heat of the flow and the shear. So now we are coming, what is our, so there is, you can see advantages and disadvantages, like any model. So now we are coming, what will be our approach? It is called parallel plate flow chamber. So in parallel plate flow, flow chamber, the concept is that it's very simple trick of physics, that is the gravity. So uh, I don't know if it is visible, clear to you or not. You can see here is a small box where you can see that this one. So this is the flow chamber. And you can see it is written the buffer chamber on the top here. There is a cylinder. So for example, buffer chamber has the blood plasma, just for example, blood plasma. And the flow chamber holds the endothelial cells. Blood plasma will be flowing through endothelial cells. And we will be checking the effect of that flow on the endothelial cells. But now the question is, this flow and the basically basically what we study most of the most of the laboratories they are keen about the shear stress because of the flow there is a shear and that shear is practical force which is impacting the layer that is the endothelial cell layer and that shear stress and the shear flow or shear stress that is that is numerically linked with the flow. And that flow depends on the height. So if you are if you are pouring some water from 100 feet and you are pouring some water from 5 feet, there will be difference. And you can see that impression of water on the ground will be much more which is coming from 100 feet. So that impression shows that there is a lots of energy hidden there because of the height. And that energy is going to give you finally the flow in case of in our system as well. So in our experimental system, we are using that height to increase and decrease the flow on the flow chamber. That means in the flow chamber. That means if your height is more, then flow rate will be more. And flow rate will more means there will be shear stress more. And that shear stress will be exerted on endothelial cells. And that is the way from this first heartbeat of our life until the last heartbeat, we are going to get the flow and the shear stress. So shear stress is very important component and this equipment is going to give you understand the effect of impact of shear stress on the endothelial cells. So now let us let me go through bit detail of this. You can see that here is one shear stress formula is there. The only take home message from this formula is that here only variable is the height, height of the reservoir of the that height of this buffer chamber or reservoir from the flow uh, chamber. So this height is very critical and that is the variable that in our hand. And fortunately, all other parameters are more or less constant for us. Density of buffer, density of blood or any aqua system and the renal number for the aqua system, they're all always more or less, they're very constant. So for us, it is most important variable is the height. So that means now if you change the height, so for example, around 12 to 15 dyne per centimeter square or physiological rate and you are getting it with a specific height. Now you like to go into situation where the where, where there is cardiac ischemia. Cardiac ischemia, some coronary artery or coronary vessels are getting blocked and angina started. And finally, it is acute angina. At that point, it is ischemia, no blood flow and very low blood flow. So now in that condition, you are, so in the particular height, you are going to get, for, for example here, 75 centimeters. If we keep that height, this particular setup, it is going 15 dyne per centimeter square, which is close to physiology, 12 to 15. And when you are going for uh, uh, this thing, when you are going for uh, lower height of this chamber, then it, the flow is rate, flow, flow rate is less, and that flow rate is finally translated into the ischemic like condition and hypoxia and the angina condition. So that way, in this system, you can make the uh, system variable according to your experiments and the model. You can see this is the 
concept. You can see the follow this only B. Other things are a bit complicated to follow on uh, two dimensions. This is the B, it is a cross section. So you can see there is a base and there is a gasket and this blue and the black ball, this is nucleus and the blue are the cells. There are around seven or eight endothelial cells. It's a layer of the cell and base is there and there is a gasket. Okay, so this gasket has some uh, height is very critical. Okay, all together, this gap between this gasket and the surface of the endothelial layer is 250 micron. 200 to 250 micron, 250 micron. That means one fourth of one millimeter. So one quarter of a millimeter gap is there. So basically, in this condition, we are mimicking some kind of close to capillary area before capillary. And in this kind of space, when it is giving through this space, there is a continuous flow of buffer or plasma. And that flow is going to give laminar flow and shear stress on this system. And this is the parallel flow apparatus. This is our fabrication. We did, we fabricated with our new, uh, with our uh, this thing, blueprint, and we are going to get it in a some advanced way around recently we are working on it. So now you can see that we are using some particular cells, which is endothelial cell, and uh, we had some other models as well. Uh, okay, so you can see that this model is very flexible. So you basically you can grow the cell, then you can flow after flowing. For example, you like to check what is the effect of six hours flow on endothelial bed. You flow it for six hours and then stop it and then take the endothelium, scrap it out and go for your biochemistry, molecular biology, genomics, proteomics, whatever you like. Now the second point, what is very good point with this particular model is that this model, whole chamber, you can place on the microscope in real time. That means during the process of flow, what's going on in the, at sub, sub millisecond and second scale, what is going on in the cells and subcellular thing, subcellular processes that you can capture in real time. So basically, one part is that for your biochemistry and molecular biology, you grow the cells, do it and take the cells out and do your experiment. Another part, you place the whole flow chamber on the inverted microscope. And if inverted microscope has confocal, you do confocal. If microscope is fluorescence, you do fluorescence. You do its higher end microscope to high end, high resolution microscopy. If it's lower end microscope, you can also follow the dynamics of the cells in a nice way, even in lower end microscope. So for example, here cell migration is very important because cell migration is the ultimate for the new blood vessel formation, inflammation, diabetes, and all kinds of things. Cell, cell migration is very important. And when the endothelium is getting disturbed, and then cell migration gets changed properties, and it's going to give you different kind of um, effect. So you see that one one single cell, and it has different kind of extensions from the cells. It's it's it's, it's uh, extensions from cells, filopodial, and all different nomenclature is there, but they are basically the extensions of cells. Depending on how you are treating the cell, one specific kind of extensions will be extruded out from the cells. So how we are going to study in, uh, in our flow chamber. So what you did, this is the graphical simple uh, present presentation. Control, that means no flow. Five minute to zero hour flow and you check the cellular extensions total. Uh, five minutes, five minutes after till two hours, you flow the shear stress, that means you keep the flow on and check. You can see that in a simple, that pink color graph, pink color bar is getting increasing. So it is some kind of lamellopodia structure. It's a specific structure, specific extension, and filopodia structures, both are increasing. Complete zero to five minutes to two hours. You can see the number of extensions are increasing. And you can see that there is another parameter. The cells are going to form the ring structure, which is the units of angiogenesis, new blood vessel formation. So when it is laminar system, flow is there, then there is no, no ring structure formed on the two dimension. But when it is going for some kind of change in the flow, we are going to see that how the ring structure is getting changed. So you, you can see this is bovine aortic endothelial cell, which is from the uh, cow, and aorta cell, endothelial cells. And these endothelial cells, and this is a human endothelial cell.
from uh, uve, uh, from uve, umbilical cord and both the cells when you are going under the flow you can see that after certain time that both the cells both the endothelial cells from cow and human they are going to form ring like structure that means they are they are reformating themselves and forming a ring just like a bangle on two dimensions and that is the starting of the blood vessel formation that also getting increased with uh, shear stress you can see that under flow 30 minutes it is getting increasing in 5 minutes on the on the extreme right 5 minutes then 15 minutes then 30 minutes gradually the number of ring is getting increased so and you see that this is real time image under microscope we kept and this is zero minute no flow now we will be giving pro and i am just keeping that five snaps from this this is basically video and you just follow this red strong arrow here and follow this particular area in the neck so this is after five minutes this is after 10 minutes you see the red arrow indicating a cell uh, uh, there are many things happening in, on, in this particular snap but you better to be easier to follow the red one strong you see this five minutes and 10 minutes so it is going there to form a ring like structure this is the initiation process this is no flow we are starting flow starting flow five minutes already gone there are many things happened cells are talking to each other in a different way now it is going physically towards the specific cell and it took its hand and it is inviting the another cell to come and if you follow another five minutes you will see there is a complete restructure getting formed on this so this surface is modifying based on the flow so you can see here so um, okay let us not go into that here also in the presentation so now when this surface is getting changed so this migration what you showed i showed that migration of this it's forming a real time it is forming but there will be some fundamental mechanism to do it that is subcellular mechanism that signal so there is cytoskeleton there is actin and this actin monomer is going to form the actin polymer to have each function that means to cross talk with another cell to extend my hands to another cell holding that cell's hand and i am asking to have a specific structure pattern to along with us that means three cells four cells coming together and forming a specific defined structure so you can see here so here under shear the lower panel shear with one white arrow we are showing how this round shape is coming one two three cells coming together under shear so so this subcellular subcellular pattern of actin polymerization we study from this and then it can give you that then we have a block actin inducing act, acting different kind of act model and pharmacological pharmacological model like uh, like cytochelicin d you block actin that show that how actin polymerization perturbation under shear under flow is important to have a meaningful functional structure this is the signaling pattern so maybe i'll give you some another example what we can do here here you can see here is a specific probe fluorescent probe which is going to give you nitric oxide production so in case of nitric oxide production this probe is going to interact with the nitric oxide and forming and going to give you specific emission which is green emission now static the same field after this here is here is the graph below 5 to 30 minutes just after few minutes this is static this is the green intensity is representing the nitric oxide production after few minutes you see how this field is getting changed and how much nitric oxide is getting produced because of the flow so flow is going to modulate this nitric oxide production so you can have option opportunity to do in depth nitric oxide uh, signaling by chemistry using the uh, flow chamber and the real under real flow you can follow the uh, pattern of nitric oxide production so Here you know, again, yes i'm uh, getting can you, yeah. yeah can you calculate sure, sure. yeah uh, yes yeah sure, sure. in two minutes Okay. So he, here you can see that uh, this thing. Here you can see it's a wound healing model. So in wound healing, also under flow getting faster along with nitric oxide. So it is a through the different dimensions you can getting from a single experiment. You can see the NO production is increasing, cells are running faster, healing is getting faster in and under flow. And you can change the flow and you can block all this. So it's a very flexible model. So now I will go to very last slide. Uh, yeah, very last slide I will be going. And here, 
I told that this thing there is a different pattern, different area of vulnerability, and it can be aneurysm, it can be different kind of blast because of the block. So now we need to now we need to block the path. So till now we showed the laminar flow. Now we are blocking the path. How we can block the path in our model? So this is numerical and the simulation. In this simulation, we are keeping one ball at the center and flow will be there. So ball in, will be the disturbance for the flow. So we have different pattern of the around the ball, around the block. And we can study it. This is simulation, not experiment. And we have lots of numerical data. Now in experiment, very simple. What I already showed the, uh, this thing that particular apparatus, in these apparatus, what we are going, we are going to keep block. You see, apparatus, we are keeping Teflon block. And that Teflon block at the center, and we are going to flow. And under the flow, because of the Teflon block, there is a block. And the very similar thing I already told can be placed under the microscope or whatever biochemistry you want to do. And you can see lots of significant area specific around the block. How this block at different particular micro area, how the endothelium is getting affected because there is a block. That is the atherosclerotic block. And you can also play with the block with different coating, immuno, immuno molecules, these, that, inhibitor drug. So that is the whole concept. And I don't go in depth data for this. And the very last one. So once block is there, after, after the block is removed, then we place RBC on the red blood cell. So red blood cells in normal condition, there should not be any sticking to the endothelial surface. But when there is block, so one there is a particular area on the on, on the side of the block you see ds2 this endothelium has one two three four five six rbc retained with this endothelium so that means that type of block is very important that the morphology of block is very important that block is round block globule block or the block with multi pockets that means irregular block of atherosclerosis if it is a regular block, then your atherosclerotic progress and pathology will be faster. So this model, this experimental model can have, can give you all these answers and it, it depends on how you are planning your experiment. So it's very wide, wide spectrum scope and it's very flexible and it has lots of positive, also lots of negative. And this is the summary. The long back we published this in the first laminar flow on this and we got the cover for the nitric oxide journal. And just two or three years back, I think we published the scientific reports where we showed the last slide with the block. And mostly it is done by Uma Maheshwari. And now she completed her PhD and she left lab. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tullo. Thank you. It thank, was a thank wonderful you. talk. Thank you. Thank you. But I took a long time, I think. Sorry for that. Now uh, we can directly move on uh, to next speaker. Uh, sure, sure. sure, sir. Thank you for an excellent talk. Thank you. Over to our next speaker, Professor Muhammad Ubedullah Ibn Ali, who's certified by the Bangladesh Medical Association and serves as an associate professor at, uh, of physiology at the Rajashahi Medical College Hospital, Rajashahi, Bangladesh. Please welcome him. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Hiki hello yeah. Man. Sir, please uh, please don't put off put on your mask. Man. Am I audible? Yes. Dear my yes. yes, you are. Audience, I am uh, Dr. Yes. Obadullah Ibn Ali, Professor of Physiology, Russian Medical College. Welcome to virtual biannual SAP and PSI conference. We all welcome you, sir, virtually for the time being.
Please activate your slide show. Slide show, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's all right. right. That's right. I'm Dr. Professor Abadullah Ibn Ali, Professor of Physiology and Russia Medical College. Uh, I would like to uh, deliver my speech with the permission of respected chairperson, Professor Musharraf Hussain, Professor Manisha Jindal, and Professor Jahid Hassan. Uh, my title of the study is Study of Lung Function in Chronic Bronchial Asthma Patient with Vitamin C Supplementation. First of all, in bronchial asthma patient, the inflammation may be accompanied by intensive air, air flow limitation, endogenous oxygen produced by the overactive inflammatory cell and destroy the air flow epithelium, which slap into the bronchial lumen and thus aggravate asthma. Actually, when the oxidant overwhelms the antioxidant, tissue injury and disease result. And the free radical play an important role in the pathogenesis of asthma. Respiratory disease is a major cause of death and disability in many countries. Chronic asthma inflammation may be accompanied by intensive air flow limitation. Free radicals are always being produced in our body. However, body operate to several mechanisms for termination of this free radical, which are injurious to the body. And antioxidant neutralizing the free radical. This study has been designed to observe, to observe the lung function in patient with chronic bronchial asthma, both before and after supplementation of vitamin C. Total number of 60 apparently healthy male suffering from chronic bronchial asthma. All patients are randomly selected from asthma center of Russia Medical College and uh, coexisted any disease are excluded. That means it's an exclusion criteria. The patient age group is uh, 20 to uh, 50 years. The total uh, 60 patients a two group, a study group, and control group. The uh, control group is uh, 30 patients are again divided into A1 at the beginning of the study and A2 actually at the ending of the study. And group C is the study group consists of 30 patients. Uh, that uh, study group are supplemented before supplementation is C1 and after supplementation of uh, oral vitamin C that is uh, 500 milligram and the pulmonary variable such as first vital capacity fbc first expiratory volume in first second fev on by fbc ratio and peak expiratory flow rate were measured by spirometer on a standing position in all group of the patient and the Measured value of FBC and their deviation from predicted value in supplemented with vitamin C at the beginning of the 
and ending up at the beginning of the vitamin C and uh, ending of the study are slowed in, uh, shows in the slide. Group A and group C, C1, group A1 is divided into A1, A2 before supplementation and after supplementation. And C1 and C2 are increased at the beginning of the study and increase the measured value after ending of the study. And if FIBION, if FIBION, if that means first expiratory volume in first second, group A and A2, and study group is uh, group C, C1 and C2 are again increased after supplementation of vitamin C. And also in the uh, PX, PFR, peak expiratory flow rate, is also increased after supplementation of the vitamin C. The present study that is FBC, FEV1, FEV1, FBC, and PFR of the control group are significantly changes uh, than the other study group. The mean FBC, FBP1, and PFR following the vitamin C supplementation were significantly raised than the P supplementation value and patient with chronic bronchial asthma. Uh, my conclusion is the pulmonary variable such as FBC, FEV1, FEV1, FBC, and peak expiratory flow rate in patient with chronic bronchial asthma were significantly lower in comparison to the subject. An object value of this variable in the present study were much lower than the predicted value. The lower volume, pulmonary volume and capacity in asthmatic subject of present study are most likely due to bronchoconstriction by air pollution as because the uh, Bangladesh, uh, most of the cities are highly polluted. So the uh, common respiratory disease like asthma that is obstructive airway disease and all this predicted value is uh, lower, uh, all the uh, predicted value, but lung volume and capacity of the present study are likely due to bronchoconstriction by air pollution as most of the subject of this study were from the urban area where the air pollution is supposed to be higher than the rural area. Improvement of the pulmonary volume and or significantly increase after vitamin C supplementation. But But there are some limitation of this study. The limitation are the short sample size is very short. It is required a large sample size. And if possible, the measurement of serum concentration of antioxidant A, antioxidant C, if it is possible, the measurement of serum concentration of different type of free radical, and if it is possible for different type of free radical in, in blood, then it, is, it, it should be a uh, concrete, a definite conclusion by the sample size and short duration of vitamin C supplementation. It is difficult to draw a uh, conclude, definite conclusion within the uh, within very short sample size. So thank you all. This is my short presentation. The supplementation of vitamin C in chronic bronchial asthma patient. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Obedullah. So now we will conclude the session and we will start the next session. So there will be no lunch break because we have to start, start the next session
uh, I the last lesson uh, from two two o'clock. Okay, sir. So uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Due to the dot dot of time, we will move on to the next session, which is dedicated to nitric oxide and free radicals. Uh, I request the chairpersons, uh, Professor Ojashvi Nepal. Who's an experienced associate professor with demonstrated uh, history? Who demonstrated history of working in the higher education industry? He's skilled mm -hmm. in clinical research, medical education, life sciences, and medical uh, medicine. Uh, yeah. Dr. Uh, Mansi Bhattacharjee, who's professor and head department of physiology, Ames Guwahati, and has special interest in new methods used for teach teaching medical students and cardiovascular physiology. I also request Professor Amar uh, K Chandra, who is the president uh, PSI, to uh, chair the session and uh, permit me to introduce the next speaker. I'll. So, with the permission of the chairpersons, I am uh, going ahead and introducing uh, Dr. Arunabha Ray who is Professor and Head Department of Pharmacology at Hamdard Institute of Medical Sciences and Research, Jamia Hamdard. He was formerly Director of uh, Vallabhai Patel Chest Institute, University of Delhi. He has over 40 years of professional experience in the field of basic and clinical pharmacology and allied biomedical sciences at MBBS as well as um, postgraduate le uh, levels. Uh, he uh, has uh, varied contribu contributions in the field of preclinical as well as clinical pharmacology toxicology with a novel translational approach and has been a recipient of various awards and honors from the uh, apex scientific bodies such as the professor B. A., uh, B. N. Ghosh oration award professor s b pandey oration award and professor n s dala oration award over to you sir thank you Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good afternoon. And I thank you all, especially Dr. Iqbal Alam for organizing such a nice conference and also giving me the opportunity to speak in front of this international gathering. The, the session is on nitric oxide and free radicals. So just before this, uh, one lecture before this, uh, Dr. Subro Chatterjee spoke and he is also one of the pioneers in the field of nitric oxide. And so uh, I was, I hope that he is also listening to this lecture. Uh, the topic of the lecture is uh, nitric oxide gener gen regulates gender based differences uh, in stress susceptibility and adaptation. <laughs> the uh, now stress uh, is something which uh, relates to physiology because it's basically disruption of the physiological homeostasis, which results in stress. And when such stress is go, goes on for a continued prolonged period of time and the ability to adapt or cope with such stressful inputs is uh, deranged, is that is when, when you get pathophysiology, you get disease. So a variety of disease states are known to be precipitated by stress, which are known as stress-related diseases. And these diseases relates to the brain and the cardiorespiratory system and the immunological system in particular. And there is a strong connect between these various systems uh, when uh, the responses to stress are actually happening inside the body. So the stress and stress response has been studied very extensively and we know that the brain is central to the organization of the stress response. Complex neurochemical neural pathways are involved. Primary mediators are the HPA axis and the sympathoadrenal system, that is the catecholamines. But now the, 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 the concept of stress has progressed much beyond that, much beyond these two basic, basic hormones, though they still remain the bottom line of the, of the stress response. But uh, what has now newer, newer concepts have, have evolved and uh, we will be discussing on some of those things. What has emerged most recently why should I say most recently for quite some time that gender differences exist with reference to stress responses. That is 
you know, males and females react differently to different stressed situations. Neuropsychological disorders like depression, uh, cardiovascular disorders, respiratory disorders. So a variety of disorders and their related pathophysiological mechanisms are differently influenced in different sexes, that is males and females. However, uh, to date, uh, most of the research that has been done uh, as far as stress is concerned has focused on males just because, you know, people work a lot on male rats, people work a lot on male uh, species of animals and, and the, the, the data of the females or on either sex and the data of the females was, was not very much highlighted. So uh, some, some literature uh, seemed to emerge that males and females may be different and hypotheses were proposed. So uh, when we were working with uh, this, this gender differences, and I had a PhD student who did extensive work on this, estrogens may account for these gender differences. That is the first conclusion that we came to, and that estrogens may regulate the HPA axis, estrogens may regulate the catecholamine energy systems. And uh, some animal studies indicate that estrogens may facilitate rather than inhibit stress responses. So a variety of data was existing as far as uh, estrogens and stress responses were concerned. We focused on nitric oxide because nitric oxide was an emerging transmitter. We knew that for the last 30 or plus years, nitric oxide has given us more than 60, 70,000 manuscript papers. And so many important concepts have emerged with reference to nitric oxide. Subro was just speaking of one of them. And uh, Iqbal will speak and the later speaker will speak of some others. And the importance of nitric oxide was highlighted by the, by the fact that the Nobel Prize in 1998 was given because of nitric oxide. And three people got that. I won't go into the history. But recent studies have indicated that nitric oxide is not only important in the cardiovascular system, but it is also equally important in the central nervous system and the immune system. Two other areas which received less attention since all the focus was on the cardiovascular system. In the central nervous system, it is now known as a very, very important signaling molecule. It is synthesized in different parts of the brain, widespread, widespread distribution in different brain areas, involvement in a variety of physiological functions, variety of pathophysiological conditions, and basically signal transduction that, 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 that starts with nitric oxide involves diverse mechanisms. So what is the status of nitric oxide during stress? Obviously, it came to our mind some years back. And we thought that since nitric oxide is so important in the brain, and some areas of the brain which are important for stress also have a lot of nitric oxide generated in those areas. So there must be some role of nitric oxide as far as stress is concerned. And we found out that, yes, nitric oxide is actually uh, implicated in a variety of stress-related responses. The idea also came from the fact that uh, earlier today, uh, nitric oxide mimetics, like uh, so many nitric oxide mimetics, ethyl trinitrate, isosorbide dinitrate, et cetera, et cetera, nitrates and nitrites used in cardiovascular disorders are, are, are disorders which are stress-related. So stress precipitates these disorders. Ischemic heart disease, we know that nitric oxide modulators are very important but, uh, as far as ischemic heart disease is concerned. But the regulatory role of nitric oxide with reference to stress mechanisms, stress susceptibility and stress adaptation was not very clear. So we, we, we thought that we should study this. And we also thought that it's important to know that why males and females differ, differ as far as stress responses are concerned. And was nitric oxide involved in such differential regulation? So we did, we took two parameters. One is behavioral parameters and we took immunological parameters. And to start with behavioral parameters, we knew that stress can induce a condition which is known as anxiety, anxiety related behavior. And we looked at stress induced anxiety and we showed that males and females actually reacted differently with response, with reference to stress. So anxiogenic responses or anxiety-like behavior was greater in males as compared to females. This was done in a simple test, which you all know, those who do behavioral pharmacology or behavioral studies, an elevated plus maze test, which is a very simple test for anxiety in which the rats tend to prefer closed spaces, which is an indication of normal behavior and anxiety-like behavior. And when they are, when the anxiety is relieved, 
they tend to prefer open spaces. They go more into the open spaces. This is their natural behavior based on their habitat. So uh, when stress, when male and female rats were stressed, we showed that both these groups of rats had fewer open arm entries. That is, they, they were more into the closed arms and le lesser time as compared to the open arm time in, in, as, with response to stress. And these responses were much more in males. You can see the reductions are much more in males as compared to the females. So this told us that the anxiety and anxiogenic behavior in rats were more in females and in males in response to stress as compared to females. So that was the first observation. So this again is a schematic representation. You can see that the females were more adaptive to the stress responses as compared to males with reference to behavioral suppression in response to stress in the elevated plasmas. When we tested with nitric oxide modulating drugs, like L-arginine is a precursor of nitric oxide, and we gave L-arginine, and we showed that L-arginine reversed this anxiogenic behavior and tended to bring it back towards normalcy in both male and female rats. But the, the, the magnitude of reduction was a reversal was greater in males as compared to females. Similarly, when the nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, that is L-NAM was given, the responses were opposite to that seen with L-arginine. And again, this response was more in response uh, with males as compared to females, indicating that not only stress-induced anxiogenic behavior, but drug-induced modulation of anxiogenic behavior when exposed to stress were regulated by nitric oxide. When we looked at plasma corticosterone, which is a very good marker of stress, and also plasma nitric oxide metabolites. Now, nitric oxide is a very short half-life, 5 to 10 seconds. So in order to measure nitric oxide levels, so we need to measure nitric oxide, stable nitric oxide metabolites, which is a mixture of nitrates and nitrites. So when we looked at the nitrate and nitrites, we, the corticosterone levels were elevated. Again, you can see the elevations are more in males as compared to the females, the extent of elevations. These were reversed again, more in males as compared to females. When we looked at nitrate levels, we showed that nitrate levels were lower in males in compared to, as compared to females in response to stress. So nitrate levels were lower in, in, in the plasma as compared to in males as compared to females. When we compared uh, males and females with reference to behavior and nitric oxide metabolite levels. This is a schematic representation of the earlier data that behavioral data was more, uh, behavioral suppression was more in males as was, uh, and the levels of nitric oxide metabolites was also lower in males as compared to that in females when compared to the controls. One of the signaling mechanisms that were being proposed during that time was, and Subaru pointed out rightly, that complex interactions between reactive nitrogen species and reactive oxygen species, that is oxidative stress, takes place. And it can go both ways. Nitric oxide is known to be protective at lower concentrations, and at higher concentrations, it combines with superoxide to give you peroxynitrite, which is toxic. So here we looked at oxidative stress markers and nit nitric oxide metabolites in, in males and females during, during stress. And we showed that oxidative stress, it was induced, that is, MDA levels were higher in males as compared to that in females. Similarly, glutathione, reduced glutathione levels were lower in males as compared to females, the extent of reductions. And these changes were reversed both in males and females by the enomimetic, that is L-arginine. And this reduction or reversal in reductions in, in the modulations and oxidative stress parameters, but more in males as compared to females. So this again, um, vibed with the earlier hypothesis that stress-induced changes and their modulation by enomimetics were, were predictable, meaning that they were more in males as compared to that in females. Now we looked at immune responses. Now we know that stress also suppressed immune responses. And we looked at two very simple parameters of immune responses one of humoral immunity and one of cell-mediated immunity. Humoral immunity, we know that antibody-forming cells in the spleen, plug-forming cells in the spleen, and we showed. And for the delayed type of hypersensitivity, we looked at the, 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 the DTH response, that is the CMI response. 
the foot pad thickness response. And we showed that both these responses were suppressed in response to stress in males and females. And the suppression was greater in female males as compared to females. You can see in the table, the extent of reduction in males was greater as compared to females. Similarly, in the DTH response, the extent of reduction or suppression was greater in males as compared to that in females. And L-arginine, which is a precursor of uh, nitric oxide, reversed both these suppressions, the effects being greater in males as compared to that in females. When we looked at two important cytokines, a TH1 cytokine, that is interferon gamma, and a TH2 cytokine, that is IL-4, we showed that these cytokines were also suppressed in response to stress. Again, the preponderance of such suppression was seen in males as compared to that in females. And when arginine was given, precursor of nitric oxide, the re reversals of these suppressions were greater in males as compared to that in females. Differential changes were there, but the general observation, the general tendency was that males reacted more to stress as well as the drugs as compared to that of females. Now, we looked at female rats. Now, we took female rats and we wanted to see whether estrogen was actually involved in such stress or differences in stress responses. And we blocked the estrogen receptor by giving tamoxifen. And we showed that when female rats were treated with tamoxifen, their responses, especially with the higher dose, their responses were very similar to the extent of changes seen was similar to that seen in males. So this gave us the idea that when we remove the estrogenic influence in females, or uh, the, the, the responses seen in stress responses, immune responses particularly, were more oriented towards the males, indicating that estrogen nitric oxide reactions were probably involved in such stress-induced behavioral and immunological changes. When we looked at oxidative stress parameters, that is GSH, MDA, and nitric oxide metabolites, again, treatment with the tamoxifen, that is estrogen receptor blocker, gave us responses which were very similar to the males when, when given in females. That is the adaptive, the, the adaptive tendency of females to stresses was removed when the estrogen receptors were blocked indicating that estrogen was actually playing an important role as far as stress-induced changes in behavior and immunity were concerned. Moving on with nitric oxide, we knew that nitric oxide could play an, an important endogenous role as far as stress is concerned and such gender-based differences. Now we knew that L-arginine had a, another aberrant molecule which is known as asymmetric dimethylarginine which is also synthesized simultaneously with arginine in the body. Arginine is synthesized in the body. We all know that. It needs to be supplemented from outside when there is a deficiency. So ADMA levels, actually ADMA suppresses nitric oxide synthesis, thereby lowering nitric oxide levels. So this dynamic equilibrium exists physiologically. That is, whenever there is lower levels of nitric oxide, nitric oxide ADMA levels are high. And ADMA levels are also related to oxidative stress, as we have seen, and the literature also reported that. So we showed that ADMA levels were lower, were higher in males as compared to that in females. So when we were looking at nitric oxide, simultaneously we showed that ADMA levels were higher in males as compared to that in females. You can see the extent of increase was greater, almost twice in males, but not so much in case of females. And when arginine was given, which competes with ADMA for a site on the nitric oxide synthase, arginine reversed these changes towards normalcy, both in males and females. But since the, the reductions in the uh, females, increase in the females were lower in the first place, so the extent of changes were not so apparent in females as compared to that in males. So asymmetric dimethyl arginine is an endogenous NO NOS, in, NOS inhibitor crucial marker for NO activity in the cardiovascular system. And now we have shown it in the brain also, that it, ADMA levels in the brain are also actually increased when exposed to an acute stressor. Elevated plasma ADMA levels have also been shown here. And on the basis of ADMA and the nitric oxide data that we have shown, we were able to say that nitric oxide actually 
could act as an endogenous adaptogen. Adaptogen is a substance which protects you against stress responses. So brain nitrosate and oxidative stress markers in males and females. This is a summary. You can see the oxidative markers were lower, uh, were much low, more lowered in males as compared to that in females, which were higher as compared to that in males. So this indicated that oxidative stress also played an important role as far as differences in male and female to stress responsiveness was concerned. And when we looked at behavior, nitric oxide and oxidative stress, again, a summary of the earlier, what I've said earlier, that behavioral suppression, oxidative stress and suppression in nitric oxide levels were greater in males and females. When tamoxifen was given in female rats, these changes were reversed more towards normalcy. You can see with formastain, which is an aromatase inhibitor, which blocks estrogen synthesis, the changes were almost as close to that as males. That is, the, the quantum of behavioral reduction seen in males was apparent in females, as was the levels of nitric oxide and the levels of malondialdehyde, that is the marker of oxidative stress. So formastain on estradiol levels in brain nox. Estradiol is, is, you know, is, is the way by which we can, we can measure the levels of estrogen. And so estradiol levels and brain nox levels were in close parallel. That is, as compared to controls, stress increased estradiol levels and lowered nox levels. When formastain was given in female rats, that is a blocker of aromatase, estradiol levels were lowered and nitric oxide metabolites were also increased as compared to that seen with stress. So all these informations collectively taken together gave us the concept that gender-based differences in stress responses, that is behavioral response and immunological response were linked with NO. And while doing so, NO was linking, NO was dependent, NO was interfering with estrogen dependent pathways. NO was interfering with oxidative stress mechanisms which were more in males as compared to females. And hence, the responses in males were more apparent as compared to that in females. So to conclude, gender differences exist in stress-induced behavioral and immunological responses, as we have shown here. Males were more susceptible to stress effects, at least in the model that we have shown. Blockade of estrogen activity by drugs like formastain and tamoxifen reverted stress induced changes in females more towards male patterns. Thus, NO and its interactions with reactive oxygen species and estrogen dependent pathways may play a differential, may play a role in the differential stress susceptibility and adaptation or tolerance that is seen in males and females. I would like to acknowledge the funding agencies for funding this research. This research is a prolonged research. It has gone on for a long time. A lot of PhD students have gone out researching this particular area, different aspects. And so we've had different funding agencies coming here, ICMR, DST, and some of my very good postdoctoral fellows, almost all of whom are now working abroad and doing very good. And I thank the organizers for once again, and the audience for their patience here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Roy. Thank you, Professor Rice. It's an excellent lecture, though I could not listen in the first part. But whatever I read, it is very interesting, the difference between the male and female and the stress pers perspective for the nitric oxide, nitrocytic and oxidative stress. I request to the chairpersons, I request to chairpersons. Professor Amar, uh, Chandra, if he's around. Professor, Professor A.K. Chandra, Amar, are you there? Professor A.K. Chandra, are you here? Anyone is there other than Professor Chandra? Professor Iqbal, uh, hello. But, but he has, a, yeah, Professor Amar Chandra has come back. Yes, yes. Professor Amar Chandra, please. Dr. Aslam Sari is also here. Yes. yes. Uh, Professor Amar Chandra, can you ask a question, please? It is a very loop. Right. Uh, it was a wonderful talk and it is an excellent study, but I wonder whether nitric oxide plays a role in stress susceptibility or tolerance. Does it play some role in sexual differentiation of the brain as well? Which one? Can, I, can you come again? No, nitric oxide yeah. 
It is a wonderful study. Nitric oxide plays a role in uh, gender susceptibility uh, for stress responses. But does nitric oxide plays a role in sexual differentiation of yes. the brain cells? There are reports that uh, both neuronal and non-neuronal cells in males and females react differently to different uh, stimuli with reference to some brain disorders. And right. we've done some studies uh, with in, in, in neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease. That's right. But does and nitric oxide has got a role in that? that uh, the reason why male rats are more prone to Alzheimer's disease, that is beta amyloid deposition and tau protein deposition, uh, as compared to females, is because nitric oxide levels or mm. Uh, nitric oxide mediated signaling pathways are more active in those parts of the brain as compared to females. Right. So that is one thing that we have shown and going by what we have said. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I am audible. I am audible, sir. Yes, you are audible. You are audible. Yeah. Professor, Chand Professor Chandra, do you want to ask any question to Professor Roy? Okay, if there is no question, I think that it, it is the, uh, the time is there. I think we have running short of time. Yes, so we have to I, I, start yes. The I request the or, organizer, uh, please to go for the next next speaker. Yes. Thank you, sir. So it's uh, th thank you for the enlightening lecture. First to Dr. Ray. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Iqbal Alam, who actually needs no introduction now. He's the professor and head of physiology at uh, Hamdard Institute of Medicine. No need to introduce me. I'm just, uh, I would like to thank okay, sir, Professor Aslam. Over. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank, uh, thank Professor Aslam, Professor Savi, Amar sir, and Kusalda. Rukaya Begum, Professor Rukaya Begum, that they have all given me and trusted me to organize uh, the virtual conference in Jamia Hamdar. And also, I think uh, in last four days, uh, we had a very good uh, discussion and interactions between uh, the different, uh, different scientists and uh, for those who are uh, staying in different parts of the world. So now today, uh, actually, I'm the, uh, one of the member of uh, Nitric Oxide Society and Professor Arunabo Ray is the president of uh, that society. And uh, we just put in one session, uh, that Nitric Oxide session in this uh, in the conference. So in this uh, conference, we have two, uh, three, four papers, but now we uh, actually uh, taken the three papers, one from Dr. Ray, one from myself, and the other from uh, uh, Dr. Gulati, who, who is uh, from uh, VPCI, Patel Chest uh, Institute. Now, my, uh, today's uh, my topic is the role of HMGB1 and decoding in preeclampsia. First, uh, you know, preeclampsia is one of the hypertensive, high blood pressure disorder of pregnancy. Uh, it is a major cause of maternal and perinatal mortality. So number of uh, still birth, uh, is, uh, still birth and death of newborn in first few weeks of life and uh, morbidity. So you see, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy occurs about 10% of all pregnant women around the world. So preeclampsia affects three to 5% of pregnancies. So along the, with preeclampsia, other diseases which are included uh, uh, in the group of hyper, hypertensive disorder of pregnancies are eclampsia, gestational hypertension, and chronic hypertension. So in Asia and Africa, nearly, nearly one-tenth of the maternal deaths are associated with hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. In India, uh, the incidence of preeclampsia is reported to be 8 to 10 percent among, among the pregnant women. So according to our study, the prevalence of hypertensive disorder of pregnancy was 7.8% uh, with preeclampsia in 5.4% uh, 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 of the study population in India. So we have taken the patient from our hospital. Uh, 
so this is about uh, the uh, the preeclampsia. here is a common disorder uh, characterized by hypertension proteinuria and other systemic disturbances at or after the 20 weeks of gestational period so the disorder is caused by the placental and maternal vascular dysfunction so mainly the preeclampsia is reported to be 8 to 10% and it is a major contributor to the maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality so preeclampsia can also lead to a threatening condition like eclampsia and affects many other organs and fetus. So preeclampsia, the patients are uh, at risk uh, for future cardiovascular uh, disease if we treated and if survive. Now, you see the preeclampsia, it is a uh, 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 pathophysiology of uh, preeclampsia. So, you know, the preeclampsia is multi-system disorder, disorder. So the main causes of preeclampsia is the poor placentation and the spiral arteries remodeling. If there is a spiral artery remodeling, then there is an endothelial dysfunction, then there is a decrease in NOS secretion, there is a decreased nitric oxide. And then that, uh, if there is a decreased nitric oxide, there is a placental hypoxia. And then if there is a placental hypoxia, then there is a uh, 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 secretions of uh, uh, the uh, inflammatory markers, mainly uh, we are targeting the HMGB1 and interleukin-6 and we are one will brand factor. So all these that leads to the act activation of neutrophils and then the neutrophils and the lymphocyte ratio disrupt. So this is the pathophysiology of uh, uh, preeclampsia. And then the, what is the clinical types of preeclampsia? There are two uh, um, uh, we, we, we are divided this uh, clinical type, uh, uh, clinically uh, preeclampsia into two types, mild and severe. If there is a mild uh, preeclampsia, then only you can uh, see the, there is a change in the uh, blood pressure, not very high. The mean arterial pressure is 105, but if there, uh, if the, there is a severe, uh, in severe uh, preeclampsia, you can see that there is a uh, hypertension, that is the blood pressure more than 160 millimeter of systolic pressure, diastolic 110, and then there is a proteinuria, the platelets also disrupted, then there is a, this is a health the syndrome, and all leads to uh, uh, that uh, uh, the increase the number of mortality if the preeclampsia, then they converted into the eclampsia. So what are the signs and the uh, symptoms of this uh, preeclampsia? So signs are the abnormal weight gain, increased blood pressure, edema, pulmonary edema. Then the, what are the warning signs? There is a severe headache, blood vision, nausea, vomiting, excessive so, uh, swelling of hands and feet, decreased urination frequency, rapid pulse rate. Then the mild symptoms are the slight swelling over the ankles, whole body swelling. And alarming symptoms the, uh, are the headache, disrupt sleep, diminished urination, epigastric pain, and uh, blood vision. So these are the clinical features of preeclampsia. Now, so what is sterile inflammation and what is the role of sterile inflammation in preeclampsia? You know, if there is a, there is an, uh, or what are the possible cause of uh, this uh, the, the, the sterile inflammation? There are a number of uh, mechanisms by which we can say that the, uh, the pre in preeclampsia, the uh, uh, sterile inflammatory markers uh, increases. So these sterile, uh, sterile inflammatory markers increases because of the cellular stress, because of uh, the uh, damage associated molecular pattern, because of the cell death. So all that leads uh, to increase the inflammatory markers. That is the sterile inflammatory molecules. So these sterile inflammatory molecules then then uh, acts or affects uh, the cells. And then what happened? The extracellular RNA and the intracellular RNA, the eDNA, eRNA, they are all coming out uh, from the nucleus. And they again they uh, increase the secretions of um, uh, in, in inflammatory molecules. So. So what is the etiology of preeclampsia? You know, the, it's maybe genetic, uh, genetic predisposition, the maybe abnormal immunological response, maybe the deficient of tropoblast invasion or hyperperfused placenta, 
It may be the endothelial uh, cell injury, activation of coagulation system, uh, uh, that, and also the vascular endothelial cell uh, activation. So these are all uh, the etiologies. Uh, one, and if one uh, thing happened, then the leads to the another um, mechanism. And then the, if the vascular endothelial cells the activation occur, there is a, because of the circulation, the abnormal hemodynamics um, uh, that is the change in the blood pressure, change in the heart rate, uh, and the other factors also they reduce the euro uh, utero placental blood flow if there is an uh, uh, abnormal hemodynamics or abnormal uh, blood pressure or abnormal uh, uh, heart rate so that all leads to the clinical manifestation of the preeclampsia these are all the etiology of preeclampsia now what are the tests how can we uh, evaluate the, uh, the patients the, uh, what are the screening tests of uh, preeclampsia so there, there is a number of tests available. So they are the Doppler ultrasound, presence of diastolic notch at uh, 24 weeks of uh, gestation, absence of end diastolic frequency, the average mean arterial pressure in the second trimester that is more than uh, 90 millimeter of AG. And then we can see the fetal DNA. So prophylactic measure, what prophylactic measures we can take? So we can uh, take the regular antenatal checkup we can see about the antithrombic thrombotic agent. Then we can see the heparin, calcium supplement. Uh, we can give the couple, uh, calcium supple, uh, supplementation. Then we can also give the antioxidant and nutritional supplement so that we can neutralize uh, if there isn't any uh, abnormal inflammatory mar uh, markers are uh, uh, secreted. Or we have to give a balanced diet to the uh, pregnant uh, women. So what are the complications of uh, preeclampsia? There is an abruptions of the placenta. There may be a cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, lary edema, laryngeal edema, ARDS, sepsis. So these are all the uh, uh, complications because of preeclampsia. So what is it? So the, one, the, on, the only one thing for the, curation, uh, for the curation or for the treatment of this uh, preeclampsia is delivery of the fetus. If there is a delivery, or if, if there is a preeclampsia or eclampsia, then the, uh, the, the, our motive is to deliver the baby. So deliver of the fetus and the placenta is the only real treatment of the preeclampsia. So other interventions aims to decrease complications uh, and increase maturation is also uh, of the fetus. So, in our present study, we have uh, taken a um, uh, sample uh, or subjects from our HASC hospitals, and then we have divided the subjects into the normal, that is uh, non-pregnant no, uh, normal, the pregnant normal, and the preeclampsia. So these three groups we have taken, and we have evaluated the number of inflammatory markers and the blood uh, pro profiles and the hemodynamic uh, hemodynamics profi uh, profiles. Now you can you can see and uh, compare the the, the uh, estriol inflammatory ele elevation in the pathophysiology of preeclampsia that we have taken uh, we have seen the eDNA and eRNA and we compare with the non-pregnant control, the pregnant control, and preeclampsia, and then pre after. Uh, uh, the delivery of the baby, we also see that what happened about this eDNA. So, you know, eDNA, eRNA, whenever the RNA and DNA is within the uh, uh, nucleus, then it's okay. If it is coming out from the nucleus, they, are, they all produce uh, the infl inflammations. Or in, or they, they enhance the, uh, the production of the inflammatory molecules. So you can see that there is an, uh, a significant increase of eDNA and eRNA in the preeclamptic uh, subjects. Then uh, you can see the, the wall wind, uh, will brand factors, uh, the HMGB1, uh, decoding, and uh, VG, VEGF. These are all uh, increase in preeclamptic uh, preeclampsia. If you compare with the uh, non-pregnant and uh, uh, the pregnant control uh, control group, and after delivery, it uh, you see that it's come into the nor almost normal. All, uh, other is the head shock protein. You can see head shock protein 19 is small uh, um, S100B and the interleukin C. These are all uh, the sterile inflammatory markers. You can see that these odd markers are uh, significantly increased in uh, pre um, eclampsia. So <clears throat> now uh, the up regulation uh, we have also seen about the uh, see the 
this uh, are compare these are the uh, compare in the tissue the, or the we have taken the placenta and then we uh, stain it and we see the hmgb1 and uh, decorin uh, and the other inflammatory molecules and we see under the fluorescence microscope and we uh, we see that these all molecules are coming out into the tissues and these are all uh, they are these you can see if you compare that this is the control this is our control uh, group this is an, our preeclamptic group and you can see the fluorescent uh, fluorescence here the significant uh, increase of the hmgb1 in the tissue in the in the placenta and if you merge you can also uh, see that there is a uh, significant uh, 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 number of uh, uh, hmgb1 uh, in the uh, in the placenta of the preeclamptic patient now other molecule we have taken the decorin so you know the decorin is a the leucine rich proteoglycans that is produced by decidual cells the limits invasion of endovascular differentiation of extra uh, villous tropoblast cells during early presentation by binding to the multiple tyrosine kinase receptors so you see uh, the vascular endothelial growth factor receptor 2 this is the most important so what are the our objective of this uh, decorin so because many studies have reported an association with the poor tropoblastic invasion and endovascular differentiation with preeclampsia so our studies reported here and tested uh, whether the decorin over expression in the chorionic villi and the basal decidual is associated with preeclampsia and if so whether this association results in a hyper invasive placenta and whether the elevated placenta decorin concentration in the second trimester is a predictive biomarkers for uh, preeclampsia so actually we are looking for a, uh, for biomarkers of pre eclampsia so we are targeting the two molecules decorin and hmgb1 so what about the hmgb1 how it uh, increase uh, during the, the different phases of uh, preeclampsia and uh, also we are comparing with the decorin uh, decorin also so you know uh, in our present study design so we have seen that the decorin is, uh, uh, is significantly increased in the tissues of the plant Uh, of the uh, placenta you can see uh, under uh, so this is this is uh, the fluorescent microscope under the fluorescent microscope so you see that if you compare with the control group and then again we merge the both and then uh, there is a significant increase of decorin uh, in the uh, tissues also the wall will brand factor but there is a no significant Uh, difference between the control group and the uh, preeclamptic group. Not say that whether uh, this uh, uh, wall will brand factor is coming out and they are uh, uh, there isn't any significant change in the. Um, but uh, we have seen that there is a significant change in the plasma. So when we have taken uh, we compare with the uh, control group, the uh, control that is non-pregnant control group, pregnant control group, and also. the um, uh, preeclamptic group now again uh, we have seen the hemodynamics parameters and other uh, biology uh, uh, biochemical parameters you can see here that the nitric oxide is also uh, significantly decreased in preeclampsia so this is the main culprit who uh, which by which the nitric oxide plays a pivotal role uh, to all uh, these uh, pathways to uh, in to stimulates uh, the formation of uh, inflammatory by sterile inflammatory molecules to stimulate the hmgb1 and also you can see that um, there is a significant uh, change in the neutrophil lymphocyte uh, ratio that is the nlr ratio so this is also one of the marker of uh, uh, preeclampsia we are proposing that and uh, number of uh, public uh, uh, publications are there that there is a significant change in the uh, 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 neutrophil and the lymphocyte ratio other uh, uh, the effects are, are, are on the preeclampsia progression on the hemodynamics parameters you can see there is an uh, uh, systolic uh, change in the systolic blood pressure there is a change uh, in the diastolic uh, uh, blood pressure these are all the biochemical uh, uh, parameters you can see there is a uh, significant change in the blood urea serum creatinine alkaline phosphatase and uh, got gpt proteinuria 
you can see these are all the, uh, the these all parameters we have taken uh, from our uh, hospital record now the severity of preeclampsia on the basis of nlr ratio so the, uh, we can identify that on uh, the basis of this uh, nlr and neutrophil lymphocyte ratio these are normal mild preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia so we can uh, we can uh, we can distinguish uh, 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 as per the need to fill and the lymphocyte ratio change so the physiological objective is uh, that the fetal mortality rate is 10% neonatal mortality rate is 50% eclampsia superimposed preeclampsia is 20% and preterm delivery is uh, delivery uh, is uh, 80% this is our uh, record what uh, we have studied in our hospital so these are the uh, the mortality rate is uh, still it is 10% neonatal mortality uh, rate uh, is still 50% eclampsia super eclampsia so 20% and the preterm uh, delivery is there so this is the mechanism or uh, this is the schematic representation of the progression of the preeclampsia and the in clinical in clinical manifestation you know there is a poor spiral arteries remodeling a poor uh, supply of the oxygen then what happens there is a placental hypoxia then this, because of this placental hypoxia there is an increased oxidative stress decrease in enos then there if there is a placental hypoxia there is an increased dams there is a damage associated molecular patterns a release of damage associated molecular patterns then all these uh, they affects the biochemical and hemo uh, hematological parameters that is the increased alkaline phosphatase increased got gpt uh, uh, there is an increased proteinuria the increased nlr ratio so this uh, uh, work uh, is sponsored by the indian council of medical research and the grand challenge in canada our uh, acknowledgement is uh, the our collaborators are uh, professor gosul azam khan uh, dr miraj ahmed ansari Uh, Dr. Basul Azam Khan, he is now in PG, and Dr. Miraj Ahmed Ansari is in. Uh, he is working. He is a, a assistant professor working in the bio biotechnology uh, biotechnology department, Jamia Hamdard. And these are all my students. Uh, Homa Kasmi, who is working, uh, is working as a PhD scholar, and he is working all uh, in the pre eclampsia. Somia Bhagat, he is a postdoc fellow of uh, Grand Challenge Canada project. Neha Dehani is uh, also working in uh, some other projects, and the Seema Wajib is also working on uh, pre-eclampsia uh, projects. So, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Professor Iqbal. It was indeed a great lecture, in spite of your such a condition when you are organizing Secretary of Six Nation. sarf conference and you did it even to present the scientific presentation of your own and it is a great this thing i think that your work is very interesting i just request the chair persons to please take over the mic maybe uh, proceed sir yeah, is there anybody is there your person dr dr gulati is there i oh, ha we know dr kavita gulati uh thank you sir for the lecture ma'am is an associate professor in uh, pharmacology department at the vallabhbhai patel chest institute at university of delhi she has more than 22 years of teaching and research experience in clinical and experimental pharmacology and toxicology in different capacities in india as well as abroad she is the recipient of several national awards including the Achar uh, achari prize and the ubnas prize and the prestigious pro uh, professor b n ghosh oration of the I ips I request Dr. Kavita to please take over. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yeah, ma'am, okay. you are audible. Okay, I'll just share my screen. Uh, you cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Can you allow me to share the screen? Yes, yes. So uh, you'll have to stop your screen sharing. Uh, Dr. Iqbal. Dr. Iqbal. You just stop sharing screen. Yeah. <laughs> Ma'am, you can now share, yeah. uh, share your screen. Yes. It's visible, ma'am. Thank okay. you. 
So first of all, I'm uh, very thankful to Professor Iqbal Alam for giving me the opportunity to share some of my research work entitled Neural Insights into the Neuromodulatory Role of Nitric Oxide. And at the same time, I congratulate him also for holding such a wonderful conference. And uh, now I start with the presentation. So it is Neural Insights into the Neuromodulatory Role of Nitric Oxide. So as we are discussing about the nitric oxide, it is a simple ubiquitous diatomic molecule with complex actions. And we know that about just only three decades back, we were thinking that nitric oxide is just a environment pollutant, which is produced during the lightning and all these processes. But then we came to know that the mammalian cells can synthesize nitric oxide and it gave a great boost to the work, scientific work on the nitric oxide. And now it is discovered as the endothelium derived relaxing factor, which is a signaling molecule in almost central nervous system, cardiovascular system, and a weapon against infection. So it is almost involved in every function of the body. At neural level, it is uh, involved in regulation of olfaction, vision, memory, feeding, sexual behavior, etc. So we now know that it is a fundamental component of basal metabolism and cellular functions. But it promotes nerve growth and excess amount of NO can kill brain cells. So it has the dual actions and which depends on its diverse NO uh, transduction mechanisms. And now we know that we consider it as a uh, neurotransmitter because it fulfills most of the criteria to be a neurotransmitter. For example, it is synthesized in neurons from precursor l arginine by synthesizing enzyme like nitric oxide synthase enzyme. And we know that it is a very well regulated mechanism because synthesis of nitric oxide requires at least five cofactors at the same time to be present for the nitric oxide synthase to be active. It shows that how important it is to maintain the levels of nitric oxide at physiological concentration for the regulation of most of the action. So it has a transient action, second messenger mediated effects. We have the mimetics and the modulators to produce it effects. So it fulfills most of the criteria to be a neurotransmitter we have studied in our uh, bachelor degrees. So, but it has differences from the neurotransmitters. Some of the differences that it is not synthesized and not kept in the uh, presynaptic vesicles, which are released on the exocytosis. But it just, it is a gaseous molecule, which just diffuses out of the cells and affects the area in the vicinity, whether it is neuronal or the non-neuronal to affect the cellular physiological actions. So it has a multiple uh, target sites. It can direct with a heme in the active site of soluble guanine cyclase, which converts the GTP into cyclic GMP and which is responsible for most of the beneficial physiological effects of the nitric oxide. So further, it can regulate protein activity by S-nitrosylation of the cysteine group, which is responsible for regulating most of the functions of the cells like uh, apoptosis, cellular metabolism, membrane trafficking. So all these effects are regulated by S-nitrosylation of the cysteine group of proteins. Or the nitric oxide can react with superoxide. We know the free radicals are also very important in our body, but when excess of them is there, the superoxides are generated, which react with the nitric oxide to give peroxidite rate, which is responsible for the DNA damage and the lipid peroxidation and the cytotoxic effect of the drug. So depending upon the molecular targets, NO may be cytoprotective or cytotoxic in the CNS neurons. This is a simplified version of the NO, how it causes the cytotoxicity or the cytoprotection. When there's a stimulation of NMD receptor by the glutamate, there's calcium influx. And we know that the constitutive nitroxide synthase enzyme is dependent upon the calcium. As I said, that it needs five cofactors to be active. So by the calcium influx and the presence of these five cofactors, FMN, FED, calcium calmodulin, and uh, an DPH, L-arginine is oxidized to citrulline and the nitric oxide is generated. So this nitric oxide may give the negative in, uh, feedback for NMD receptor to stop more of the calcium and more of the synthesis of nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide produces its physiological effect by acting with the heme group of the guanine cyclase and converted 
GTP into cyclic MP and producing is vasodilatation or the smooth muscle relaxation or spacing things. But when excess of nitric oxide is there, it goes and combines with the superoxide radicals and produces the peroxynitrate, which is responsible for lipid peroxidation and the cytotoxicity. So this is the simplified version. So now in the present study, we will see the role of nitric oxide in anxiety and seizures. So these two are the closely related neurobehavior paradigms. And we have the clinical and the experimental data, which suggest that these are two are related. For example, the pharmacological evidence supports that the pantylene tetrazole in lower concentration, it is angiogenic, it induces the anxiety, but and in higher concentration, it precipitates the seizures. So dizepam similarly is a therapeutic agent, anti-anxiety uh, anti drug, and in, uh, in higher doses, it also uh, treats some of the epileptic seizures. So role of NO in this phenomena is not clearly defined, whether it is neuroprotective or neuroinhibitory. So in these two closely related behaviors, anxiety and seizures, the effect of the role of NO was evaluated. For this, we experimentally induce the model of anxiety by giving aminophylline in different concentrations or by giving restrained stress and keeping the animal in a restrainer and not allowing it to move that gives the emotional stress and induces the anxiety. We studied that and for seizures, we gave the very high doses of aminophylline and we induced the seizures. So these are the various parameters we used for studying uh, the effects. So this table shows the aminophylline and anxiogenesis. This is a model development. We gave the aminophylline in 10 and the 50 milligram per kg intraperitoneal injection daily for five days. And after the last injection, the anxiety state of the animal was observed in the EPM, elevated plus maze test. As the earlier speaker, Professor Ray has already mentioned that it is a widely used and well accepted model for studying the anxiogenesis state of the animal. It has the two open and the two closed arms. In this, the animal is exposed to a conflicting uh, situation, whether to explore the open arms, that is without the walls, or stay in the uh, closed arms. So the animal is placed in the middle square, and uh, it is observed for five minutes by anime software, by the video tracking system. And the number of entries in the open arms are recorded and it is expressed as percentage open arm entries. That means the number of entries in open arm divided by the total number of entries in open plus the closed arms. And similarly, the open arm time is calculated. So we see that the aminophylline 50 milligram per kg significantly reduce the number of entries in the open arm from 24 to 50. And similarly, the time spent in the open arm was also reduced, which is a clear cut evidence that the anxiety uh, has been induced by this drug. So this was the drug-induced anxiety and then the restrained stress by giving the emotional stress by physically restraining the animal for one hour in, at room temperature in a restrainer. And then after that, uh, doing the EPM test. It also shows that restrained stress induced the anxiety as evident from reduced number of entries in the uh, EPM and the less time spent on the open arm. So we did the lower doses also, but it was not that uh, significantly inducing. And we combined the uh, sub-effective uh, doses of aminophylline plus uh, restrained stress, which again induced a significant neurobehavior suppression uh, as evident from the OE and the open arm time. So we then selected the aminophylline 15 and RS for further experimentation to evaluate the role of nitric oxide in anxiogenesis induced by emotional stress or by the drug-induced stress. So this table shows the effect of L-arginine, that is a, a precursor of the nitric oxide. When recent stress reduced the number of open arm entries and the open arm time, L-arginine reverted this behavior. That is a five days administration in a dose-dependent manner affected. That was a neurobehavior suppression was reduced. And again, the number of entries in the open arm and the time spent was increased from 1.2 to 13 and 15.9. So an LM, which is the inhibitor, general inhibitor of the nitric oxide synthase enzyme and the 7NI, the relatively specific inhibitor of neuronal, uh, neuronal nitric oxide synthase, they further aggravated the condition that is further produce a, uh, uh, increase the neurobehavior suppression and reduce the entries. After exposing the animals to in the EPM test, the animals were 
sacrificed, decapitated, brain were removed, and the brain homogenates were prepared for estimation of the brain NOx level. That is the because nitroxide is a transient act, acting molecule. So we measured the stable metabolites of nitric oxide, and we show, uh, observed that recent stress, which produced a neurobehavior suppression, was accompanied with reduction in the level of the brain NOx enzymes and L-arginine, which uh, reduce the neurobehavior suppression to RS, also increase the levels of nitric oxide. Thus, this slide shows that nitric oxide plays a role in the anxiogenic response to the restrained stress-induced anxiety. This is the simplified expression of the last uh, table, that restrained stress reduced the open arm entries as well as the brain NOx level. And when l was given along with the restrained stress, there was improved meant in the open arm exploration by the animal as well as the brain nox were increased and the opposite results were observed by the LNM. So in a, another model that is the drug induced aminophylline seizures, the similar kind of results were observed that aminophylline 50 reduced the number of open arm entries, reduced the number of the time spent on the open arm and was accompanied with reduced brain NOx levels. And L-arginine administration reverted these changes. And so in both the models, that is the drug-induced model, the aminophylline, as well as the restrained strains-induced model, we studied that uh, the drugs, uh, uh, we studied that nitric oxide was playing an important role in, uh, in mediating the exogenic responses of these drugs. And then we studied the, the, what is the interaction between the what is happening between the reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species during the exogenic response because free radical play a crucial role in health and disease and uh, whenever there is disruption between the balance between pro-oxidant and antioxidant the, uh, there is increase in the free radicals which are involved in the stress-induced responses so from earlier studies and as the dr ray has also shown that during the stress antioxidants we have tried uh, like uh, tocopherol vitamin c melatonin it uh, affected the free radicals and affected the stress responses so how the rns reactive nitrogen species and reactive oxygen species are interacting during exogenic response was studied so this slide shows the amino filing 50 million per kg, which induce the anxiety by reducing the open arm entries. At the same time, in the brain homogenate, we observed that there was increased level of myelin dihydride, which is a marker of the lipid peroxidation. That is, the free radicals were elevated at that time. There was reduced glutathione levels at that time, and the nitric oxide, the metabolites of nitric oxides were also reduced, and which were. Uh, brought back to near control values when L-arginine was administered prior to the aminophylline 50 mg per kg and their balance between the pro-oxidants and the antioxidant was maintained by the administration of L-arginine which was uh, accompanied with the elevation in the levels of the brain NOx levels. Similar were the results with ISDN that is the nitroxide releaser and ascorbic acid also reduced the MDA levels, increased the reduced glutathione and also increase the NOx level. So we see that when the nitric oxide levels are going up, there is reduction in the MDA levels and increase in the reduced glutathione, suggesting that nitric oxide plays a role as an antioxidant and it is uh, providing the protection against the anxiogenic responses of the aminophilin. So they are going hand in hand, that is antioxidants and the precursor of the L-arginine or the enomimetics to reduce the angiogenesis in response to the drugs or the uh, released in stress. This is the same uh, simplification of the last table. So we can summarize that NO precursors attenuated aminophylline induced behavior effects in the EPM test. The allergic agent induced behavior changes were closely paralleled by brain NOx and oxidative stress markers. And NO and antioxidants act as anti-stress, anti-anxiety agents, and they complement each other, and they work in hand in hand in providing the anti-anxiety effect. So now comes the second behavior paradigm, that is the seizures. As we said, that they are closely related, they are closely uh, regulated by the structures, limbic structure, that is hippocampus, amygdala, and hypothalamus. So the role of free radicals in seizures has been suggested. 
and seizures are also associated with increased cerebral blood flow. And there have been evidence that nitric oxide and nitric oxide synthase enzymes are present in the limbic areas, in the areas which are associated with the regulation of seizures. So uh, data with NO modulators, how do they affect the seizure is equivocal because we have both kind of results that some studies say that they are the endogenous anticonvulsant drugs. On the other hand, there are several reports which say that they increase the uh, cocaine induced convulsions. So both kind of results are there. There are several uh, dioxide inhibitors which are known to produce the seizures and in several conditions, in some of the species, they are the protective. So the data is equivocal about its role in the seizures. So we induce a model of conversions by giving various doses of aminophylline, and then we selected the aminophylline 250 milligram per kg uh, for uh, inducing the seizures, uh, incidence of seizures. The drug was administered and the, all the mice were kept individually in perspex cages and they were observed for one hour for clonic, tonic, clonic, clonic conversions. And after one hour, during the one hour, what was the mortality? So it was observed that the 250 milligram per kg produced incidence of conversion in 100% of the animals with 90% mortality. For this uh, dose was standardized for doing the further experimentation with the anomodulators. So we see that when uh, surprisingly, when in this condition, L name was given in a dose dependent manner, it reduced the incidence of uh, induction of the clonic and seizures, as well as it reduced the post ictal mortality. So these results were just opposite to that which we observed in anxiety, where LNIM was further aggravating the situation. But in this case, LNIM blocked the uh, incidence of seizures as well as the mortality. Similar was the case with the neuronal NOS inhibitor 7 nitroindazole. So we uh, th this observation, this hypothesis was strengthened by the modulation by the uh, nitroxide precursor, L-arginine, and the GTN glycerotrinitrate, that is the release of nitroxide, which when we were given with the sub-convulsive doses of aminophylate, induce the conversions, they increase the incidence of clonic, clonic, clonic uh, conversions, and increase the mortality. So thus suggesting, this is the just simplification of this finding, that is when the nitroxide inhibitor, synthesis inhibitor were given, there was a reduction in the incidence as well as the no mortality at all with the LM30. This is the sub-effective dose. And similarly, 7NI, it also significantly reduced the incidence of seizure as well as the mortality. This is the sub conversive dose of aminophylline. When it was given along with L-arginine, it increased the conversions as well as the mortality in response to the lower doses aminophylline, thus suggesting here again the nitroxide may be probably playing an important role, but the uh, effects are opposite to that seen with the anxiety, where the LM was aggravating the conditions and the L-arginine was providing protection against the anxiety. So then we studied the uh, to how do the ROS and RNS are interacting during that period. We studied the LM, which was effective in reducing the conversions, was also, uh, with aminophilin 250, there was very much high levels of uh, uh, metabolites of nitroxide were observed and there was increase in the lipid peroxidation also. So LM, which reverted the condition of the seizogenic effect of the aminophylline was accompanied with reduction in the level of NOx and the MDA. Melatonin, which is a very important uh, antioxidant released from the pineal gland, it plays an important role in scavenging the hydroxide radical, peroxide radical, and it also increases the levels of antioxidants, superoxide dismutase, catalase. So it, it is a very important antioxidant present in the body. So it also reduced the aminophylline 250 seizures to about 50% of incidence, which was accompanied with reduction in the le level of NOx and reduction in the MDA. So when the sub-effective dose of melatonin was combined with LNAM, there was significant reduction in incidence and improvement in the NOx and the MDA levels. So this again suggests here the melatonin and LNAM were producing the complementary effects, suggesting that in this condition, in increasing the level of NOx is producing the pro-oxidant kind of effect. So in lower doses, when it was playing a role as an antioxidant, in seizures, we see that it is playing a role as a pro-oxidant. 
this is the simplified version the expression of the last uh, uh, last uh, table that melatonin is reducing the incidence as well as the mortality and when these two are combined there was a significant improvement in the mortality observed in response to the uh, amino phalanxes so we have uh, uh, confirmed this finding in another model also in that is the pro convalescent effect of aminophylin because we know that aminophylin uh, theophyll which is a water soluble sort of theophyllin which is given methylxanthine given in the patients of bronchial asthma always uh, because it is a low therapeutic index drug there is a, always a chance yeah. of precipitation of <clears throat> sorry madam madam sorry yeah yeah time is up now you please yeah, conclude that we are Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank I just you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, in this model, again, the similar kind of results were observed as observed in the convalescent effect of the amino fibrin. So, we I can summarize. We can summarize that anosynthase inhibitors antagonize amino fibrin seizures, whereas anomyometrics potentiated them. Amino fibrin seizures were associated with elevations in brain NOx and MD levels. And combined pre-treatment with LNM and melatonin showed synergistic effects in attenuating the seizures and the brain tox levels. So we can conclude that NO may act as a neuroprotective or neurotoxic in different experimental situations of seizures and anxiety. And the differential NO involvement is in these neurobehavior paradigms can be explained by different mechanisms. That is the stimulation of constitutive nitroxide synthase versus the inducible nitroxide synthase. Or the differential ROS RNS interaction may be responsible for these effects because in one condition the nitric oxide is acting as antioxidant and in another condition it is producing effects as a prooxidant. So NO could act as an endogenous neuroregulator and a target molecule for drug development in areas of anxiety and epilepsy. I'm very uh, thankful to Professor A. Ray who was the head of the Department of Pharmacology and uh, VPCI in the De University of Delhi. Seema Anand, who uh, did the thesis, or she did her MD thesis on the work, which uh, showed a seizurogenic effect and the nitric oxide. Ainav Chakravarti did his PhD on the work of the restraint stress and the uh, nitric oxide role. And this work was uh, supported by the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, New Delhi, the seizurogenic effect and role of NO. And the anxiety in NO was supported by, the funding was by the Department of Science and Technology. So thank you so much. So at last, I will just like highlight uh, one thing that uh, what we know today about the nitric oxide is just the tip of the iceberg. Lot needs to be explored that how the nitric oxide's level has to be maintained at an optimal level. When the levels are reduced, it leads to one kind of the uh, disorders, like the anxiety. And when the levels go above the normal optimal level, it induces the seizures. So a balance has to be maintained. And we know that uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, they interact in a complex manner to maintain that uh, homeostasis. And any disturbance in this balance results in biochemical and cellular changes when due various pathophysiological conditions. So a lot needs to be done about that. And it can be a therapeutic molecule, target molecule for developing the drugs for these disorders. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Thank, thank, thank so you, much. Professor Gulati. Thank you, Professor Gulati. I think that because of the shortage of time, we are running nearly 40 people. Yes, I can understand. Thank yeah, you. we have a lot of questions. Actually, I request others to please put in the chat box and organize it to please forward it to the madam. It is an excellent sure, talk. Sir. Sure, no sir. doubt about that. Yeah, over to uh, over to organizing committee. Okay. Thank you to the uh, ch chairpersons for chairing this session. And thank you, ma'am, for the enlightening talk. We move on to our last session, which is dedicated to the neurosciences. I uh, call upon the chairpersons, Dr. Suman Jain, who's professor at the Department of Physiology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She's the recipient of the AIMS Research Excellence Award and has her expertise in the areas of neurophysiology, synaptic plasticity, and neuroregeneration. Her, also, uh, in, her interests also lie in use of nanotechnology in rat model, and finally, its application in human diseases such as spinal cord injury and Parkinson's. A very warm welcome, ma'am. Our next chairperson is Dr. Sohail Parvez, Professor and Head, Department of Toxicology, School of Chemical and Life Sciences, Jamia Hamdard, 
His area uh, area of expertise is uh, mitochondria as a target for neuroprotection, cellular and molecular molecular mechanisms of neuro degenerative disorders, and alternate models of neurotoxicology. Very a very warm welcome, sir. Of uh, uh, Professor Minakshi Chaswal, our uh, chairperson for this session, director, professor, and head. at the abv ims and rml hospital department of physiology her interests lie in cardiovascular and autonomic functions a very warm welcome ma'am our final chairperson for this session is dr prasoon priya nayak additional professor at aims jodhpur with a special interest in oxidative stress physiology and he also pioneered the work on aluminium toxicity in india a very a warm welcome to the panel of chairpersons uh with the permission of the chairperson i would like to invite our last keynote address speaker for the day a professor chai hun lim president of the federation of the asian and oceanic physiological societies he has more than 30 years of experience in the area of cardiovascular physiology mitochondrial energetics and the physio i welcome uh, dr chai <clears throat> hello everyone yes yes thank you professor kim thank you thank you very much yeah you are nice audible to... you are audible it's nice to see you again today <laughs> okay yes professor lee okay. you can, can share I... yes you can share okay thank you <clears throat> Okay, could you see the screen? Yes. Okay, absolutely cool. fine. Nice. Absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you, the, the the organizing committee, to invite me to these uh, special occasions. Uh, actually, uh, uh, the the request for my presentation is uh, related to the, the your. major topics and then the one of the keyword is the, the medical engineering device and then the other one is the, the physiology for betterment of life so i think the, the topics of mine is to choose the, the physiology into people's life so this is not the, the actual like the, the research uh, presentations it's uh, just uh, the, the general physiology application for the, the society which i think continuously so just uh, i hope you will just enjoy the contents so basically sorry yes so this topic is is just a uh, three Same is one is the physiology based based the, the public health care, the second one is the physiology based the medical device development, and the third one is the, the human uh, digital twin. Actually, these all topics are interconnected. And other start to the the the, the holistic health care. I think the, the all of the country is uh, is uh, talking about the, the health care. But basically, so if you think about it as a care, there is a it's a very vague concept. So the concept of personal health care is not very clear and very broad. Actually, it's support the prevention for disease, or this is the better care for disease, or it's a better life care for the, the just the ordinary people, or the, the better understanding in their own body. So did all these four category is a completely different area. So, so which health care do you mean? Everybody talking about the health care, but basically the the concept of health care might be different to each other. So, the terms of health care can be used in all aspects of human life. So I'm actually I think about the, the physiology based the public health care, and then. One of the this uh, definition I make is not for the disease prevention or disease care. Actually, this is for the help the people to manage their life in a better state by understanding their own body based on the, the physiological system. So eventually, maintain the better life without the disease. So 
various indices for the physiological analysis should be obtained is very easily. So that's why the, the general people can apply their physiological state uh, to see the what is the, their body conditions. And then these devices for that should be very cheap, integrative, and easily accessible. And then if this, this kind of uh, the physiology based public health care is uh, my, the, the market's open to the new market, and then the size of the market cannot be imaginable. But basically, healthcare at this moment is a little focused on the, the clinical side, not the, the for general people's concern. For example, like the, 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 the temperature regulations or the, the air conditioning or the, the exercise or the general diet, or the, the, if they put in a certain environment, what is the, the body conditions can be. So this sort of information is not either linked to the, the clinical status. It's a, just a help to understand their physiological condition in their ordinary life. So basically the medicine, at this our the medical knowledge for public health care is a very difficult because the, the medical medicine is a too focused on the disease. Actually, it's a greatly developed in treatment plan for known disease. And then diagnostic criteria is uh, very quite clear, but only used for separating the disease and the health, if, health conditions efficiently. And the many indices are created on an average based cross-sectional measurement and then define the certain threshold like the, the normal the, the blood pressure is the, the systolic pressure is 120 and then the pressure under 80. Like the, the, the kind of threshold, they define the, the disease condition and the health conditions. And another problem is the, the longitudinal indices. It's, a, it's a, for example, the, the light, lifetime measurement of their certain indices are not used because of their haven't developed as a, medi as a medical knowledge. <coughs> And the most devices used in clinical field are very expensive and they also require the specialist and then which is the, the actual ordinary people cannot access this kind of uh, data very easily. And then also the, the clinical field is to not consider the individual differences, sometimes even sex. So basically this kind of indices only efficiently uh, divide the, the disease and then the disease conditions and the health conditions. So it's, it's a, it cannot be used in for general public health. And then also, sorry. <laughs> I request, I request everyone. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. It says speaker, everyone please mute. Please yeah, so mute everyone. it. Yep, I request, I humbly request, please mute your mic, please. Allow Professor Lim to speak. Oh, sorry, okay. can you? Okay, Professor, okay, Professor, you carry on. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we are hearing you. Yes. Okay. I I sorry. I have a, a, this slide is for the, the uh, prepare for the, the certain uh, the, the the see the 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 slide for the, the make the, the video. So there is a, some recorded conditions. I am sorry. I didn't test it properly. Uh, okay. So basically. The, the the to make the developed medical device and the medical knowledge is the, the basically it's a new devices are required to find to new medical knowledge in, in relate to the, the biosignals. So physiological understanding of body functions is maybe very helpful to find the medical device. So to, to develop the new medical device field is very difficult because of the strict regulations. And then 
actually in the clinical field, if you imagine actually two pure physiological indices are used and then those are used only for diagnosis, not for understanding individual physiology. So developing a new medical physiology with a new device takes a very long time because of the validations. And then personal difference are not considered. There is the, the individualized longitudinal changes cannot be despised because they are never studied properly. And also the, the human body is consist of various of physiological system. So system-based understanding of a human body have never been tried to use in a clinical field. It takes a time and money, however, but if it once developed, it could be huge success like a new drug development. So basically, if someone wants to make the, the develop a new device, and then actually this device should be based on the, the certain physiological uh, indices, which should have some meaning for the, the body functions. But the, the basically the kind of knowledge is not established, established properly. So it's, uh, it's uh, difficult. Sorry. So what should be sought for developing the medical device based on the biosignals? For example, I'd like to make some example, blood pressure measurement device. Uh, so if you think about the blood pressure here, Actually, blood pressure is a consist of the, the cardiac output multiplied the peripheral vascular resistance. And then cardiac output is consist of stroke volume and the heart rate. But, but if you look at these five factors, you can only check in the ordinary people can check a heart rate and then using the simple device or uh, you can measure the blood pressure. But if, if we know the unknown factor or stroke volume or cardiac output or total vehicle resistance, actually you can know the, the, all these five variables. So, so this kind of thing, if you know the, the, the other variable related to, for example, cardiac output, and then you can ex expand this kind of physiological indices to find another useful physiological indices. Uh, if you think about the, the blood pressure, basically blood pressure, how we define the blood, blood pressure is a normal or is the, the disease conditions. First, we need to know the, 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 the blood pressure is a, some kind of physical meaning, which is the, the hypertension, problem hypertension or sports renal is the mid 19th century. And then Hypertension, now what we need is, uh, is uh, we need a device to measure the, the blood pressure. So actually this copper-based spigonomanometer was invented in 1896. And then 1905, Nikolai Kolkop improved the technique with Kolkop sounds uh, in the measurement. So basically, if we want to see the, the blood pressure is the, the is on top of have the, the looks like uh, it might have the, the clinical meaning. And then if we want to know the clearly, you need a device to measurement the device. And then this thing is the, the now completely established after the premium heart study, which is the, the end of twenties. So until, then there's a, there is a, some blood pressure meaning, and then there's a measurement device, but actually it's established by the primary heart study to show what is the, the normal blood pressure range, what is the, the, the high blood pressure, what is the, the seriously high blood pressure. That also of the, the definition is the, the drive from this study. So it's a, actually, if we look at the, these procedures, uh, actually, to develop the, some indices in the physiological indices in the, the for the healthcare or clinical side, 
it's not very easy work. So this uh, actually uh, very uh, prevent to develop a new medical device. So basically to become a new, the, the med clinical medical device is uh, first, we need to know what is the, the BP, cognitive basic physiology. And the second one is to find the medical problems related to the BP, it's a hypertension. And then we need a proper measurement device to get relative accurate values. So we first speak on manometers. And then finally, we set the meaning of measurement value. This, uh, this is the, uh, we should use the, the some quarter study like uh, prim, prim on heart study. So basically all this procedure is the, the sort of the, the barrier, but this final four stage is the real barrier for you medical device or a biomarker. So we, with this kind of things, basically we, at the current state, we cannot imagine to develop some sort of the, the new medical device. So they based on the, the physical indices. It's very, very difficult. Sorry. So basically the process of the, the developing of the, the device, first the, the human body have a physiological system. And then we have the, the various candidate of some biosignal seems to have the, some meaning. And then we have to develop some device and then we check this device whether this is the, the useful for the, the uh, general health care. And then it creates new medical knowledge. And then if it pass, and then we finally get the, the new biosignal and the new device. So this is the, just the same as the, 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 the new drug development. So, but the from the, the for develop new, new bio, New, new signals, your biological, physiological based signals, we need to understand the, the physiological system and then what kind of indices might be useful to, to use in the, 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 the some healthcare or some disease con, uh, to develop those new medical knowledge. So it's a very difficult process, but basically without the understanding of a human body, it's, an, it's impossible to do. So I make the, 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 the actually I am the, the cardiac electrophysiologist. So I working on the, 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 the cardiac cells using the patch clamp system to record the certain cellular ionic currents. But the, the, I have a chance to participate the, the human-based study from 2009. And then after I get the, the, some data get the, some human data. And then I found that there is a many chance, really broad area is still open in this area. So, and then I have uh, some kind of uh, in the idea uh, on this the, the human-based study. So, Firstly, the, we, in this is for the circulations. Basically, previously I did, uh, mentioned that the, the, in for the circulatory uh, system, we only measure the, the heart rate and the blood pressure. So, but if you know the, the cardiac output or the, the vascular resistance, actually this, in this, we, if we measure this one, actually we can open did another area to did understanding the human body. So basically heart rate and then arterial pressure is measured. Hypertension is a national problem. So textbook is, you know that the blood pressure is a cardiac output multiple vascular distance. But we know that the, the normal blood pressure is a, 120 to 80 millimeter mercury. However, if we think about these conditions, 
So blood pressure is a one, mean blood pressure 100 millimeter mercury. Cardiac output is a four liter per minute. In this case, total peripheral resistance is a 25 millimeter mercury minute per liter. So if this blood pressure go to 116 millimeter mercury with the same cardiac output, now total peripheral resistance increase 40 millimeter mercury. However, if you think about this case, blood pressure is now 100 millimeter mercury, cardiac output is eight liter per minute. And then in this case, total peripheral resistance is only 12.5 millimeter mercury minute per liter. If you increase blood pressure with the same cardiac output, now total peripheral resistance are 20 millimeter mercury minute per liter. So is this condition is uh, abnormal or normal? It's, a, it's very difficult to say. And then the, when I measure the cardiac output, actually the range of cardiac output is a, it's a from the, the about 2.5 liters to the, the more than eight liters. There's a huge range of cardiac output in the resting conditions. So basically in this, uh, we deal the, these people in the same conditions, only we measure the blood pressure. And then based on blood pressure, we say that this is a hypertension or not. So actually, even though this, this, this person have the high blood pressure, but basically their total vertical resistance is only 20 millimeter mercury meter per liter. So basically these persons, the, the, maybe they have uh, cardiac problems, but the, the, they might not have the, the, some vascular problem in the other systemic uh, body. So also the, the blood pressure measurement is not part of the standard protocol structure. So basically we know that if we want to measure blood pressure, for a five minute rest and then measure once and then another five minute rest and the second measure. And then actually you repeat it three times and they have a mean blood pressure. But actually in hospital, the kind of blood pressure amount is never happened. So that's why the, the hypertension measurement in this is blood pressure is a very poor indices to circulation. And then another point, if you know the cardiac output or peripheral vascular resistance with the other variable can be automatically obtained. If you know the cardiac output and then you can drive the stroke volume and then total peripheral resistance. But if you know the total peripheral resistance, you know the cardiac output and the stroke volume. So it's a proper measurement of a cardiac output for public health is not developed yet. So high blood pressure is high peripheral vascular resistance is generally connected to arteriosclerosis, causing the coronary vascular disease or stroke. So proper measurement device of peripheral resistance for the public health is not developed either. So people understand of their own very basic circuitry function is at this moment is very poor. So because of the lack of device and then proper analysis. So they only know the blood pressure and the heart rate, they, they under these conditions, the, the only they connect to the hypertension and then that's the, the control uh, indices at this moment. And then based on the, the, our study, e, whether the, 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 the arteriosclerosis is, uh, is, can, is, is the, can be measured. Basically arteriosclerosis is the, the best measured using the the, uh, the pulse wave uh, velocity. The pulse wave velocity is the, the theoretically very solid. However, it's a velocity terms. However, you can you have to measure the distance and then time. The time measurement is very correct, very accurate. But distance measurement on in your body actually is a very inaccurate. So that's why the pulse wave, pulse wave velocity is a theoretically is a very solid, but actual value of pulse wave velocity is very poor. When then we happen to develop the pulse wave transit time ratio, and then this is the, the pulse wave transit time through the peripheral artery from carotid to radial. 
and then divide this time to perseverance time through central artery from carotid to femoral, and then we this is first time first transit time ratio, and then we and this perseverance transit time ratio we carotid radial perseverance time and the carotid femoral transit time we have this uh, ratio, and then we found this value is some um, superior than the, the carotid femoral perceivable velocity. And then this is the, the base study. And then we, if we show this one, this is the, the RC curve of the RC curve. And then this blank line is the, the uh, carotid femoral perceivable velocity. And then this is new in this is, it's a superior value compared to the, the uh, perceivable velocity. So this new in this is, is a very useful for the, the determined arteriosclerosis. And then we tested in the, the around the 300 people uh, with the, the stroke and coronary uh, vascular disease and then normal compared to the other indices. And then these indices- uh, My is, sincere apologies for interrupting, sir. Uh, but Dr. Adil Helmi is uh, waiting for his talk and uh, he's having um, uh, emergency that he has to uh, perform a surgery. So he's waiting for it. So can you please wind up? Uh, uh, okay, I see. So sorry. Five minutes. Uh, so it takes quite a long time. So, so okay. So I. So basically, the point I would like to make is that uh, we need to develop new indices for the. the uh, healthcare to expand the, the present medical knowledge more widely. And then the, the, I shortly mentioned about the, the digital twin and this the, the digital twin is the technology of making twins of real things on a computer and the predicting results in advance by simulating real world situation on a computer. And then this uh, example of a digital twin and this uh, this is the this, this is a real airplane. This is an individual data twin. Basically, there is a communication of the, the data and the prediction of the, the digital twin to the, the uh, manufacturer of a plane. So all of this digital twin is uh, actually really uh, mirrored of the real condition and then find the problems or is the best options to make a better product. And then this concept can be expanded to the, the medical device. And then also it expands to the human digital twin. So all of this uh, biological information data based, uh, based on the, the human model make a digital twin. And then we can use this kind of digital twin to diagnose from this therapy optimization in the clinical side. Also the individualized, they can maintain the, the ordinary uh, healthcare. So this, uh, this, uh, this human digital twin, we can, uh, you need to apply the, the machine learning of multi-scale modeling. This uh, basically multi-scale modeling is a causal relationship based on the, the model. And the machine learning is the, the, actually our data is there, but actually we, we, it's very difficult to make the, the causal relationship to find some relationship between the data. And then we need to these two approaches is necessary to develop the, the human digital twin. And then also we know the, the very many kind of wearable device for smart health care. And then all of this kind of data is the, the, to show the, the physical indices. But, but unfortunately, this all sort of data is always linked to the, the clinical data. So the, the, for the ordinary life people, there's a, we need more uh, data can be obtained, need to be obtained. So I'd like to summary, summarize. Yeah. So 
I will just make a very brief summary is the, the developing new medical knowledge and the develop a new medical device come along together. It takes a long time, but if you success and if you success like new drug, develop the, the new biological signal based medical device and the visual knowledge and the supporting device are need necessary. So it's mostly good strategy to start with a device for the public health care to develop a future medical device. And the human body is a physiological system. So human digital twin approach will greatly help the personalized healthcare. So physiology is not existed only in textbook and it shouldn't be a conceptual knowledge. So imagination from physiology can be real with a new technology. So I would like to say the, we have to physiology into people's life and then to develop did a many kind of uh, medical knowledge based on the physiology, not did a just the clinical side, just the, just for the, the general public healthcare. So this is uh, my final slide. Sorry, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lim. Thank you very much for unique and very innovative uh, thought. And really it is important for the medical education for such a type of applied which is very innovative and unique in their own way. I, because of shortage of time, I think that we could not go for the question answer. I request the organizer to please proceed the final. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the wonderful talk. With the permission of the chairpersons, I would like to request our next speaker, Dr. Adele Helmi. Dr. Helmi is a university lecturer at the University of Cambridge and an on. Uh, uh, is it okay with Dr. Eric if it, uh, Dr. Adele proceeds first? He needed to leave for a surgery. We did, I think, put it in the chat box, he said. Yes, yes that's what I also seen. Uh, he requested, but the response has not come. To me, it doesn't matter. If yeah, Adele yeah. wants to speak first, it's fine by me. Okay, it's okay for him. Thank okay, you. Fine. Thank you fine. so much. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Adele, help me. Dr. Helmi is a university lecturer at the University of Cambridge and an honorary neurosurgical consultant at the Cambridge University Hospitals NHS Trust. He combines an active neurosurgical clinical practice with a research portfolio focusing on acute brain injury and neuroinflammation in particular. I now request Dr. Adele to please take over. Thank you. Hi, good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be speaking to you today. Uh, thanks very much for the kind invitation and the introduction. Um, so as you've just heard, I, I work as a consultant neurosurgeon in Cambridge in the UK. Uh, and what I'll be presenting is uh, some work uh, that we've done partly in Cambridge, but also an overview of uh, clinical studies of neuroinflammation in traumatic brain injury or head injury. I'm very mindful that I'm talking to a, a basic science cohort largely, I uh, have enormous experience in the basic sciences and really the idea of this talk is to give you an outline of how this might feed into uh, translational clinical research. So I'll just start by talking about traumatic brain injury in general, something about inflammation, the sort of study methodology that we have available to us in the clinical setting, uh, and then talk about some of the clinical studies and evidence for the role of neuroinflammation uh, in head injury. So this is the uh, sort of chain of treatment that we see uh, with traumatic brain injury, starting with serious accidents such as road traffic accidents, emergency services, taking patients to the operating theatre, management within the critical care setting, rehabilitation, and then finally getting patients home. And traumatic brain injury is a, is a common uh, cause of both morbidity and mortality, uh, commonest cause of death under the age of 40 years, uh, I think worldwide. Uh, sorry, in the first world and uh, in low middle income countries, it has a, an even higher burden uh, of morbidity, mortality, and socioeconomic consequence. And this is normally the way that we have thought about uh, traumatic brain injury in the past, uh, which is uh, to think of the primary insult causing brain swelling. This can cause raised pressure within the head, decrease the blood flow that's able to get to the brain, reduce the ability of oxygen to get to the brain. This leads to energy failure, and then that can cause further injury or brain swelling. And in the neurointensive care setting, we've developed a, a range of monitors in order to address these various issues, uh, including intracranial pressure, cerebral blood flow, oxygen delivery, uh, and also energy failure. And one of the ones that I'll talk uh, about later is microdialysis, a technique for 
measuring uh, inflam in, sorry, inflammatory but also metabolic mediators within the brain. This is the setup that we have within the neurointensive care unit for treating brain injury patients. So in the patient with brain injury, we can insert a number of monitors directly into the brain substance, including intracranial pressure monitors, brain tissue oxygen monitors, and, and microanalysis. this technique for sampling brain extracellular fluid. We can use these various signals to derive uh, various physiological parameters, such as muscle regulation in the scenes, and we use these to, to guide our management uh, of the patient. And obviously this setup gives us enormous opportunity for research uh, and to uh, tell us something about the mechanisms and pathology that underlie traumatic brain injury. Just moving on to inflammation. What is inflammation? Uh, and I like to think of inflammation as the endogenous response to injury. And when you think about it this way, then you can see that inflammation is uh, part of every pathology. We can think of inflammation in terms of cellular components versus humoral components, soluble components, acute versus chronic inflammation. We can look at different biological compartments and we can look at different phases of the uh, immune system, either innate or adaptive immunity. This is a little cartoon which gives you an idea of the sequence of events that follows a traumatic brain injury from release of disease-associated molecular patterns causing activation of uh, resident cells within the brain, astrocytes and microglia, which in turn set off a chain of inflammatory mediators with uh, release into the brain extracellular space and also into the peripheral circulation, recruiting a sequence of inflammatory cells. And many of the consequences of head injury and traumatic brain injury have been related to specific mediators, suggesting a, a mechanistic role for these, uh, for these processes. So I've got a number of slides on the various study methodologies um, that we can use in human patients in order to look for cytokine and chemokine expression or to look for inflammatory responses following head injury. And probably given the short time that we have, I'll probably just give you an indicative idea um, of studies that have looked at these various parameters. But in general terms, we can biopsy biological fluids, plasma, blood, cerebrospinal fluid and microtalysates. We can look at direct tissue sampling, either at the time of uh, uh, operation or for post-mortem tissue. We can look at advanced imaging parameters, such as positive transmission tomography. We can look for aspects of the adaptive immune system, uh, such as autoimmunization of peripheral immune cells and neural antigens. And then we can consider the long-term sequelae of inflammation in terms of the burden on the patient. Plasma is probably the most widely used biological sample. And there are a whole range of biomarkers that have been assessed in plasma and traumatic brain injury. And we can see that in those patients who uh, die following head injury, they have high levels of these cytokines and chemokines. A more sophisticated analysis, uh, such as done in this paper by Kumar, an American group working in MD Magnus Lab, uh, they were able to look at a range of cytokines and demonstrate that the pattern of cytokine uh, changes in subacute serum in relation to the outcome he imagined using the Glasgow Outcome Score. Cerebrospinal fluid is a, another easily accessible biological uh, fluid, which is closer to the brain and is probably a global average of the brain inflammatory states. And similarly, a range of um, biomarkers and the inflammatory mediators can be measured. This is uh, an example of measuring mitochondrial DNA, which is a, a probable disease associated molecular pattern that sets off the chain of innate inflammation. Uh, and we can see here again on the x-axis, the Glasgow outcome score, which is an outcome metric. And we can see that for patients who do worse or die from brain injury, they have high levels of these disease associated molecular patterns. Uh, another way of looking through cerebrospinal fluid is to uh, look at a range of cytokines and chemokines. And one can use multivariate methods, such as principal component analysis, to demonstrate that uh, there are distinct clusters of cytokines and chemokines which can be associated with outcome. Just move through this uh, quickly. Moving on to microanalysis, this is a technique that we have some experience of, and uh, a lot of my research has been done in microanalysis. The microanalysis catheter, if you're not familiar with it, is a semi permeable membrane uh, attached to a dual lumen tube where fluid is pumped down the membrane, exposed to the brain extracellular fluid, allowing bidirectional diffusion of substances into the catheter, and then the fluid is collected once more and can be analyzed offline. This is what it looks like in practice, dual lumen tube. Uh, we place it within the brain substance. This is the sort of access device that we use to insert into our patients. Uh, and this is a scanning electron micrograph of the semi-permeable membrane showing the sponge-like 
uh, characteristics of it. And what we've been able to demonstrate is that using this microanalysis technique, we can look at cytokine and chemokine expression uh, following uh, traumatic brain injury. And specifically, we can see that the concentration of these cytokines and chemokines is much higher in the brain than in, in plasma, uh, suggesting that this is a brain-derived response rather than passive leak through a leaky blood-brain barrier, but also um, that uh, there's a stereotype sequence of inflammatory mediators suggesting that this is uh, playing an important mechanistic role. We can use other multivariate techniques such as principal component analysis to demonstrate this. Uh, and these observations going from red, green, blue to yellow uh, are observations taken at different time points. So we can see again that there is this stereotype sequence of responses. Of course, having measured these uh, things through biological samples, it's important to demonstrate that these cytokines and chemokines are being uh, produced in the brain. And for that, we need tissue. Uh, and there are studies showing um, both mRNA and protein level that these cytokines and chemokines are being produced within the brain substance following traumatic brain injury. This is a post-mortem study demonstrating the same thing. I'm sorry to flip through the slides quickly, it's, uh, just, just to make sure that we try and stick to time. Of course, in vivo, one can use specific uh, ligands uh, using positron emission tomography. Uh, to demonstrate that these inflammatory mediators and cells are within the brain. And in particular, the TSPO ligands, that's translocated protein, um, which is a 16 kilodalton uh, protein found within um, the mitochondrial membrane. It's thought to be related to activating microglia. There are a number of ligands um, using PET that can be activated and attached to it. Uh, and these studies have really demonstrated that there's a, a microglial response, a recruitment of inflammatory cells to the brain uh, following traumatic brain injury. This is a paper which is quite old now, about 10 years old, but what was very interesting in this paper is they actually followed these patients out for a long time, up to 10 years and further, and they're able to show that following traumatic brain injury, there is this long-lasting uh, microglial activation, particularly within the deep nuclei around the thalamus. Um, and this suggests that some of the long-term sequelae following traumatic brain injury may be related to these inflammatory processes. Uh, which are very long lasting. This also introduces the, the concept of therapeutic window. If these processes are, are long lasting, then that provides ample opportunity to intervene in the clinical setting. This is a more modern study uh, done by the same group who were able to show using MR parameters that the degree of microglial activation is associated with white matter injury within the same areas. Uh, again, suggesting uh, that this is a mechanistic uh, pathophysiological process. As well as the innate inflammatory mediators that I've talked to, uh, talked about already, uh, there's also evidence of uh, adaptive immune responses following traumatic brain injury. Uh, these are studies looking at um, the uh, response of peripheral blood monocyte cells to uh, neural antigens, in this particular case, myelin, and demonstrating that following traumatic brain injury, there's an ultimate immunization response um, to neural antigens. And this is interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. It may be that um, this is just leak of antigens across a leaky blood brain barrier. Um, and these antigens are not normally surveyed by the peripheral immune system and therefore they're generating antibodies to it. Uh, but people have hypothesized more recently that this may have either a damaging or a protective role um, in traumatic brain injury. Certainly Michel Schwartz uh, from Israel has published a whole series of papers which are quite old now um, with this idea of protective autoimmunity, but this hasn't been uh, replicated uh, since then. And certainly now most authors would suggest that autoimmunizations to neural antigens may be playing a deleterious role in the long-term consequences of head injury. This is a study which was carried out in uh, American football players uh, looking at S100B, which we'll hear about uh, from Dr. Talim uh, very shortly. Uh, but they were also uh, able to demonstrate autoimmunization to S100B protein, uh, and they were able to correlate this with MR parameters, again, suggesting a potential link between these autoimmunization responses and the consequences of head injury. This is a similar study carried out with anti gfvp antibodies, and I'm sure, again, we'll be hearing about GFAP specifically from Dr. Talim shortly. When we talk about the chronic sequelae of inflammation, we're talking about things like post-traumatic epilepsy and depression. 
Uh, and there's already evidence that there's correlations between these long-term sequelae and the concentration of these inflammatory mediators uh, early on following head injury. This was a study looking at interleukin 1b and also the um, interleukin 1b gene in a particular SNP at this location, showing that it correlates with post traumatic epilepsy. Uh, another study, again done by the same group, looked at CSF cytokine -like levels for post traumatic depression. And again, certainly for depression, there is this um, increasing interest in it being an inflammatory disease. Uh, and certainly, this is something that can be treated, uh, can be triggered by traumatic brain injury. In terms of the limitations of these clinical studies, um, the, there are several uh, advantages of clinical studies, uh, in addition to the sort of mechanism of studies that you may be more familiar with in preclinical basic science studies. But we do need clinical studies to corroborate preclinical studies. Um, the clinical studies, there are a wide variety of techniques as I, as I've been able to show you. And certainly we can demonstrate correlations, but the problem is how do we translate these findings to a, a therapeutic intervention? And certainly interventional studies in humans are very expensive, they're challenging to fund, uh, they take a long time, and obviously there are ethical and regulatory barriers uh, to carrying out this sort of research. But the fundamental problem that we have is that although a wide variety of agents have been successful in animal models, when we come to translate our understanding to human models, translated to practice. Uh, a suggestion has been made as, as to why this might be this particular review of so I think we're just getting some interference from uh, another participant. So what we thought about is how we can use microdialysis in these drug studies uh, to assist us. There's a very famous quote about insanity, doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. It's usually attributed to Albert Einstein, but in terms of neuroprotection studies in, in humans, we've been doing this for about 30 years. We take an agent which has been useful in an animal model, and then we try and apply it to a human model without thinking about these various issues with translation, timing of drug delivery, complexity of blood brain barrier interactions and drug penetration, uh, thinking that the brain concentrations are sufficient to exert a biological effect, even though we don't measure them, but also the issue of whether there is a fundamental difference in mechanism of action between humans and, um, and animals. And we can divide these considerations up into pharmacokinetic considerations and biological considerations, and microdialysis can help us to address these issues. Uh, and I'll just describe a study briefly that uh, we've done using uh, a novel anti-inflammatory agent to one receptor antagonist, where we were able to give this to human patients in a randomized fashion. But what we did was we actually measured the drug within the brain directly using plasma sampling, but also microdialysis sampling. This is plasma sampling, this is microdialysis sampling. And we can see that after every dose, we see a peak within the brain level. So at least we can demonstrate that this agent does actually get into the brain. What we're then able to do is measure a wide range of cytokines and chemokines, which were downstream of the interleukin-1 beta locus, and demonstrate that when we administer the drug in human patients, we were able to then shift the responses that we see within the brain. Uh, this panel at the top left is uh, partially squares discriminant analysis, demonstrating the shift in cytokine profile following administration of the drug. And then we were able to look at the individual cytokines and build up a picture of how the biology is affected within humans uh, by administering this sort of drug. And I think this sort of approach is what's going to be required in terms of translating these promising preclinical findings into the clinical arena by using these targeted experimental medicine approaches to translate promising preclinical findings into our patients. So I've tried to squeeze it into 20 minutes. Uh, I apologize if I've run over, uh, but what we can demonstrate uh, using this range of uh, techniques is that inflammatory processes that we're seeing within our preclinical models, what we understand of as inflammation replicated in human disease. Uh, the human observational studies can certainly demonstrate correlations, uh, but they're limited in terms of their interpretation because we can't prove causation. But what we can do by using interventional studies and by measuring these self-same parameters either within the brain or in the periphery is to demonstrate definitive evidence uh, of causation and hopefully take us through into translating these uh, for the benefit of patients. So I will stop sharing there. Hopefully that hasn't uh, gone over. Uh, and uh, yeah. if there are any questions.
I'll be delighted to answer them. Okay. Thank you very much. Doctor, thank you very much. It's a very lucid and interesting talk in a very important talk. I request a uh, chairperson if you have any question because he has to go for surgery. Now. Chairperson, if you have any questions. Or I think we can uh, skip the question and answer session now. He is in hurry and uh, yes. Dr. Thelin is also waiting. So uh, we should go for the next session. That will be better, I believe. Anyway, that's a very good presentation and it's a new insight. It's like, uh, it's a food for thought for many of us, I believe. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure speaking to you and uh, delighted to participate in your excellent conference. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Yeah, I request the chap I request the organizer to invite the next speaker. Also, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adair, for the wonderful talk. With the permission of the chairs, I would now uh, introduce our next speaker, Dr. Eric Thelen. First of all, I would like to thank him for his patience. Uh, Dr. Thelen is an affiliated researcher with the Karolinska Institute, Stockholm, Sweden, and a neurology registrar at the Karolinska University Hospital. His main focus is on the protein biomarkers in the management of acute brain injuries, and his portfolio includes studies on other areas such as neuroinflammation, neuromonitoring, as well as neuroimaging. Over to Dr. Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you can see and hear me? Okay, yes. okay. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. You are audible Perfect. and visible, both. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind uh, introduction and invitation to this conference. And uh, I will see if I can change slides. Yes. And I have no relevant disclosures to report. And uh, one disclosure is that I am uh, a friend to both Adele and Dr. Aftab Alam uh, that I met during my postdoc in Cambridge that I did 2016 to 2018. And this is why I'm here. And I am very happy uh, to, to be participating in your conference. I defended my thesis on protein biomarkers of brain injury uh, and in 2015. And it's available uh, online for those who want to read it. And please let me know if there are any papers that are locked behind paywalls that you want to access. And a, a biomarker is used in many fields of medicine. And it's a, a objectively measured characteristic that is an indicator of a biological process commonly to monitor disease. It's used in, uh, for instance, in when you have a heart failure or a kidney failure, you usually measure a specific protein to see how much this is. And I then assess the different proteins of brain origin to look for this in brain injury. And uh, the uh, proteins of interest that have uh, had most attention in the last years have been S100B, uh, a preliminary astrocytic protein and neuron-specific analase, NSC, where automated assays have become available in hospitals. Uh, but there are a couple of other ones where assays are being developed, and I'll go through them now, now briefly. So S100B, which you've actually heard of from another presenter during this conference, it's a prim primarily astrocytic protein, and uh, it is the most studied protein of brain injury. However, it isn't that brain enriched. It is only slightly more brain enriched than, uh, and than uh, in brain cells than in adipose tissue, which makes it problematic if you have a trauma to the brain and also trauma to other parts of your body, which is quite common actually. Uh, but uh, we, I'll show you how to best use this protein in clinical, for clinical utility. And there are then these assays set up that you can use. Another uh, protein that has been uh, quite studied is in your specific analase. It's a larger protein. Uh, it is involved in, uh, uh, in the glycolysis of neurons. Uh, however, it has uh, had some sort of backlash in the last years because it's also present in erythrocytes and then sensitive to hemolysis, which is a big problem in the clinic. The up and coming protein that will probably be used instead of S100B in some uh, instances in the years to come is glial fibrillary acidic protein or GFAP. It is way more brain enriched 
than um, S100B, which makes it more brain specific, which is good if there is multi-trauma. As they are being developed, they will probably be available uh, this year. Some other proteins I'll just briefly skip through is uh, eubutene uh, carboxyterminal hydrolase L1, USHL1, and tau. Uh, tau is an important marker for Alzheimer's disease, but is now being used more and more in the traumatic brain injury research as well. Uh, but there are no good assays for to measure this in serum. Uh, however, there are assays set up almost everywhere to measure this in uh, CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. It is a marker of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which has gained a lot of attention uh, in sports, uh, concussion, and repeated uh, injuries in American football, for instance, and rugby players. Neurofilament light is another protein that has uh, is also uh, a becoming very commonly used in different neurological conditions to uh, assess brain injury. Here is a study in MS from Sweden, multiple sclerosis, where this is pre-treatment and this is after treatment and this is healthy controls, sort of a surrogate marker of treatment efficacy. And um, so these proteins are uh, then what I will focus on and why then use these proteins? Well, uh, where the most emphasis has been done is in injury differentiation in order to see which patients in the emergency room that has blood in the head on a CT scan and which uh, patients that do not. Then there is for serial sampling, you, see, you can use it for clinical monitoring to see which patients that will develop intracranial problems. Then there is the case for outcome prediction. If you wanna see uh, the risks uh, of a patient dying so you can allocate resources to the correct patient. And then that I mentioned like in clinical trials, it could be used as a surrogate endpoint metric to see if the drug is actually working. And first, injury differentiation. So uh, in traumatic brain injury cases, uh, I don't know how many of you that work with traumatic brain injury, but it's the moderate to severe that has huge lesions such as this are the easy cases. They will always go to a new neurosurgical clinic where they will be uh, properly assessed with a CT scan. The problem is the mild TBI patients, which constitutes about 90% of all cases where the risk of a hemorrhage is low and the need of surgical intervention is even lower and where you will not always perform a CT scan. Then SO100B was introduced uh, a couple of years ago now in the new guidelines to see if you can uh, remove the need of a CT scan and instead only take a blood sample of S100B instead. And the foundations of this was made on several studies showing a sensitivity that is very high, uh, a specificity that is lower, about uh, 40%. And these then made up the new Scandinavian guidelines for uh, traumatic brain injury patients. And these show that in a case of a mild low risk injury, you can draw blood from the patient and if it's 100 b then, this would, uh, is below 0 0.1 microgram per liter, you can safely discharge this patient from the emergency room without the need of a CT scan, which will save a lot of costs, radiation, and waiting time in the emergency room. The problem is now that it's, it has been used for a, year, a couple of years is that it's overused. Uh, you sample this in even patients with minimal injuries. This is in Swedish, uh, I'm sorry for this, but, and, and this, uh, these cohorts represent quite a lot of patients. And we saw that in our institution, there's only about a 50% guideline compliance. It's sampled way too early in these patients. And the problem with S100B, it is not a protein like troponin, which is used for myocardial infarction, where you have both a high sensitivity and a specificity for my, myocardial problems. Uh, this causes a very high rate of high false positive uh, uh, answers. Uh, so you get a sort of false increase of S100B. And this is problematic because then you maybe you will always do a CT scan instead. And, and GFAP is one of these things that uh, could be used more as a troponin. And uh, two, three years ago now, uh, a study of GFAP together with USHL1 was used to see if uh, it could better 
uh, had a better specificity to uh, detect injuries. And they looked at about 2,000 patients uh, with specific cutoffs, but they actually didn't find that the sensitivity and specificity was better than for S1. And some recent, uh, now it's a year ago, but uh, uh, some data from the huge uh, European uh, collaboration center TBI showed that uh, GFAP was the protein that is superior in all cohorts of patients. And uh, uh, addition of other markers doesn't add, they don't add anything to its predictive capabilities of finding positive CT scans. But, they also point out, the authors, that uh, it is a bit too premature to replace S100B in guidelines because there are currently no good assays available for this protein. But there might be in the future. So the take home message is that uh, you need to use, uh, you can use biomarkers to reduce the risk of uh, CT scans. Uh, but don't sample them in a minimal TBI because you will send them home anyway. And you need ed educational efforts in emergency rooms to do this. And I think that we tend to like algorithms when you are uh, in a hospital, but you need to use your sense of your clinical sort of uh, intuition in these patients and see which ones that actually should have a, a protein biomarker sample. And then clinical monitoring, which is actually the area where I've studied, uh, what I've published the most. And it's commonly, we look at a few, uh, when local monitoring is applied, like microdialysis that Adele spoke of in the previous talk, we're looking at a few cubic centimeters of brain that is monitored. And if you serially sample biomarkers in blood uh, that originate from the brain, you get an understanding of sort of a global marker of the whole brain instead. And uh, this is a patient that was in a horseback accident, a young girl, and she has high levels of S1B the first days after trauma. And then she is still in sedation. She is intubated, mechanically ventilated, and monitoring using intracranial pressure, ICP. And no, nothing detects that she has a middle cerebral infarction here. The only thing that actually detects that this patient deteriorates is the secondary increase of S100B after trauma. This is why we have implemented this in our unit. And uh, I, this is quite old now, but uh, seven years ago, we published this in 250 patients where we saw that about 40% have some sort of secondary injury development while they are unconscious after a primary traumatic brain injury. And we do see that even with a rather low cutoff of S100B to detect some of these secondary developments of injury, we do see that it catches a lot of these injuries, which then potentially could be treated. And we have studied this in sort of a protein kinetics, a kinetic model of S100B that uh, follows this gamma function, as you see here. Please don't ask me any other questions about the mathematics involved. And um, what we do see is that nowadays, if a patient sort of deviates from a specific line, we know that there is probably some sort of ongoing injury in this patient. And these temporal dynamics, these kinetics, they differ greatly between different patients. Uh, sorry, different proteins. And uh, we did a systematic review of this, and we saw that uh, for S100B, there is a specific uh, kinetic temporal profile, if you wish. Uh, and for the other proteins, it's slightly different with neuroclement light continuously increasing in the severe TBI cohort that have been studied. So this is sort of a, um, a table that we want to push out that first you have some sort of exocrine contribution, then you have the brain. And if there is an ongoing brain injury, you will either have a continuously increasing levels in blood or these secondary peaks, secondary increases. And if you compare uh, biomarker monitoring with other types of monitoring that these patients have, it is cheaper. So it's definitely something that can be used. But you need the infrastructure, you need the lab in order to sample this pro these proteins. 
And like I said, it is not too late to act if there is a secondary peak. It might be a treatable condition. All right, that, that was a summary. And then uh, briefly, protein biomarkers and outcome prediction. Uh, obviously, to improve resource allocation, that if you need, if you know that there is a, a patient that truly needs uh, neurosurgery or neuro uh, intensive care or any other sort of critical care, you want to prioritize these patients. And it's also good for research for a baseline stratification, uh, which can then be used. This was now two years ago, we published a study on this in human traumatic brain injury using all these proteins that I've uh, discussed. And uh, these include 172 uh, traumatic brain injury patients in the neurocritical care unit. And um, we looked at these specific proteins and saw that they were all better outcome predictors than what is commonly known in traumatic brain injury. Neurospecific NLAs and neurofilament light were not as good as the other ones, but they are still, still up there, they're pretty good. And if you look at the kinetics uh, on different level of the Glasgow outcome scale, you can see that the first days after injury, they have a very strong predictability and differentiation between different levels, different stages of outcome. And which, if you're going to look at which are the best ones and the best ones to combine, I'd say that S100B and GFAP are probably, uh, together with, uh, uh, are probably the best ones. But if you want to combine proteins, you need to think a little bit because they show a lot of cross correlation between them, uh, especially GFAP use, use HL1 and tau almost have a 0.9 correlation coefficient. And if you look at the principal component analysis, you can see that neurofilament light uh, should probably be combined with the other proteins if you want to use several markers in a panel. Like I said before, these proteins are not that brain enriched, especially S100B, which then has a rather low predictability of outcome early after trauma. And we see that this correlates with extracranial contribution of multi-trauma early after injury. So you need to think about this in patients that have extensive extracranial injuries. I'll skip through this uh, due to time constraints. Um, and then in validating treatment efficacy, uh, it can be used as a companion diagnostic, and it has been done in a few trials, for instance, for EPO treatment, which is an up and coming drug in traumatic brain injury. In this Chinese study, it shows that in the group that was treated with EPO, uh, there are lower levels of both S100B and NSE as compared to the controls. And in this study, EPO had a positive effect on outcome. In a uh, Australian study, however, there were no difference between the EPO and the placebo groups, sort of then showing similar results as in the main trial, that uh, there were no differences in biomarker levels. So conclusions. You may use protein biomarkers of tissue fate to screen for patients in the emergency room that have a CT positive uh, finding or not. You can also use it for serially monitoring in order to monitor patients that are unconscious in the intensive care unit. You can also use it to predict functional outcome and validate treatment efficacy in clinical trials. Serum s one and are clinical available, so these are the ones that you can use in a clinic, but for research purposes, you can use all of them. And GFAP and neurofilament light are probably the two proteins that will have the most interest in the near future. I want to acknowledge some of my colleagues, and I want to thank you for inviting me. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Over to the chairpersons. Professor Suhail Parvez, Professor Suman, ma'am, Professor Prasun. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Eri. So nice of uh, your presentation. It's really, really so fascinating to see. And uh, you have uh, rightly pointed out the problems also how to for going to the clinical and uh, routine 
use of these markers it's uh, really useful and uh, thank you thank you very much and let others if they would like to comment anyone dr eric a oh, very wonderful presentation thank very you. interesting and informative uh, talk Uh, the protein biomarkers, I think they can replace the CT in the coming years. And uh, these protein biomarkers, their serial sampling can help uh, in the identification, in the better monitoring of these patients, and also for uh, knowing the treatment efficacy. So uh, I think it's very insightful talk from your side. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Thank you for the comments. Thank you, Dr. Eric, for a wonderful talk. Uh, if I could understand uh, correctly, then I have a small query because generally, you know, whenever we are doing traumatic brain injury or any sort of brain injury, generally we are looking for GFAP. That is the most so-called standard marker. But so this S hundred B seems to be, I mean, something very new and uh, which you have done. So I was just wondering what happens to GFAP if you are doing in initial days is as compared to S hundred B. You did say that there was a change in S hundred B in the initial few days is, and then maybe later on there is a secondary peak wherein you can I mean detect the injury. So uh, what happens to GFAP, which I thought was I mean more commonly people talk about it and uh, as a marker for astrocyte. So if you can comment on that. Thank you for the question. You're absolutely right. In the terms of preclinical uh, research, GFAP is the gold standard marker for astrocytes mm -hmm. and astro astrocytic glial reactivity. The thing is that uh, due to actually um, the, the diagnostic industry, uh, S100B has become more commonly used in the clinic. There are no good assays for GFAP, which is why it hasn't been used clinically as much. Abbott has started now, like about 10 years ago, starting developing a good clinical assays for this. There is a point of care device that was just recently put to use in Miami in the US. There are a few studies now that, that, that came out, but I think it will replace it. And if you look at the sort of kinetics or the dynamics of GFAP, it basically follows the ones that I show that I've shown you for S100B. There are a couple of studies that have serially sampled GFAP in traumatic brain injury patients, and you do see these secondary increases if there is a secondary injury, and you do see these more detrimental trajectories of increasing levels if you have a patient that is uh, progressions of their brain hemorrhages. Mm -hmm. uh, may, may I ask a question, please? Oh, sorry. Sorry, you go first, please. Uh, it's okay. okay. I was just wondering that, and we are talking of these are the serum levels of uh, uh, the proteins. And so how much actually always whenever we measure the serum levels, then we are not, I mean, always the question which comes to mind is the whether how much truly they're reflecting that what is happening in the brain. So would you like to comment on that? No, I, I, that, that's a very good question, especially for proteins that are not that brain enriched, like S100B, could be released from uh, other tissues such as mus muscle, heart, bone, fat. So that, that becomes a problem. Uh, what you can do is to measure these proteins in CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, but it's, it's difficult and could be ethically, um, uh, it could, there are situations where it is regulatory sort of uh, preemptive uh, measures are put in place so you can't really access the CSF, which is why there is a big trend now. And it would be a lot better if you could measure them in blood, but then you need more sensitive analyses because you're now looking at the picogram per liter to microgram per liter spectrum. And current as the, the assays for that are being developed, but they, they are in, in the upcoming years, I think we will see a more worldwide use of these assays. I think Dr. Eric has already mentioned about that multi-traumatic uh, injury problem. So uh, that, that point could be, could be one issue here. Uh, Professor Aslam wanted to ask something. Yeah, please sir, please sir. No, this is this is Islam from Islamabad, Pakistan. Uh, I wonder 
whether different protein markers could possibly be used for trauma to different parts of the brain, or you take protein mark biomarkers for the injury to the brain as a whole? That is a that is a very good question. It's actually something that we're looking into now, uh, and right. we're sort of mapping the whole brain and yeah. looking at different le lesion locations. Because obviously you would believe that an area rich in sort of astrocytes or axons would have a different release pattern of biomarkers in blood than an area rich of neurons, such as gray matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I do, the, the reason we haven't, in the current literature, there are no studies that have actually shown this in an adequate way. There are studies that do show that neurofilament light, is, uh, which is present in axons, is a bit more co is common in axonal injuries, and they have correlated this to different MRI sequences that sort of maps the axons. Right. But there are no. Uh, but that, that was like a pilot study of ten patients. So, but there are no good studies that actually show this. But what what we have shown is that there is with increasing lesion severity. Right. You do see more uh, biomarker being released. Right. And there are these different scores for this, like the Rotterdam CT score, the Helsinki CT score, and the Stockholm CT score, which right. all correlate the, to these uh, to escalating levels of protein biomarkers. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. Yes, Chairman. Any, any more? Uh... Question anyone? I think no more questions. So thank you, Dr. Eric. Thank you very much. It's a very good presentation and lovely interaction. It's a really good interacting with you. And uh, I think now it is over to organizer. Yes, over to organizer. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Thanks, Eric. It's it's always a pleasure to hear you. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Thanks I for think, inviting I me. Think, I think Dr. Like Dr. Dr. Atta, yeah. Dr. Atta, you say a few words before we leave it. You say a few uh, words. No, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear Eric and Adele. Uh, their science is like music, like it flows. Like, so it's, it's always a pleasure. It's wonderful uh, to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atta. Thank you very much. Over to, over to organizer. Thank you. Thank you for, to all the speakers and especially to all the chairpersons, Professor Suman, Professor Sohail, Professor Minakshi and Professor Prasoon for chairing this session. Uh, we are towards the end of this scientific fest and uh, we'll, uh, we can take a break for, uh, we can meet at 4.15 4 for the valedictory session and we can cl uh, close, take a break for now. If it's... Uh, what time to meet please? 4.15. Before, before closing the session, I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity. And uh, it's really nice to nice to have this beautiful session with Dr. Leem, Dr. Thale, Eric, and uh, Dr. Helm. It's a really, really enjoyable one. Thank you, Dr. Alam, uh, for organizing this. It's really good fest. And I think the scientific fest, what it aims now, it's really the, yes. uh, we say everything good when it ends good. Yes. The so it's really, really enjoyable one. And I hope it will be remember, rememberable for long. Yes, Thank you, of sir. course. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Prashun. Thank you, Dr. Prashun. Yeah. I think so that we have to wait for another 15 minutes, yes, right? Yes, we break for 15, uh, meet at 4.15 now. 4.15, right. For the Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you.